A Miraculous Life, An Unending Search for Freedom by Norman Bodek. I dedicate this book to my teacher, Rudy. In this book, there's close to 70 chapters. Each chapter has a saying from Rudy. He was my spiritual teacher, truly an amazing man. I've been so fortunate in my life. I started off as a dumbest child in school and like a tortoise, not like a hare, like a tortoise, just crawling very slowly and not allowing any obstacles to stand in my way. I slowly improved and I've had such an amazing life, such an amazing life. I have met hundreds of great geniuses. I mean, I have met probably the top hundred greatest management masters of the last 50 years. I have met maybe 50 CEOs of American industry. I have met top politicians. I mean, I have, it's amazing the gift that I have had because when I crawl forward, I don't stop. As you see in the book, I wanted to talk to the president of Macy's. I made 20 calls to try to get him. I just won't give up. I have a motto. If somebody else can do it, I can do it. And if I can do it from where I started, you can do it surely so much more. And I hope this book will inspire you and help you to really have a great life based on something that you really want to do for your benefit and also for the benefit of others. You'll see some of these miracles if I was Catholic, and in a sense, I am. I am everything. I am all religions. But if I was just a Catholic and the Pope knew about me, he would make me a saint because of some of these miracles. But many of these miracles are just events that help me radically change and grow in my life. That is a miracle because I feel most people are stuck, self-imposed stuckness. You all have unlimited creative opportunity. I want you to see that. You can virtually be anything that you want. Yeah, it's hard for you to change your physical self, you know, in a, in a certain way. But it's amazing what you can do if you just put your mind to it. So the purpose of this book is to help you open to your infinite possibilities, your infinite creative opportunities for you to have a marvelous life and to share it with other people and help them have a marvelous life. And then also to learn how you could leave this world in a very beautiful way. I wish you all well. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoy listening to the book. Miracle number one, the dumbest kid in class. We cannot limit our intake to the qualities that are easy to take. We must welcome those that force us to change the patterns we have been able to deal with in the past. Rudy, I don't remember asking for this life. But now I'm 85 years old, I'm happy to have lived it. It hasn't always been an easy ride, but I'm very grateful for the entirety of it all. When I was a child, school was very, very difficult for me. I mean, I was slow at learning how to read. I was very poor at writing, both penmanship and grammar. It was very hard for me to memorize facts or dates and especially new spelling words. Whenever there was a spelling bee in class, all the students would stand up and the teacher would ask each student one by one to spell a word. I was normally the first person to sit down for misspelling a word. I still have trouble spelling today, but thankfully computers have spell check and they correct the words for me. If you saw my grades from those early years, you would wonder, how did Norman ever get through school? I was probably the dumbest kid in class. I had a very poor memory. And unfortunately, much of my early education was based on having a good memory. I just couldn't remember the right answers when the teachers gave tests. I did learn eventually, but very slowly. The worst year for me was the ninth grade, my last year in junior high school. One day in the history class, I was sitting in the class looking very sad when my friend Gary, he came over to me and he asked me why. What's the matter, Norman? I said, Gary, I go home and I do my best to read the homework assignments. But when I come to class, I just can't answer the questions correctly. Gary said, Norman, I had the same problem, but I recently came up with a solution. I asked him what he did. 
Gary said, I go home and I read the assignment. I write down all of the key points on a small sheet of paper, and I put it into my shirt pocket. Then during the test, I look at the sheet and I write down the right answers. I thought Gary had was a genius. I thought he had a great idea. So that night, I did the exact same thing. When it came time for the exam, however, things didn't work out so well for me. We had an exam the next morning, and the very first question, I could not remember the answer. So, I thought maybe I wrote it down. So I opened my shirt pocket to glance at the sheet of paper. Before I could write down my answer, right above me, there was the teacher. Wow. She grabbed the piece of paper from me, and she called out to the entire class, Norman is a cheater. By the end of the day, every other teacher at the school knew what I had done. Teachers hate cheaters. But was I really a cheater? What's the difference between using my own memory and having the right answer on a sheet of paper in my pocket? Shouldn't success in school be centered on learning skills that you need to have a good life and not on how well you can memorize facts? Some people have amazing memories, but they find it difficult to apply them in life. And today, in the Internet age, there is less of a need for a good memory. You now need to know how to ask the right questions and then apply the information you get. Later in life, I taught seniors at Portland State University School of Business, and I allowed all the students to bring their notes for the final exam. If you could find and look at the ninth grade yearbook, you would see a picture of Norman, and underneath the picture you would see Norman is the most likely person to get ahead because he needs one. Mrs. Sleeper was my ninth grade English teacher, and she really disliked me. She hated me. On the report card, you can see where she gave me an F, but then someone erased it and put in blue a D minus. The principal probably had the grade changed, probably told Mrs. Sleeper, if you fail Norman, you're going to get him again next year. Mrs. Sleeper once told my friend Monroe not to play with me because I was going to turn out to be a criminal. I didn't turn out to be a criminal, although I can remember stealing two things in my life. Once, when I was around seven years old on a camp trip, I stole a pencil from Hal Caverns, the underground caves. All the children did it, and I just followed them. Later in life, I sent them a check for $5. Hopefully, it covered the original cost of about 50 cents and any accrued interest. Another time when I was an accountant, I took a very small magnet from the desk of the carpenter. I later sent the magnet back with a letter of apology. I can't think of anything else that I did dishonestly, except maybe cheating a little on school tests and driving my car a little bit too fast. Somehow, a radical change took place when I entered the 10th grade, my first year of high school. I went from being the dumbest student in class to the honor roll. It was a miracle. I don't really know what I did differently, but it was wonderful to feel good about myself for a change. I had a Spanish teacher who, for some strange reason, she loved me. She was the first teacher and the only one in my life that did. And she told me that when she has a son, she wanted him to be just like me. I could do no wrong in that class. Even though I don't think I learned Spanish very well, she ended up giving me an A. That was the first year in my life that I liked school, and I was able to do well in all the classes. However, one of the classes was history. It was the strangest class I had ever taken. The teacher was Mr. Booty, and it was rumored that he was shell-shocked during the war. The first day of class, he tried to teach, but the students were not polite at all. They heard about him from the previous students. Thereafter, Mr. Rudy would come to class every day, and he'd write 10 questions on the wall. He would just sit and take attendance, and he would never talk to the class. For a whole year, he came in, wrote the questions on the wall, and didn't speak to us, the students. I was told he was protected by the union, and they couldn't get rid of him. For the midterm and the final exam, he told us we could bring in our books, and I did. And I'm sure I got all the answers right, but he only gave me a B. And I said, Mr. Booty, I thought I wrote down all the correct answers, but you only gave me a B. He replied, I gave you the average of your other grades. I was a little disappointed with the B, <laughs> but I made tremendous progress. 
Between the ninth and the twelfth grades, I went from the dumbest and the worst student in my class to being accepted at the University of Wisconsin. A miracle indeed. Miracle number two. He always said no. There is no limitation to experience if you have the ability to not build tensions. Rudy. I never heard my father say yes. He had one answer to everything, and that was no. In order for me to survive, I had to learn what meant no, what meant maybe, and even what meant I don't care what you do. One day, my friend Eli came over, and he asked if I wanted to go to the movies with him. For some reason, I didn't really want to go with Eli that day, but I didn't want to hurt his feelings either. Even today, no is a very, very difficult word for me to use. So I thought cleverly I would just ask my father for permission while Eli was standing there. Of course, when I asked my father, he said no, and I pretended to look sad to Eli, who just turned around, and he left. A few minutes later, my father put down his newspaper. He was always reading a newspaper, and he asked me what I wanted. I told him I'd asked him if I can go to the movies with Eli, and he said, well, why didn't you go? I said, because you said no. He then got mad at me. It was never easy. I was always afraid of my father. He didn't hit me, not even once, but he shouted, and he threatened to, and he always was very critical of what I did. My brother also lived in terror. My mother could not contain my father, and I often watched her cry. One day when I said, damn, he took me to the bathroom and he washed my mouth out with soap. That had a very lasting effect on me. Even today, it's very difficult for me to curse or to use any kind of profane language. Growing up, I was filled with many fears. I was afraid of the dark. I was afraid of the heights. I was afraid of authority, especially my father, my teachers, and the police. I remember having to sleep in bed with the covers over my head, with the light on, and my grandmother sitting in a chair next to me. I was terrified that somebody outside would use a ladder, and they're going to climb up to my room, and that some evil person was hiding in the closet. My father, in presence or in spirit, gave me such a hard time, but as I worked through life, I truly forgave all the bad things he did. I erased them from my memory, and before he died, I truly loved him and I considered him a very close friend. You don't have to let your old memories continue to burden you throughout life. Miracle number three, I made it into college. It is this decrystallization, the breaking of bonding, that holds us to patterns, that frees us to evolve as spiritual beings. Rudy, I did very well in high school, and I was fortunate to be accepted at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, the school was on four beautiful lakes, a thousand miles away from home, but I found it exceptionally difficult. I remember getting only straight C's the first year, and the second year I did even worse. I got a couple of D's, and I got one F. I loved the school, though. I loved the student union, where I spent most of my time. I sold advertising for the college newspaper. I was on the music committee, the film committee, and the forum committee, where we set up speaking engagements for the school. Working on the forum committee gave me the opportunity to spend time with some very famous people. The author, Mortimer Adler, Governor William Stratton from Pennsylvania. I even spent an exceptional day with Mrs. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Whether or not you agreed with her politics, Mrs. Roosevelt was personable and brilliant. She was one of the most famous ladies in the world. She served as a United States delegate to the United Nations General Assembly. President Harry Truman later called her the first lady of the world in tribute to her human rights achievements. In her presence, she just focused on you. It was the first time in my life being with such a kind of person. Unfortunately, the University of Wisconsin didn't love me as much as I loved it. With my poor grades, I could have returned to school the next fall on a conditional basis. But I was afraid if I failed out of college, I would have had to go into the Army. And since the Korean War was taking place, I decided to take a different route with my life. The miracle was going from the dumbest student to at least getting into college. Miracle number four, first trip to Europe at age 19. People look at the cosmos. Gods are those who eat the energy of the cosmos and become part of the energy. Rudy. 
The summer after my first two years at the University of Wisconsin, I, along with 800 other students, we took a boat from New York City to Amsterdam. The trip took about 11 days, but it was an amazingly marvelous experience. The boat was sort of like a traveling university, and we spent time studying what we would see and what we were going to learn about in Europe. I had never been in the ocean before, and even though there were 20 of us sleeping in the same room, I slept like a baby. It was such a great experience. Every day, a group of us would meet to talk on the boat about our anticipated experience and the places we wanted to visit. One member of our group was Minette Burns. She was a very pretty school teacher. She was four years older than me. We spoke frequently, but she never looked at me as someone special until we ended up taking the same train from Amsterdam and Paris. That trip to Paris is still etched in my memory. We arrived in the city on July 14th, Bastille Day, where people were dancing. They were celebrating in the streets, and we danced. And for the next week, Manette and I saw Paris together, visiting the great museums, shopping in the charming boutiques, and eating at the sidewalk cafes. For the first time in my life, I fell in love with both Manette and with Paris. This was the first time in my life that I felt free from the fear of my father. I mean, he was a, he was thousands of miles away. It seemed as if the spirit was not allowed to be in Paris. I could do what I wanted without the fear of being chastised for not doing what he thought was right. We met a young Algerian student who traveled with us all over Paris. It was thrilling to walk along the Seine River, climb the steps of the Cathedral of Notre Dame, visit the Tuileries Garden, the Follies Bergere, the Left Bank, the market at 5 a.m. where we had onion soup, Never before in my life had I seen such treasures at their museums, at their buildings. In America, we would tear down old buildings, but in Paris, they were treasures to be restored. It was the happiest moment of my life. A week later, Minette left to join a group visiting Germany. For some reason, I stayed in Paris because I was not part of a group. I think I made a mistake. Originally, the French government gave me a job to be part of a crew to reconstruct an old castle, but they couldn't obtain the funds to do so. They didn't tell me while I was in America, so there I was stranded in Paris with very little money, but I asked my father if he would send me some more money, and kindly he did. One night, the young Algerian, who we were traveling around with, invited me to his room for dinner. At the end of the meal, it occurred to me that this man was gay. Having been taught by my father that gay people were somehow a threat, I panicked. I became terribly frightened, for it was the first time in my life that I ever knowingly met a gay person. I immediately ran from the room and checked out of the hotel. I was completely ignorant. Thereafter, I realized how stupid I was to think that way. We have so many prejudices that are given to us by our parents. I was very sorry for the way I acted. I was brought up like so many others to fear things without knowing why. The musical South Pacific had a wonderful song called You've Got to Be Carefully Taught that reminds me of that situation. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are hardly made and people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. Fortunately, I later met many marvelous gay people and was able to drop my learned prejudice. After leaving Paris, I traveled to many European countries, which gave me one of the most interesting and informative experiences of my life. In Rome, at the open-air baths of Caracalla, I saw my first opera. I walked through the ancient rooms, including the Colosseum. I spent a day at the Vatican, greatly impressed by Michelangelo's ceiling in the Sistine Chapel and the enormous wealth of the church. After Rome, I visited Florence, one of the nicest cities in Italy to visit. Florence is filled with art treasures. Michelangelo's David statue was especially memorable and fantastic ice cream, probably the best in the world. From Florence, I went to Pisa. I went to the French Riviera, and I went back to Paris again. It was all magical. Before returning home, I went to London, and I also met up with Minette again in Scotland. I wanted to stay in Europe, but my father told me he would not allow it. 
He would not send me any money, and at age 19, I was not brave enough to confront him, nor was I smart enough to realize that you didn't really need much money to live in Europe. I could have taught English. I could have found a way to make it work. I'm still a bit sorry that I wasn't brave enough to stay in Europe longer. When I returned to the United States, instead of going back to Wisconsin, I applied to and was accepted at New York University. Unlike at Wisconsin, I did very well at NYU, well enough to be accepted into New York University's Graduate School of Business. And as an added plus, being in school meant that I didn't have to go into the Army until the war was over. That first trip to Europe was just the beginning of my life of wandering the globe, probably traveled almost three to four million miles in my life. It was the first time I broke through tons of mental and emotional restrictions. And although I've traveled to 52 different countries, including 89 trips to Japan, the first trip to Europe was the best, and I still love Paris dearly. If you can, I highly recommend you go somewhere adventurous to find your own path in life. Being able to travel throughout the world, to learn from other cultures, and to meet fascinating people has been such a wonderful gift for me. Miracle number five, I love to drive automobiles fast. It is this inexhaustible capacity in human beings that I love and wish to nourish. Feed it, and it'll grow. Watch it, and it'll express the mystery of creation. Rudy. I just love to drive fast. I love to drive. When I was younger, I did get a ticket, but only every 10 years, not in between. But I don't think I've gotten a speeding ticket in the last 30 years. Thankfully, I never hurt anyone. I hate to admit it, but when I get into a car, I feel like a race car driver and that the highway is a racetrack. And I feel when I get to heaven, St. Peter is going to look at my earthly statistics, and he will see that I have the highest percentage in passing cars. It's not something that I'm proud of. It's just a fact. And even though I drive fast, I'm very, very careful. On a highway, you can see far into the horizon. You can anticipate problems. And I sort of have a built-in radar in the back of my head that lets me know of possible problems and also if there's any speed traps. If you're not conscious, you can hurt someone driving at 25 miles an hour. I personally think that slower drivers or those with alcohol cause most of the problems. Highways, though, are made for speed. I especially love to drive in Europe. There, many of the highways have no real speed limits. I remember in France, I was the slowest car on the road going at 90 miles an hour. The car just wouldn't go any faster for me. Why isn't it in America... You can buy a car that will go at 150 miles an hour, but the speed limit is only 65. It just doesn't make sense. Now that I'm 85 years old, though, I'm finally determined to slow down. I'm going to change my habit. I'm going to allow younger people to play the game without me. Hopefully, St. Peter will stop keeping score at this moment so I won't lose my record. The miracle for me has been able to enjoy racing, winning mostly, and never having hurt anyone during my entire life. Miracle number six, I was afraid of flying in heights. If you are open to your growth potential, you will attract that for which you are willing to be responsible. Rudy. When I was younger, I was afraid of flying. I was afraid of heights. I couldn't even look out of a window of a tall building without feeling dizzy. This was a problem for me. When I enlisted into the Army during basic training, we had to go through an obstacle course with around a dozen obstacles. I knew that I could not climb any of them, but I had no choice. I had to try. The first obstacle was a series of logs piled about eight feet high. I tried to climb over them, but as soon as I got near the top, I became dizzy and had to crawl down. The next one required me to climb a telephone pole and use a rope to swing from one pole to another. I knew I couldn't do it, but I knew that if I didn't climb it, I'd be severely punished. They probably would make me wash dishes or, or give me the grease trap or, or put me in prison or something like that. Without any good options, I decided I'll just walk around every single obstacle. Miraculously. None of the sergeants, the lieutenants, nor the captain saw me. There was 220 soldiers going through the obstacle course, and somehow they all missed me. It was not very honorable, I know, but what other options did I have? I believe that life is filled with one test after another to see how you react. If you get angry, you fail. 
If you remain calm and pass all the tests, you can get a chance to be totally free forever. I wish you great success on all of your life's tests. Miracle number seven, basic training in the U.S. Army. I told them of my belief that each of us contains everything that ever was or will be within ourselves. We have only to learn how to open to this omniscient area within us to obtain that information. Rudy. After the Korean War was finished, I volunteered for the draft to pick a good month to go through basic training. After the first week of taking many tests, I was sitting in the assignment center when Irving, he was a brother of a friend of mine. He looked at me and he raised his fingers to his mouth, indicating that I should pretend to not recognize him. Irving at the time was an evaluator to assign new soldiers future roles to play in the Army. A few minutes later, I was sitting in a tiny room when Irving came in and he looked at my records. He saw that I had majored in accounting in college, so he looked up the possible places to assign me, and he found something called the Army Audit Agency. And he said, this looks good, Norman, but you need a master's degree. I told him that I went to graduate school. I qualified for a master's degree, but I never wrote the thesis. And he said, yes, you did, Norman, and he wrote it down on my record. He then said, you need three years' experience with an accounting firm. I told him I only had one year. Once again, he ignored me and wrote on the record that I had three years' experience with an accounting firm, and then he walked out of the room. Eight weeks later, after going through basic training, I was picked with 20 other soldiers out of the 220 for special assignment. All the other 200 went through advanced basic training in the winter. I was sent to the Army Audit Agency in Kansas City, Missouri, and for the next two years, I was an accountant, a private who made colonels nervous when I went to conduct an audit. I never had a march or act as a soldier again. Today, although I did serve my country, I feel a little bit guilty when I go to new season shopping and I get a discount for being a veteran. I never saw Irving again, but I am eternally grateful for what he did. There are human rules and those for a higher place that don't always coincide with them. I don't always follow the human rules, but I never want to hurt another human being. Irving gave me a great gift, and as Rudy taught me, when gifts are given to you, you just accept them gracefully. Miracle number eight, learning from Bill in the Army. I feel that the only consistent thing in my life is change. Rudy. In reality, being a soldier after the Korean War wasn't really bad. I met some very interesting people and did some very interesting things. One of these interesting people was Bill Bricker. Bill was a civilian accountant working in the Army Audit Agency. He was my supervisor. And one day he said to me, Norman, we have a very difficult assignment ahead of us. We have to do a two-week audit in three months. Yes, you read that right. A two-week audit in three months. Bill was a master, though, of organizing our days to be lots of fun while doing almost no work at all. Probably the only time in my life. In fact, our job was to make friends with many of the employees at the Detroit Army Depot. We wanted them to tell us what the problems were so that we would look like heroes conducting this audit. Bill planned out each day, starting with our coffee break, telling marvelous tales and making real friends with the workers. Bill had a sharp mind for business. He loved trailer parks, and he said he was going to make millions setting them up. They are the best investments you could possibly make, he told me. You buy a piece of vacant land, you put some water pipes, some sewer system, and electricity, and then you have to be very clever to get the tenants to take care of the property. All you have to do is offer one free month rent for one of the hundred trailers, and 100 people will work on it for you. I had a wonderful time working with Bill those three months. His auditing strategy worked well. The Army employees gave us valuable information about their depot's problems. We wrote our report, and we were actually given commendations for superior auditors. I was made a supervisor. Imagine making a supervisor for doing two weeks of work in three months. And afterwards, I went out to make audits on industry and other Army bases. One audit at Fort Wayne Army Base was particularly interesting. The leading officer had a problem because he had too many new tools and parts in inventory. He didn't know what to do with them, so he just called them used and old, and he gave them away from almost nothing, far less than what the equipment was selling for. Bill taught me how to have fun at work and that life was really a game to play. 
Miracle number nine. After the army entirely broke, not a cent to my name. By being sensitive to our fate, we can recognize the danger of a potential situation and not enter into it. Rudy. The day I was discharged from the U.S. Army, I was entirely broke. I was married. I had a one-year-old daughter, Phyllis, and I did have $4,000 when we were married. It was all gone. I just had enough money to pay the first month's rent on apartment, but I didn't have the $100 to pay a mover to get us there. Very reluctantly, I asked my father if he would give me $100. I just cried. It was so humiliating to me. For the next 30 years, I was afraid to spend money. I made a nice living, but I was always so tight. I'd never buy anything on credit. However, one day, around 1985, I owned a company called Productivity Press, and I'll tell you all about them later. And I was driving down the road, and a little voice came to me into my head and said, Norman, you will never have to worry about money again the rest of your life. For some strange reason, I believed it. So I drove to a Jaguar dealer, and I bought a new car. Miraculously, the voice was right. My company productivity grew. A few years later, I had 127 people working for me. I had offices in England, in Milan, and in Japan. I started to make a lot of money, but I was not careful at all. I'll give you more details about that later. After owning the company for 20 years, I lost it, and I had to start life all over again. Starting anew was a real challenge, but every December thereafter... I have no work lined up for the next year. But like that little voice told me, I found enough work for me to make a wonderful living. And this happened every year in the last 20 years. Just one mental spark, a gift from beyond, changed my whole attitude about money. I never had to worry about money again. Miracle number 10, working as an accountant for my father. People cannot detach themselves from patterns. Rudy. When I left the army, I felt very inadequate. I had very little confidence that I could make a living. Even though I had an accounting degree, I didn't believe that a large accounting firm would hire me. So I did the worst possible thing. I settled for a job working with my brother at my father's small accounting firm in the Bronx. It was probably the worst accounting firm in America. My father did not even have an office. We worked out of our cars and barely made enough money to live from week to week. My father never graduated from high school, never went to college. He took a couple of courses at Columbia University in accounting. But somehow he was able to talk immigrant clients into letting him be their accountant. He did know how to keep records and prepare tax returns. And most importantly, he knew how to work very, very hard every single day. The work that I did for him was the worst possible work that an accountant can do. I had to sit in the back of these small wood or metal shops, dust all over me, and I'd take a pack of checks and I'd write them up in a thick ledger. And when I arrived at these factories, there were drug dealers were just outside, so I had to double park my car right in front of the client's business. I took a chance of getting a ticket for double parking. Back then, my father would not accept that the accounting records be off by even one penny. I had to sit for hours trying to find that one penny. The client would pay $15 a month, which meant that the most I could really make for the company was $30. Nonetheless, my father graciously paid me $100 a week. My mother, however, thought the money was really coming from her and that she was being very charitable to me, even though I worked very hard every single day. Erwin, my brother, and I were very unhappy working for my father. But fortunately, one day, my father noticed an article in the financial section of the New York Times. There was a small company upstate in Westchester County, and they were using a Bendis G15 computer to do sales analysis work. My brother said, let's go visit them. I couldn't understand why, because I never imagined doing anything else. We went and visited the company anyway pretending we were interested in using their services. We asked them if they could write a program on their computer to eliminate the tedious postings that we did. The idea we had was to use a computer to create the accounting books instead of having to write them up by hand in the ledgers. They said they would try. A few works later, a person at the computer company called us back to their office. They told us they couldn't figure out how to write the program because they were not accountants. 
But they said if we could show them what to do, then they could write the program, and maybe we could start a new company together to sell the service to other accountants. It was surely a miracle. Well, we managed to get the program written. But unfortunately, there was a lot of tension between those other members, and we broke up. Shortly thereafter, my brother and I did figure out how to eliminate the need for handwritten accounting books. Also, we figured out how to use the computer to create beautiful financial statements using a Frieden ad punch machine. It was a very huge calculator that produced punch paper tape. We then used an IBM key punch to convert the paper tape to IBM cards. And with an IBM sorter and a 101 IBM accounting machine, with a card punch, we were able, without a computer, to produce accounting records and very beautiful financial statements. With this crude setup, I believe I was the first or maybe the second person in America, if not the world, to automate accounting. After we bought the IBM key punch machine, With a tape-to-card converter, the IBM salesman introduced us to a commercial butcher in the Bronx, and he had the IBM equipment we needed to produce the financial statements from our punch cards. Every day after doing our accounting work, we would go to the butcher's factory about 6 o'clock at night, carefully avoiding the meat as he went to use the equipment. After a few months, the IBM salesman luckily introduced us to Woolworth, also in the Bronx. And we gave him $5 per hour, and he let us use their vast amount of equipment from 6 p.m. at night. We started automating my father's accounting records first. We would take a check, and we'd give it a code number, like 600 for telephone. Then we would only have to enter into the Frieden the date of the check, the amount of the check, and the code number. That's all. And since the Frieden was also an adding machine, we made sure the entries were always balanced correctly. Instead of spending three hours writing up all the monthly checks, it took maybe only 10 or 15 minutes to do it. We were able to produce beautiful financial records. It was an amazing transformation that took us from being the worst accounting firm in New York to being the best. Miracle number 11, leaving the accounting practice. Love is complete trust and surrender. Only by letting go deeply can we take into ourselves the highest ingredients necessary for our evolvement. Rudy, we quickly automated the accounting for all of my father's clients. My brother or I would visit six or eight clients a day to pick up the checks and any necessary tax forms. We would then bring the checks and forms to a new office we set up, gave the material to a young lady who would enter the information from the checks into the Freedom Machine. Now, instead of earning $30 a day, we were able to earn 180 to $210 per day. And since we could now give the clients beautiful printed financial statements, we were able to raise our monthly fees. Of course, my brother and I had to work seven to eight hours a day as an accountant and three to four hours more at Woolworths at night. The process worked very well for my father's firm. So we went after other accounting firms as clients to get access to them We went to see the manager of the Frieden Calculator Machines in Manhattan. I was so insecure at the time that I was afraid that this manager would look at us as pure amateurs. Manhattan was so much more intimidating to me than the Bronx. When we got to the manager's office, we showed him the statements we had produced. He liked what he saw, and he agreed to have us train his managers to sell the package. The salespeople would then get us the accounting clients, And he or she would sell the Freedom Machine for about $2,500. The salesman did very well. They got about 15 or 20% per machine. And we only charged $7.50 for a set of financial records. But the accounting firms would give us around 20 to 30 of their clients each month. The salespeople quickly found as many accounting firms as clients. And just one year later, we were able to leave our father and set up an office in Westwood, New Jersey, near where we lived. Because the new system was so much more efficient, my father and his secretary were able to run his entire practice without us. So my father made a lot of money on it. It was another miracle to go from the tedious work with my father in the Bronx to now being in the new world of data processing and also more than doubling our income. 
Miracle number 12, Santa Claus, Macy's, saved our lives. I feel that the ever-increasing results of my life allow for greater surrender and less concern with logic. I'm only filled with gratitude that such a possibility exists for me. Rudy. Since we were one of the only companies in New York area to have an IBM tape-to-cart converter, Macy's department store hired us to transfer its tapes into IBM cards. When I gave the company an estimate of two cents per card, the manager thought I said per record, which consisted of two cards. When I invoiced them at the end of the month, they had to pay double what they expected. They weren't happy with me, not at all, but since we were the only ones that were able to do it, they continued to work with us for months, paying us the original price. Between Macy's and the accounting firms, we were able to make a very nice living, and we started to hire people to work for us. It was pure magic. In actuality, I should have been as rich as Bill Gates, but due to my biggest major fault, having very little confidence in myself, I often would take other people's advice instead of listening to my own heart. And inevitably, that advice was wrong, and we did not become a Microsoft. One of our biggest mistakes was to reject an offer from ADP, Automatic Data Processing, at the time, had about $500,000 a year in business, and we had about 150000 And they offered us 7% of ADP for our company, and we foolishly turned them down. Today, 7% of ADP is probably worth $3 billion. In retrospect, I think we made a little mistake. I trusted people, and I could not imagine that people were out to take advantage of us. One of our clients was a manager at a company called Audison Surveys, A&S. It was a large marketing research company in Manhattan. He loved how we produced their financial statements, and he suggested we become partners in a new business together. He said he had $500,000 worth of data processing business and added to my 150000 we would have an amazing company. He said, let's combine the two together. You give us 49% of your company or of the new company, and you could have all of our data processing, and you and your brother could take $30,000 salary. That was double what we were making. My brother didn't want to do it, but I foolishly urged him on, and we did it. And boy, was it a mistake. We moved our offices from Westwood, New Jersey, just five minutes away from where we lived, to 42nd Street in Manhattan, where it took an hour to an hour and a half to two hours to go to work. Instead of living a normal life of eight hours a day, our business was now open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Overnight, we went from having five people to 35 people, and we didn't really know how to manage the situation. The first year, we worked like dogs and we did not even get the 30000 as promised. When we protested, Lenny said, I'm not going to pay you for your learning. Shortly thereafter, we broke up, and Erwin and I lost everything. I won't burden you with all of the details, but fortunately, my miraculous life did not end there. I ask you, the reader, to be patient, for these miracles allowed me to continue to have an amazing life, although it did take me a lot of time to learn my lessons. And hopefully, I did learn them. As Cicero said, nobody can give you wiser advice than yourself. Boy, did it take me a long time to learn that lesson. I wish I learned it 50 years ago. Miracle number 13, overcoming my fear of flying. I always try whenever I speak to let the spiritual force speak through me. It requires a conscious effort, but also teaches me simultaneously. Rudy. Later, my job required me to travel a lot, but I was petrified of flying. Once, I had to fly to Europe for business. I was so afraid, believe it or not, I had five martinis, and I'm not a drinker, and it didn't help at all. I was a nervous wreck during the entire flight. Instead of flying back to the U.S. from Europe, we sailed aboard the SS France, which took about five days to come back, but it was a wonderful experience being in the high seas in luxury. A few years later, I had a data processing facility in New York City and about 200 people working for me on the island of Barbados, which was beautiful. But flying there was a horror for me. I was always sure that the plane was going to crash. 
It was especially terrifying during takeoff and landing, and we ran into the bumpy weather. It was terrible. For some reason, I was curious to learn new things. Every day going to work, I would buy something different from a newsstand in front of the 42nd Street Library in New York City. This newsstand was very unusual because it sold newspapers and magazines from all over the world. One day, I bought the East Village Other. It was sort of like a hippie newspaper. One article in the newspaper described an Indian monk dressed in his simple Indian garment who chanted and danced in a park in the East Village. The article said that a lot of hippies in the park got up and followed him around chanting and dancing themselves. I was curious. I don't know why, but I went down to Lower Manhattan to see him. At the time, the monk was in a small store very close to the Bowery where the homeless lived, probably the worst place in New York City. I picked up a publication he had written. There was a chant on it. Now, I don't know why, but I started chanting every day for the next month. Whenever I was by myself, I would chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. At the end of the month, believe it or not, all of my fears disappeared. I had no idea why it happened, but I was so grateful that it did. The monk's name was Bhaktivedanta Swami Pradupah. I subsequently learned that he came to America with only $6 in his pocket, and when he died, quite a number of years later, he had established over 200 temples throughout the world just by having people chant Hare Krishna. I only did it for one month, but all my fears went away. Now, at the time, I was an atheist, and I didn't believe in religion at all, but I picked up a Bhagavad Gita that Swami translated from Hindi into English, and it started my spiritual journey. I never became a follower of the Swami. I stopped chanting Hare Krishna. I don't know why, but I was, and I'm still eternally grateful for what he gave me because he allowed me to travel the rest of my life normally, most fortunately, because I've probably flown over 3 million to 4 million miles in my life, I can now get on an airplane and easily fall asleep in my seat. A week ago, I came back from my 89th trip to Japan, and the plane was bouncing up and down, and for a long period of time, but it didn't even phase me. Miracle 14, the war in Vietnam. We are really like Salmon, trying desperately to return to the home of our creation. Helping to succeed in this attempt is the real purpose of all religious and spiritual work. Rudy. Another time at the same newsstand by the library, I bought a copy of a newsletter which was called A Majority of One. It was written by a man who had escaped the gas chambers in Europe. His family was not so fortunate, and he moved to America to live within our freedom. In the newsletter, the man, though, was very unhappy about the United States carrying out an unjust war in Vietnam. At the time, I did not know much about the war. The TV and the newspapers reported little information about it. I remember some mention of a domino effect, where if we didn't stop the communists in Vietnam, all of Asia would be threatened. But that was about it. But as I read this newsletter... I became very confused because at that time I completely trusted our government. It was hard for me to believe the horrors described in the newsletter. After a few months of reading it and looking at newspapers from Canada and England, the events of the war began to disturb me, possess me, even radicalize me, and I became against the war. It was a terrible event, and I could not believe our government had been so dishonest with us. In order to protest the war, I participated, I remember, in the first peace march on Fifth Avenue in New York City. I was very apprehensive. I was afraid as I walked. Many people along the side of the street were throwing eggs and paint at us and cursing us for being traitors to America. At one moment, my first wife shouted to a group of reporters who were interviewing the people standing at the side of the parade and cursing us. And she said, there are only a few hundred of them, and there's thousands of us. Why would you show the American public them instead of us? Well, the NBC reporters immediately swung the camera around. But instead of putting it on her, 
They put it on me. And they said, what makes you think that you know more than President Johnson? This was my first opportunity for national fame. But I blew it. All I could do was stutter. Nothing coherent came out of my mouth. If I was able to communicate my true feelings, I could have said something that would have put me on national television, and maybe I would have become a spokesperson for the cause. But miraculously, I was protected by this higher creative energy, which nurtured me and allowed me to continue to live a natural but challenging life. If I had been isolated from the crowd by the reporters, I would have had to be a spokesperson for the anti-war movement, something I was not prepared or capable of doing. Miracle 15, the war continues. It's the greatest of all tragedies for a human being to seek fulfillment in another. It can only be obtained by ourselves. The war in Vietnam continued to occupy my mind and disturb my life. I lost many of my friends I had because all I could talk about, all I could think about was the war and the terrible things we were doing to these people thousands of miles away. I could not understand why we were at war with Vietnam. I mean, to me, Vietnam at the time was primitive. The Vietnamese were no threat to us. And if they wanted to be communist, that was their business. It was not ours. I did have one close friend who worked at a small stationery store who was also opposed to the war in Vietnam. And the two of us would often get together and try to figure out what could we do to, to reach the American consciousness. We wanted to tell people that what we were doing was absolutely wrong. We even discussed together blowing up the George Washington Bridge. But we couldn't figure out how to do it without hurting anyone. We walked in all the marches in New York and Washington. And I even joined the local Democratic Party. Most of the members in the party in New Rochelle, New York, were also against the war, and we did apply pressure on the Democratic Party to leave Vietnam. However, when Hubert Humphrey was selected to lead the Democratic ticket, I told the group, I can't support him. He was Lyndon Johnson's vice president. When I said that, a woman said, Norman is for Nixon. Now, that was not true, but that ended my political involvement. It took a long time. But I was very happy when the war finally ended. Miracle 16. Traveling with my friend Mark. Using the forces of creativity for physical satisfaction will always leave dissatisfaction in its wake. Rudy, what exactly is a miracle? Let me give you another example. Once I was traveling in India with my friend Mark and my yoga teacher. Mark was 45 years old, and unfortunately he was dying of stomach cancer. And I decided I was going to give Mark a thrill of a lifetime. And I was going to take him and the teacher to the Amman Resort in Phuket, Thailand. Reportedly, this was one of the best, if not the best, hotel in the world. A year earlier, I stayed in the Amman Resort in Bali, and it was marvelous. I was in India, but I called the hotel, and I found out it was going to cost me $20,000 for the week. It was a lot of money, but I was very rich at the time, and I wanted to give Mark something really very special. Well, the way miracles happen in my life, while traveling in India, I got a phone call from a lawyer in Melbourne, Australia. He wanted me to come there to give an expert witness deposition on a legal case. I said I would happily do it, but I said you'd have to pay me $20,000, and you'd have to give me first-class airfare from India to Australia and back to America. And he says, wow, that's a lot of money, Norman. I said, yeah, but I'm worth it. He said he had to think about it, that he'd call me back the next day. He did call me back, and he agreed to my terms. With the cost of the week covered, we went to Phuket and stayed at the most beautiful villa I had ever seen. Boris Becker, the champion tennis star at the time, owned the villa next door. Each of us had our own house overlooking the beach and the ocean. We had a gorgeous swimming pool. We were served marvelous meals of whatever we wanted to eat. We found lovely companions to dance with, and we spent a week in paradise. One day we hired a Chinese junk to take us scuba diving and snorkeling. The hotel, the service, the food, the beaches, the boats, the sun, and the people were all absolutely marvelous. It was an amazing experience. Remember what I wrote earlier. If I needed money, it would come to me. Miracle 17, the I Ching. 
One of the basic spiritual blocks is a sense of guilt, Rudy. Unfortunately, my small data processing business did not last. After errors, my brother left and I lost the company. And for the next 10 years, I worked for other people. One day, I was selling the first small calculators from Sharp, the company in Japan. I was in Greenwich, Connecticut. I stopped, and I met Walter Nelson. He was the president of Analysis and Programming Company, APC. He was a former client of mine. I told him humbly that I was looking for a new opportunity, and I asked if he needed a manager for one of his offices. He said no and left. Just a little side story. The man I worked with was Mr. Meisner. He was under five feet tall, but one of the smartest people I ever met in my life. He left Germany in 1939, just before the war broke out. And he left his family there, his wife and a daughter, and he came to Cuba. And then his wife and daughter got on the boat and came to Cuba. And Cuba said, no, they're not going to let anybody off the boat and they're going to send the boat back to Germany. Mr. Meisner, though, somehow very cleverly got to the mayor of Havana, Cuba, gave him some money, and his wife and daughter got off the boat with just one other family, and the boat went back to Germany to the concentration camps. Back to my book. On my way out of the parking lot, I hit a small pole. I bent it slightly. I was confused and embarrassed. I was not sure what to do. Should I go back and tell him, or should I just drive home? I wondered. Well, I said, you know, it's not a big deal. I said it was a small thing, and I left. But it bothered me. It just continues to bother me if I don't do the right thing. So after a week, I sat down. I wrote Walter a letter, and I apologized to him. And I said, Walter, please, I'm sorry I left. I didn't think it was much, but send me an invoice for any repairs. Well, a few days later, Walter called and said he was pleased to get my letter because he did not have my address or phone number. He had been thinking about me for a new business opportunity. He said there was a data entry facility on the island of Grenada, and he was interested in buying it, and maybe I would run it for him, and he wanted me to check it out first. Walter flew me to Grenada to see the facility and report back to him. Well, I just fell in love with the island, the people, and I told Walter it was a great place to do business. Unfortunately, (laughs) but I just had to be patient, it took Walter four months to finally make the decision to do it. He offered me a position to become president of the company, and we started together. It's amazing because his only investment was me, and he didn't pay me very much. But before I joined the company, I consulted the I Ching. It's also called the Chinese Book of Changes. The I Ching was used before Christ was born. The I Ching is used as an oracle to help you to predict the future. Now, earlier in my life, I didn't believe in anything mystical. But as I got older, I became less skeptical, and I began to test the truth of things for myself. To use the I Ching, first of all, you have to be very sincere that you want the oracle to help you. Then you take either what's called stalks, or you take old Chinese coins. Well, I had old Chinese coins, and you flip them into the air. I took three of them, I flipped them into the air, and then you look at the combination of heads and tails. Two heads and one tail is a number seven. One head and two tails is an eight. Three heads is a six, and three tails are a nine. Each tail corresponds to a symbol. Seven corresponds to a solid line, eight was a broken line, and six and nine are called moving lines, or yin and yang lines. But somehow, miraculously, every one of the six flips came up with the number eight, which represented I had six broken lines. Now you go to the I Ching, and the I Ching is divided into 64 parts. Each part or chapter is called a hexagram. And you look up based upon the way the lines are. Well, I had six with broken lines. So I went to this hexagram, and it was called K apostrophe U-N, Kun. And Kun stood for yin, of yin and yang, yin and yang. This represented Mother Earth. And it told me if I was going to start a new venture in the South, which I was, it would be very successful. It also told me, 
that I couldn't go after things. This represented Mother Earth, that it would come to me. I couldn't go after it. Satisfied with the Oracle's answer, I named the new company Key Apostrophe Universal Inc. after the K apostrophe UN. Miracle 18, starting the new company. To grow spiritually, you must learn to overcome your emotional blocks. Rudy. In addition to having an office in Greenwich, Walter also had an office in Manhattan, and he gave me the space to work. I started working for Walter on January 2nd. Very funny with Walter, because he said, Walter, would you like your office painted? And I said, yes. And Walter said, okay, come on in Saturday and we'll paint it. I didn't really believe that's what he meant. At first, I was the only person in the company, and my job was to find a business. At first, I was the only person in the company, and my first job was to find business. The first day, I received a call from George, and he worked at my old company. He told me that John Hancock Insurance Company was looking for me. Somehow, they had heard about the work I did with my previous company in Barbados. I immediately called John Hancock. I then flew up to Boston, and I reviewed their job to convert 11 million records from hard copy to computer. Wow, what a way to start a new company. With so many records, it was very difficult to estimate the total number of keystrokes to try to determine how long was it going to take to convert them. It was a very big gamble on such a large job, especially I didn't even have an established company. I didn't have any employees, but they didn't know. If they asked me, I would have had to tell them the truth. Because believe it or not, I always try to tell the truth. Each record had the first and last name of the insurance holder, the date of the birth, the policy numbers. The cards were used as cross-references to find policyholders. I took a random sample of the 200 records from the 11 million. And I, I never did this before. And I sat down and I calculated the average number of strokes per record. Hancock managers had no idea how many keystrokes it would take to do the conversion, so they would not know if my estimate was reasonable or not. It was a large financial gamble to estimate the number of hours to do the job, but the records, I found out, they were all in last name order. So I don't know what it came to me, my wonderful luck, and I went to the library to see if I could find out the number of different surnames in the United States, the number of last names. If I could find this out, it might give me an advantage bidding over the other companies. At the library, I found out from the Social Security records that there were 600,000 different last names in America. This meant that instead of typing every last name, I estimated I could save about 45 million strokes by using the duplication key. So I wrote a 16-page proposal and normally, all you gave was a one-page proposal. That's what my competitors all did. But I wrote down exactly how I was going to do the work, how I was going to guarantee that they were going to get it on time at the highest accuracy rate. Out of the 10 companies who bid, I won the contract, even though I did not have a data processing facility at all. However, it took Hancock five months from that January to give us a contract. So what was I going to do? I got on the phone. Believe it or not, I called 600 companies looking for work, and I didn't get anything, nothing, just like the I Ching said, you can't go after it. It'll come to you. <laughs> but it's hard for me to believe it. The Hancock job required 150 key punch operators to work for close to 14 months. I then had time to go to Grenada, find the people, train them on the typewriter, train them on the key punch equipment, familiarize them with the John Hancock material. We had Hancock put the records on microfilm. We then bought microfilm readers for Grenada. We ordered 30 more key punch machines because there were 20 machines there, and we started running three shifts a day. Almost all the employees were women. For many, it was their first job because there were very few opportunities for women in Grenada. The women were absolutely wonderful. They were so appreciative to be with us. They worked so hard and slowly but steadily became as good, if not better, 
than those working for us in America. Miracle 19, Working in Paradise. All that has ever been done in your field should be absorbed within yourself. You then go on to further fulfillment through your own original creative work. Rudy, well, it was a wonderful time in my life working in Grenada. And since we started shortly before the summer, I was able to spend the first three months in Grenada with my family in a very nice house close to Grand Anne's Beach, one of the loveliest beaches in the world. At the beginning, we ran three shifts. We met Hancock's accuracy requirement and met their schedule, but five months later, we fell behind. Now, I needed to appeal to all of the operators to come in and work overtime. I wanted them to come in to work Saturday and Sunday. Many said it was impossible because the buses don't run on the weekend. I said, don't worry. You just get up in the morning and you start to come here, and I guarantee you'll find a way to get here. And I said, if you can't get a way back, I'll drive you back. But I only had a Volkswagen. I guess I fibbed a little bit. I knew we would be in trouble if they didn't work that weekend. Years earlier, I had a similar situation in Barbados where I had a large staff of about 200 operators working for me, and we were doing this job for J.C. Penney. Even though I told the employees that they could lose a job if everyone didn't show up on a Saturday, only 10% of the people came to work. Sure enough, we lost the customer and had to close the facility in Barbados. But fortunately, miraculously, Grenada was different. When I came to work Saturday morning with trepidation, remembering Barbados, everyone was there. Everyone was there for every one of the three shifts on Saturday and every one of the three shifts on Sunday, and I didn't have to drive anyone home. Now, what was the difference? I believe the main difference was that in Barbados, I never tried to get to know all of the employees. I knew the supervisors. I knew some of the employees, but not most of them. In Grenada, after working with them for three months during the summer, I was able to know, even with my very poor memory, I knew everyone's name and I knew a little bit about them. And in order to learn their names, I used a memory peg system that was taught to me uh, about a year earlier. And by using it, I learned every person's name in Grenada. So I knew something about them. I knew their name and I knew something personal about each one of them. Now, the memory peg game works this way. You take the numbers from 1 to 10 and you give a letter or a name to it. Like 1 is T or the, or the word T. 2 is N or Noah. 3 is May, M, I mean, or May. 4 is R, the word is Ray. 5 is L or Law. 6 is J or Jaw. 7 is K or Key. 8 is F or Fee. 9 is B or Bay. And 10 is O's. So if I wanted 20, the number 20, I take the N from 2 and the O's from the 0, and I'd have a word, Nose. If I wanted 31, which is 3, 3 was May, so I took an M, 1 is T, so I put a T at the end of it, M with a T, I had the word Matt. So all I had to do is memorize those 10 words or 10 letters and then exaggerate. Exaggerate. So if I want to remember Martha's name and her number was 43, this was funny, I would think of Martha, think of 43, and then I would get the word ram. Ram, for four is an R and three is an M, so I made the word ram, which is a sheep. I made the sheep purple. I had the sheep flying in the air, and I absolutely remembered Martha, her number, and a little bit about her. I practiced, especially flying on the airplane to and from Grenada, which took about, I don't know, seven, eight hours. So one day, when I was pretty proficient, I went into Walter's office, and I took a deck of cards with me, 52 cards. And I said to Walter, I'm going to take all of these cards and show them face up. And I want you to give me $5, and then I'm going to take, I'm going to look at that, and then I'm going to flip it upside down, 
And so all I'll see is 52 cards face down. And I want you to give me $5, Walter, for every card I get right. And you give me $5 for every one you get wrong. Well, Walter wasn't easily fooled. And he wasn't a gambler. And he said, no, Norman, I'll only gamble five cents. (laughs) This is funny. Believe it or not, it only took me about 15 minutes to do this. And I got 48 cards right. And I have such a poor memory. But this memory peg game trick is wonderful the way it works. I use this system to learn every girl's name in Grenada, up to 150 at the time. And I also got to know something personally about them. And I loved working with them. They were highly religious. They used to take me to church with them. They were so humble. They were proud. They were dignified. They were respectful. I was very grateful. And they were very grateful working with us. And they worked very, very hard. I must tell you also, when I took the mind control course over two weekends, a very strange thing happened. At the end of the last day, we all sat in groups of three, and we all wrote on a small sheet of paper the name of the person we knew and an ailment they had. And then we would lie down on the floor, go deep inside our mind. You know, you're trying to go your from what's called the beta mind to the alpha mind to the delta mind. And the other two people would read about the person, not to tell you what's wrong with them, but as an example, I lie down. I was very skeptical. I closed my eyes, and they told me this was a woman that was 49 years old that lived in Philadelphia. That was it. And, and it was up to me to figure out intuitively what was wrong with her. Well, I got a strange huh, flash that there was something missing in the right side of her body. I didn't really believe it, and I told them how I felt. But afterwards, I opened my eyes, and I looked at two amazingly surprised faces. And then I read on the sheet of paper that this person was missing a right arm. We all did it three times, and most of us were very accurate. I don't understand it all. But actually, we are fundamentally very intuitive people, but we just hide it in our society, and I don't know why. I felt very funny about using this, and I never used it again. I thought that this violated some spiritual law. You don't mix your spiritual things with your material life. But I met some very famous people in life. They knew how to do the same thing, and they used it in business for their advantage. It's just made me so uncomfortable to use anything mystical for my advantage over others, and I tried never to do that. Miracle number 20, air pressure on the airplane. Creativity must be highly original and from a person's highest nature. I had a major problem on one of my flights to Grenada. I was no longer scared of flying, but while flying, my head hurt enormously from the change in air pressure. And I didn't know what to do on future flights. So I called the doctor, the doctor at Pan Am Airlines, which was the airlines I was taking at the time, and he had no idea. I even sat down and I wrote a letter to the president of Pan Am. I complained about the doctor, and I also told him a number of other things that was wrong about the airline. A miracle later, believe it or not, I get a handwritten note from the president of the company. And it showed he was almost in tears with his inability to get the best out of his people. He apologized. He said he thought he knew what to do, but he couldn't get people to do it. Unfortunately, this great airline went bankrupt a few years later. It's unfortunate, and this is so true for so many companies, where the CEO, the president, the chairman are just totally out of touch with the people that work for them. Well, on my next flight, coming back from Barbados, there was always a connecting flight going from Grenada to America to go through Barbados. And I was sitting next to a very charming young woman, and I told her about my problem with the air pressure. This is the miracles in my life. She said she loved scuba diving, and that when she was affected by air pressure, she would hold her nostrils and then breathe out through the closed nose, slowly. This filled the sinuses with air, and it neutralized the air pressure, eliminating the pain. When we started to descend into New York City, the changing air pressure made me feel very uncomfortable. My head was starting to hurt, but I followed her advice. I held down both nostrils, pressed it gently, 
breathed out, and I've heard a little pop, and the pain disappeared. Wow. I was so fortunate because I have flown three million miles since then with no worries and no problems with the air pressure. Miracle number 21. Starting Productivity Press. The reward of work is the increased capacity to perform. Rudy. At Key Universal, I was the president and ran the company, but I didn't own it. One day, after eight years working there, I was on an airplane with Walter, the owner. I just got a very large contract from Indiana Bell. That's what we were doing at the time. We were converting telephone companies from manual records to computer records. And we got this very large contract from Indiana Bell. And Walter turned to me on the airplane. He said, Norman, you've given us enough work for the next 10 years. I don't need you anymore. And he fired me. Imagine, you just signed a big contract with a company and you get fired. I was somewhat annoyed. Not totally, because I didn't really like working for Walter. But I didn't like losing my job. But I was somehow very fortunate, because before Walter fired me, I had a five-year contract for him. Oh, but I have to tell you a funny story. Because before leaving Walter... I was making an arrangement with Fawcett Publications, the very large magazine publisher, to buy my old company in Barbados. The manager in Barbados called me, told me he was in trouble, asked me if I could help him, and I went to Fawcett, and the manager was very interested. The manager and I flew to Barbados to look at the company, and Fawcett decided to buy it. But he said to me, Norman, I'll buy it, but I want you to run it for me. Now, the strange thing is that I told Walter about their offer. And Walter said, look, Norman, you don't want to work with Fawcett. They're terrible people. And I listened to him. I didn't take Fawcett's offer, and they would have paid me more money. It would have been a much easier job because I didn't have got to look for work. Fawcett had so much work because they were one of the largest publishers in America, and Walter fired me. That's the trouble about Norman when he listens to other people's advice. But in retrospect, Walter firing me was a blessing. The best part of it is that he had to pay me more money the next three years not to work for him. And it gave me enough money to take away the financial pressures that you normally get when you're being fired. Well, two months later, I wasn't in a rush. I was looking around trying to think, what am I going to do? And I read an article in the New York Times financial page. Now, I don't know why I read the financial page because I wasn't interested on the financial page at the time. I would read the sports section, the front page. That's all. But I read it this day. It flashed at me, and it said productivity declined for the first time in 33 quarters. I had no idea what it meant. But for some strange reason, I went to the Greenwich Library to study productivity and find out why was it so important to America. It was very unusual for me, but I never go to libraries. Yes, I went to the library when I set up the Hancock job, but I just don't go there. I love books, but I buy books. I don't borrow them. And maybe I don't borrow them because my father told me a story. When he was a young person, he borrowed a book at the library, forgot to return it, and a policeman comes knocking on the door to get the book. Somehow that story sat deep inside me, and I just never would go to libraries. I went to the library but I found very little information on productivity. I couldn't find out why it was so important. However, since I had nothing else to do, I just kept going back to the library to study. And after it, I learned that productivity growth was the real key measure for success, both of a country and for a company. And I decided to publish a newsletter on the topic, even though I wasn't a good writer. Unfortunately, most American companies look at profit as their key measure of success, but profit can easily be distorted and manipulated, but productivity is a much better method of success. And those of you in the lean arena, as an example, you know, we want to get lean. One of the ways to get lean is to eliminate your inventory. But strangely, when you reduce your inventory, you reduce your profit. This is the way the accountants have figured this thing out. In fact, if you can just make things, put it in work and process, it would add to your profit. That's why the end of every year, 
companies go crazy just making things. Like General Motors would make lots of things, but then in January they couldn't sell it, and they'd have to give these enormous discounts. Accounting system is screwy. Fortunately, the librarian Jeff was an excellent writer. He became very interested in what I was doing, and he asked if he can join me to write the newsletter, and I jumped at the offer. To give the newsletter credibility, we needed to look official. Rudy, my spiritual teacher, and I'm using his sayings at the front of every chapter, he had a friend. Friend's name was Milton Glaser, and Milton was probably America's most famous designer. He designed so many record covers, Dylan covers, and he designed the I Love New York sign. Everybody's familiar with that. I, with a heart, New York. It was designed by Milton Glaser. And I went down to see Milton. And I said, Milton, I want to start writing a new newsletter. I said, could you give me a masthead? I want it to look, you know, official. I want it to look good. And Milton said he would do it. But he said, no, man, you're going to have to write the newsletter. He didn't trust me. I said, okay, I'll come back in one month. And Milton did something very wonderful. He said, Norman, this is the way to be successful with a newsletter. And he gave me 10 key points, which I followed religiously. I went home and Jeff and I spent one month writing a single newsletter just for Milton Glaser. We took it down to him and he gave us a wonderful logo and it gave the impression to the world that we were a real company. My timing was perfect. Because back in 1979, 1980, the word productivity started to have real meaning in American industry. And we published our first newsletter in May 1980. At the time, Japan was the productivity growth leader in the world. But it was very hard to find out why. Well, I did a lot of research, and we found out that Wayne Riker, he was a manager at Lockheed, and he went to Japan... And he discovered something called Quality Control Circles, QCC. Riker left Lockheed, and he opened up his own consulting company to teach Quality Control Circles. And he gave us a copy of all of his training material, and he allowed us to be the first publication in America to write about Quality Control Circles. Unfortunately, Quality Control Circles has not been readily adapted in America, for it allows employees to fully participate in the improvement activities within an organization. We talk about people engagement. We talk about empowerment. But in America, we don't really want to give the worker any power. In America, we have what's called top-down management. While in Japan, many companies truly have what's called bottom-up management. Once again, many companies want to be lean in America. But you don't have quality circles. You're, You're missing some of the basic strength of what the people have to really make you lean. Now, we initially thought that the circles were the reason Japan had the highest productivity growth rate in the world. Quality circles was a method of spreading the responsibility for product quality across all the workers in the company. Normally, a quality manager had a set of tools to measure product quality, but they were rarely ever shared with the workers. The quality manager had the tools, but he wouldn't give the tools to the worker. So quality was the responsibility of the quality manager. Well, one of my earlier clients was AFCO. They had a sole source contract to make tank engines for the U.S. Army, but the tanks were falling down in Europe, and AFCO was being threatened to lose their contract. What they did to solve the quality problem, of course, they fired the quality manager. In Japan, though, Managers taught the quality techniques to all of the employees using circles. The employees would meet in small groups, maybe five to eight people. They'd meet on their own time during lunch, in the morning, before work, after work, or on weekends. They did take it seriously. And they might work on just two major projects a year. The basic quality tools are the following. Cause and effect diagram. Check sheet control charts, histogram, Pareto chart, scattered diagram, and stratification. You can look this up on the Internet, and if you want a copy, just send me an email to bodek, B-O-D-E-K, at pcspress.com, bodek at pcspress.com, 
and I'll send you a copy of exactly what the seven basic tools mean. I was able to see firsthand how they'd work at a company in Japan. I went to a company called Tokyo Juki. They are a manufacturer of industrial sewing machines. So one day I'm with the president of the company watching these best quality circle groups present their projects because twice a year, the groups would present to upper management and the presentations were very professional and they demonstrated significant improvements by the workers. Well, at the end of one of the sessions, the quality members asked the president for feedback. He clapped and he said it was great. And they said, don't compliment us. I mean, really, they were saying to him, don't give us that crap. We want real criticism so that we can get better. I had never seen anything like this before. Miracle 22, productivity grew. The best work is always performed under the most trying conditions. Rudy. Somehow we figured out how to attract newsletter subscribers. And within 18 months... I had over 3,000 subscribers paying $120 a year. I now had a real business where we could all make a nice living. However, beyond the circles, I knew very little why Japan was so successful. One day, this was September 1980, I attended a conference in New York City, and it was run by Industry Week. Industry Week has been a very mystical thing for me because Industry Week used to come to my conferences, which I would run in the future, and they wrote in Industry Week, and they called me Mr. Productivity. And Industry also inducted me into their Manufacturing Hall of Fame. And they also had me speak at one of their online seminars. I was on the cover of Industry Week with Michael Dell. <laughs> one of the speakers at this conference was Joe Giorai. He was the manager of the Japan Productivity in Washington, D.C. And during his talk, he asked the attendees if they would be kind enough to allow Japanese managers to come and visit their companies. Having lost most of my fears, I went up to Joji after his speech and I asked him, Joji, would you do the reverse? That means, would you let me take a study mission of Americans to Japan to learn what the Japanese are doing? Amazingly, he said yes. And I sent out an invitation to all of my 3,000 subscribers asking them to join me on a study mission to Japan. That was a real gamble because I had no idea what the Japanese were doing. I had no idea if this study mission would find out. But miraculously, 19 senior executives agreed to go with us. In preparation for the trip, I went to visit the Oldsmobile plant in Tarrytown, New York. There we saw 500 cars being built on the assembly line during the day, and they built another 500 cars at night. And I looked around the plant, and I saw mountains of inventory, 1,000 hoods, 1,000 trunks, 1,000 of everything to build 1,000 cars. And then there was a railroad car sitting almost in the factory with another 1,000 parts. And then up the line, there was another railroad. And then up the line, there was another. There was probably five days' worth of inventory sitting in those railroad cars waiting to be made in this shop. As we walked along the assembly line, we saw the same model car, the same color car being built at the same time. I watched one man putting brake fluid into each car. And I turned to the guide and I said to him, is that all he does during the day? And the guide said, I don't know about that man, but we had someone in this plant he was here 34 years, and all he did was pick a tire up and put it on a hook, and the hook took that tire to the assembly line. And he said, ironically, he died two weeks after he retired. Imagine, the excitement of life must have left him. What we saw at the Oldsmobile plant was quite different from what we saw on our first visit to Japan. Miracle 23, my first steady mission to Japan. What is the point of creating extraordinary instruments of space travel when the inner man remains in the spiritual antiquity of the Stone Age? The journey into space must be a spiritual as well as a physical science. Rudy. In 1980, I bought a new Buick. 
I wanted my exact specifications, and I wouldn't accept what the salesman was pushing from the lot. Most of us go, we read an advertisement, you see a TV ad, you know the exact car you want, the exact color, the exact model, you go to the lot, and the salesman takes you to what they have and gives you a bargain. They said, look, if you buy this car, you get $2,000 off. And I said, no. I am willing to pay the full price, but I wanted to get exactly what I wanted. And they say, okay, you're going to wait 13 weeks to get your car. After visiting Japan, that Buick would be the last American car that I ever bought, unfortunately. In February 1981, 19 executives, all subscribers to our newsletter, joined us on a two-week study mission to Japan. Joe Giorai arranged for us to visit 16 companies in two weeks. Wow. What an ordeal. I had no idea what to expect, but all of these travelers were very excited as I was. One of our stops on that trip was to Toyota Motors in Nagoya. It allowed me to compare what I had seen at Oldsmobile. What a difference. Instead of seeing a thousand parts on the floor, there was very little inventory. As an example, instead of seeing 500 motors the way I saw at Oldsmobile, I saw 18 at Toyota, which meant every 20 minutes, 18 more engines arrived into the plant. Instead of having all of the inventory to come in one side of the plant, all of the sides of the plant went up so that the trucks could come into exactly where the inventory was needed at the assembly line at that point. I saw also different models being built on the same line. All was a different color. I couldn't imagine how they did it so differently from Ozobiel. I saw workers moving three, four, five times faster than what I saw at Ozobiel. I saw the person filling the brake fluid, but he put on the windshield wipers and he tightened the whole number of screws. Toyota had less than half the number of workers than Ozobiel. Also, you could go to a car dealer in Tokyo to get a car. And instead of waiting 13 weeks, you'd have your car in one to two weeks later. This was February 1981, and we were probably the first people out of Japan who had seen and studied the Toyota production system, surely the first reporters. Jeff and I became overloaded with things to write about in our newsletter after visiting the 16 companies. In addition to Toyota, we also visited Fujitsu Phonic. Phonic made industrial robots. One of my biggest faults, besides listening to other people's advice, is not investing in the companies that I'm working for or the companies that I've seen. I went to see Fujitsu Phonic, and I didn't invest in them. Just imagine how rich I would be just from that one company. A year or so later, I visited another one of Phonic's plants, and they had robots making robots. Imagine, it was like getting a glimpse into the future. At night, they turned all the lights off because a robot doesn't need lights to manufacture. One day on their trip, we visited Sumitomo Electric. They're the GE of Japan. We walked through the plant, and afterwards, we heard a presentation by Dr. Ryuji Fukuda, the vice president of production. He spoke something about on-era training which said that the best time to solve a problem is just when it occurred. On-error training had five rules. Ownership rule. The person who detected the problem has to take ownership to it. Quickly rule. When you find a problem, everybody stops. You and your whole team stops, even if it takes 30 minutes. Actually rule. If possible, you try to create back what actually happened before the defect occurred. Support rule. The person who detects the problem takes the prime responsibility, but the supervisors and the other ones, they could help give support. But there's what's called the shut-up rule. The discoverer is expected to solve the problem. He could ask for advice, but the supervisor and the manager really had to keep quiet to give the person a chance to solve the problem. I was fascinated with his talk. And I went up afterwards to meet him. He was the first Japanese manager that I got to know well. Through an interpreter, I invited him to come to America. I wanted him to speak at the Productivity of the American Way conference that we were going to run. That was our first conference. And he agreed to come. 
He also told me at that time that he finished writing a book. And I told him without thinking, hey, I'd love to publish your book in English. But I had no idea what I was saying, for I never published a book before. A few months later, I received a copy of Managerial Engineering, the name of his book in Japanese. In essence, this book was Dr. Fukuda's understanding of the Toyota production system. It was a struggle for me, as I had never published a book before. Thankfully, Dr. Fukuda knew a young lady, and he asked me if he could use her to translate the book into English. And I said, of course, I didn't have anyone, and she was Noriko Hoso Yamada. She not only translated that book, but she translated many of my future books. She also became an interpreter for future study missions to Japan, and miraculously, she became my wife 18 years later. Publishing the book, however, was a challenge. After reading it, I was very confused about many parts. So I went to Japan to meet with Dr. Vakuda and Noriko. Noriko met me at the airport, and we went to the New Otani Hotel. Coincidentally, I say magically, the hotel was having a conference put on by Japan Management Association, the JMA. Shigeo Shingo and Taichi Ono were speaking at the conference. Shingo had taught over 3,000 engineers and managers at Toyota the fundamentals of industrial engineering, how to improve quality. He taught them how to solve problems. Shingo was an independent consultant, while Ono was the senior vice president in charge of manufacturing at Toyota. I credit both of them with creating the Toyota production system just in time, or what we call as lean. I saw Shingo. I was very excited, and I walked over to meet him. And he was in a wheelchair. And I said, Mr. Shingo, I am Norman Bodek. And he looked up at me, and then he turned away. And then he stopped, and he looked up and said, Ah, Bodek, son. He finally put together that I was the person in America that bought thousands of his books. I asked him to please come to America. He said he didn't know if it was possible because he was in a wheelchair. Later, I was able to bring Dr. Shingo to America to speak at my conferences, to run seminars, and to consult with a number of American manufacturers. I remember clearly bringing him to Harvard University to speak. A number of Harvard professors were in the audience that day, and one of the attendees asked Shingo a question. He didn't like the question at all, and he said in Japanese, the man is stupid. And the interpreter foolishly translated it. My wife would never have done that. I took Mr. Shingo to Drexler Industries in Maryland, where they were manufacturing gasoline pumps. He walked over to a punch press operation with a group of managers and engineers, and he watched the operator pick up a piece of metal from the floor. So they picked up a piece of metal from the left side off the floor. They put it on the bed of the punch press, and then they put the metal inside the press, put the two hands over the buttons, you got to make sure you're putting your hands on the button so you don't lose your hands to lower the press down. I laugh because they try to prevent injury to the body, but they don't care about your mind. Just go to a manufacturing plant and you'll see what I mean. The machine formed the metal, and then the productive gates raised up, allowing the worker to reach in and pull out the formed metal and place it to the right side on the floor. Shingo then said to the observers, the engineers that were with me, And he said, what's the value-adding ratio? And one engineer said, oh, it's 100%. He's always working. Another engineer, no, only 75%. Another said only 50%. And Shingo laughed and he said, no. Only 17% is value being added. Only when the press forms the metal is value being added. Then he asked the engineers, how can you improve the value-adding ratio of that operation? Immediately one engineer said, You could put a mechanism to automatically lift up the metal sheets off the floor. Just when you go to a cafeteria and the dishes come up, we can do the same thing in the factory. Another engineer said, we can put a spring at the back of the press. And so when the press comes up, it would force the form metal to come up, making it easier. And another said, well, we could put a table over on the right side so she wouldn't have to reach down putting the metal down. All of those would save a few seconds. The great lesson at that moment was Shingo, because instead of telling them what to do, he just asked them. It's unfortunately something I rarely ever did before. 
I would always tell people what to do. Next, we walked over to a different punch press, and Shingo asked a bunch of operators, how long has it taken you to make a changeover? And they said two hours. And Shingo said, look, I'm going to teach you a few things, and then I want you to do this changeover in less than 10 minutes. I want you to go from two hours to less than 10 minutes. A Mauer next to me said, that's impossible. Well, it took Shingo 30 minutes through questions to explain various things that they can do to reduce the change over time. And then he said to them, how long will it take you to do these new things I suggested? They said it would take about two hours. Shingo promised to return later. We did come back two hours later, and we watched as the changeover was done, not in two hours, but in 12 minutes. Shingo then had a sad face. He scolded them. And he said, look, I told you to do it in 10 minutes or less. And then he laughed and congratulated on doing such a great job. American industry has saved billions and billions of dollars learning how to do that quick changeover. Mr. Shingo at the time, Shingo was the co-creator of Just In Time, along with Mr. Ono. And if American industry would only study and apply their concepts correctly, they could replicate it and even improve on what Toyota has done. But unfortunately, we call it lean in America. And what we do is we take bits and pieces and apply it. And then we say, well, it's just a flavor of the month and it doesn't work. I know of only a few companies in America that can really do what Toyota does. In fact, Paul Akers said only 2% of Americans really understand lean and only 2% are applying it. The real power of Just In Time is Mr. Ono always demanded the impossible. I never see managers doing this in America. He'd go over to some people. He had no idea if they can do it, but he would just demand them to do the impossible. He never knew if they could do it or not. I'm going to talk more about this a little bit later in the book. Shingo would just ask questions to arise the deep knowledge within people. Shingo both reduced change over times drastically, but he also developed a methodology called pokayoke to virtually eliminate defects from the production process. One day I took Shingo to an Apex conference, American Production Inventory Control Society. It was in Las Vegas. There were 3,000 people there. I rose early in the morning to bring him to the conference, and he was in a wheelchair. Now, Shingo had me buy three bananas to use during his talk, and I bought the three bananas, but I didn't have a chance to have breakfast. Since I was hungry, I ate one of them. And then I get up in front of 3,000 people to introduce Shingo to the audience. And he started off by telling them that I had confused him because I ate one of his bananas. And his talk was based on three bananas, not two. I was so embarrassed, but the audience loved it. The point of bringing the bananas was to show that when you buy a banana, you eat the content. You don't eat the skin. So Shingle said, why should you pay for the skin? The analogy referred to customers who buy your product and they have to pay for all of your waste. Why should they pay for your waste? Miracle number 24, our first productivity conference. It is essential to separate the mind and emotions from the psyche as they are of different dimensions. Rudy, arranging for the first productivity of the American Away conference, I felt that I needed a CEO of a major American corporation, a major union leader, and a U.S. senator congressman. Unfortunately, I had no idea how to get any of them. I did not know any CEOs. I did not know any union leaders. And I surely didn't know anybody in government in Washington. As I was thinking about the problem, I get a call from Joe Schneider. Joe Schneider says, Norman, I love your newsletter. I want to help you. What can I do? At the time, Joe was a consultant to the chairman of the board of Chase Manhattan Bank. I told Joe what I needed. And he said, Norman, give me a few days. Never happened to me before or after. Nobody ever picked up the phone and called me and said, Norman, I love what you do. I just want to help you. Well, a few days later, Joe called back and he said, Norman, I got Michael Rose, chairman of the board at the Holiday Inns. I got Don Eflin. He's second in command of the Automotive Workers Union, and he's in charge of the Ford Motor Company account. We were two-thirds there. 
Then I found out that my editor's brother worked for Stan Lundeen. He was a congressman from upstate New York. The impossible happened. We got the CEO, the union leader, and the politician. With those three, I easily attracted 40 speakers from industry to come to the conference to speak, and we attracted 300 attendees to come to the first conference at the Waldorf Astoria in New York City. Funny story. I wanted Dr. Fakuda to speak at the conference, and he agreed to come over, but I didn't want him to use the interpreter that he used when I visited him at Sumitomo Electric. I appreciated Fukuda what he taught, but the interpretation was so poor. I wanted him to hire another interpreter, but the only way for me to communicate to Fukuda was through the interpreter. So I want to tell Fukuda through the interpreter not to use him. How am I going to do it? Well, funny, Fukuda understood, and I didn't hurt the feelings of the interpreter. Miracle number 25, Finding Shingo. You must find within yourself the deep, sincere need to grow. The wish must be silently repeated several times until there is a sensation of an opening in your heart, like the opening of a flower. Rudy, since the first study mission went well and gave us a lot of information to use in the newsletter, we decided to do again the following November. However, Jochi would not do it for me again. So I had to figure out how to get companies in Japan to accept us. I found the addresses, luckily, of 350 Japanese corporations, and I wrote letters to each of them to ask them to please open their door. I only needed about 12 companies, but I wrote 350 letters. Believe it or not, 12 said yes. I never told other people before how difficult it was to get a Japanese company to let us come and visit them. But luckily, they were great companies. So I promoted the trip to my newsletter subscribers, and 15 people signed up this time, including Jack Warren. Jack was a senior vice president of Omark Industries in Oregon. They make saw chains for the lumber industry. The first week of the trip, Jack kept saying to me, my company is better than any company you've taken us to. I was embarrassed. But the second week, we visited Nippon Denso, a major supplier to Toyota. Denso's plant manager was Mr. Ota, and he showed us a quick changeover, mixed model production, and other things that Denso had learned from Toyota. Mr. Ono did something that I wish American managers would do. What Mr. Ono did is first they converted Toyota to a just-in-time company. Then they went out to their major suppliers. They went out to 10 suppliers and they got each supplier to pick one manager to work full-time in this group. So now they had a group of 10 people with one person coming from 10 different companies to work together to convert their organizations to just-in-time, and they got together each month with Dr. Shingo. One of these people was Mr. Ota, a miracle to find Mr. Ota. He was there. So at the end of his talk, Mr. Ota gave us a sheet of paper, and on it, it had the study of the Toyota production system from an engineering viewpoint by Shigeo Shingo. I had no idea what this meant, no idea who Shingo was. But at the bottom of the piece of paper, it said Japan Management Association, JMA. I didn't know what it was about. I called the number when I got to Tokyo, and they told me it was a book written by Mr. Shingo. I asked the other travelers, anyone want a copy of this book? Only Jack Warren said yes. So I ordered one for him and one for me. And Jack and I read the book on the trip back to Japan. It took about 10 hours or so to come back. We both read it, but we both did the exact same thing independently. We ordered 500 copies of the book. I ordered them to sell to my newsletter subscribers, and Jack gave a copy to his engineers and managers. He told them to read one chapter at a time and ask each other how they could apply the information at Omark. In a short time, Omark became the best JIT company in America. Over the next year, Omark was able to reduce its inventory by 90% by just reading that book. The Omark managers and engineers were taught earlier value engineering and value analysis. They were taught how to work in small groups, how to read books to get the best out of it, how to ask questions of each other, and how to apply the new information in the company. 
Very often, you know, we read a book, we love the book, but we don't know how to apply it. Value engineering tells you how to apply it. At that time, I discovered that there were about 400 certified value engineers in America. One company in Japan, Toshiba, had 1,600 engineers. This is a technique that was invented in America, but we just rarely, rarely used it. I'm just going to read the headlines of the value engineering process, and I'd like you to go to the Internet to look it up, or once again, send me an email to bodic at pcspress.com, and I'll give you all the details. So value engineering teaches you how to gather information, how to measure the information, how to analyze it how to generate ideas about this particular product. Value engineering is about improving your product or service or improving your process. Value engineering means what is value? Value is what the customer is willing to pay for. That's what they want. Like Shingo said, they value the inside of the banana, not the outside. And then in value engineering is ask you to evaluate evaluate which ideas are the best and then to develop and expand the ideas and then to present the ideas to management to go ahead with a new product or a new service. The Shingo book cost me $21 from JMA. They would only give me a 10% discount. They weren't very nice to me at all because a book dealers in America get 50% discount and at least the bookstores in Japan would get at least a minimum of 20 to 30% discount. But I was a foreigner. So they only gave 10% off to me, but I bought it and I took a gamble and I sold the book for $29, which gave me enough money to be able to make a profit and pay for the shipping charges, etc. I eventually bought over 35,000 copies of his green book for JMA at only a 10% discount. The original book had a translation that was difficult to read, but the information was exceptionally valuable. With Shingo's approval, I had the book re-edited by Connie Dyer after we sold the 35,000 copies, and she did a marvelous job on re-editing the book, and I continued to sell tens of thousands of copies. When Shingo learned that people had been critical of the first translation of his green book, he asked me to translate other books he had already written into English and to also publish all of his future books in English. The next book Shingo wrote was called A Revolution in Manufacturing, the SMED System, Single Minute Exchange of Dye, and we know a single minute is less than 10 minutes. One to nine minutes is a single minute. In it, he tells a story of how one day Mr. Ono came to him in the Toyota plant and he said, we have to get the change over times and that punch press reduced from four hours to two hours. And Shingo said, okay, that is a miracle in itself. If somebody came over to you and said, look, I want you to do this in half, what would you say? And a week later, Ono comes by and he says, Shingo, two hours is no good. You've got to do it in less than 10 minutes. Ono had a reputation for asking for miracles, for asking for the impossible. Ono wanted to get rid of inventory. And if a changeover took you four hours, then you had to stamp out maybe 10,000 parts in order to please the accountants, to prorate the cost of the changeover onto each of the products. Once again, Shingo agreed, and then he spent days watching the changeovers. Soon, Shingo figured out how to get the changeovers under 10 minutes. Imagine a process that had for years taken four hours could now be done in less than 10 minutes. I saw a changeover at Toyota, which took seven minutes, a seven-ton press. It took 40 hours at General Motors to do that same changeover. Getting the changeovers reduced to 10 minutes allowed Toyota to reduce its inventory, which was the most important key to allow a company to do just in time. Here's an example of how Shingo thought about improving changeovers. Once again, instead of reading this in the book, I'd like you to send me an email at bodek at pcspress.com, and I'll send you all the details from Shingo on how he went through on the changeover process. The philosophy is really fundamentally this. There are four stages. One is preliminary stage, and all the setup work is combined. And Shingo made a dichotomy between what he called internal and external. Internal is things 
that you can only do when the press stops. External is what you can do while the press is working on the previous product. So as an example, it takes at least an hour to heat a dye before you can make parts out of an injection molding system. So it takes an hour to heat a dye. You have to wait till the changeover is taking place, put a new dye into the press, and then spend an hour just heating it up. It takes one hour for that. Shingo said, why can't we heat the dye externally while the press is stamping out parts on the previous job? So the important thing is he was able to separate what he called external setup and internal setup to try to do as many things to get ready for the press to change. Then the third step was how do we transfer things from the internal to the external? That means how do we look at the press and try to say what things do we have to do when the press is stopped that we could be doing while the press was going. And then the last thing is just to continuously improve the whole process of the changeover. At one time, if you looked at a die, and it looked like it had about, you know, maybe 30 or 40 bolts that you had to turn to hold the die down firm. Shingo looked at a tape recorder, and the tape recorder back then, you put a little tape in, and you just take a little lever and move the lever, and it locks in the tape into the tape player. And Shingo said, why can't I do this in a giant press? Why can't we eliminate all these bolts and just get a locking mechanism? And they did. And slowly he was able to reduce virtually every single changeover at Toyota to under 10 minutes. To me, Shingo was the world's greatest manufacturing engineer of the 20th century. His SMED book I sold for $60. Why? Because it cost me $100,000 to do. I never realized if I knew it was going to cost $100,000 to translate his book from Japanese and redo all of the charts and pictures and everything else inside, I probably never would have done it. I wasn't that rich. But then I did do it, and I decided I'm going to sell it for $60, and I sold 100,000 copies. Imagine a book on quick changeover reaching sales of $6 million. That's a rarity of any kind of book. I asked Shingo one day, What's the best plant in Japan? I thought he was going to say Toyota, but he said the most productive plant in Japan, if not in the world, is Panasonic washing machine in Shizuoka. I said, Dr. Shingo, can you get me in? He said, yes, he got me in. When I went there, I saw everyone in the office stood up and greeted me as I entered. A number of employees were playing volleyball. Supplies were delivered to a fully automatic delivery system. And that delivery system brought those individual parts directly to the worker on the line. The workers did not have to go anywhere to get parts for their washing machine. In front of the worker was a TV screen, and it gave the operator, most of them were women, the exact instructions of how to build this individual washing machine. So every washing machine could be different, and all the instructions were in front of her. The worker could get feedback on the problems while they were happening. There was no maintenance department. Every machine had a picture of a worker, the one who could fix the machine if there was a problem with it. Maybe twice a year, Panasonic would have the vendor over to help, but they didn't need a separate maintenance department. Panasonic had the highest rated quality circles in Japan. Employees were hired if they were good at sports. They had the best visual system I had ever seen, with every wall filled with pictures and charts. One chart, which was very impressive, it just showed three consecutive pictures. A manager would go over to an area, take a picture, and then tell the workers, look at this picture, look at the area, and improve it. Then at the end of the month, he or she took another picture of the same area, and then did it again another month later. And if you looked at all those pictures, you could see the marvelous things that people were able to do once they were inspired to focus and given the opportunity to make improvements. We had in America a suggestion system. And it goes back to Kodak in 1898. They had the first suggestion system. And the first idea was wash the windows. Now, that was a very good idea, I guess, in 1898 with lighting. 
But the problem with the American suggestion system was when the worker gave the suggestion, the supervisor was the one that had to do it, not the worker who came up with the idea. So the supervisor said, look, I have enough work. I don't need your crappy ideas. Pardon my French. Japanese re-looked at this system. And what they did is they asked the worker who came up with the idea to do the implementation. In America, the average worker gave one idea every seven years, and they were given 10% of the savings. In Japan, the worker was hardly given anything at all. Maybe $5 was the most. And instead of giving one idea, Toyota at one time got 70 implemented improvement ideas per worker. And now Paul Akers teaches two second leans, where every day a worker should be improving their job by two seconds. On one wall, I saw a skill chart. The skill chart showed all of the necessary skills in the plant. And then it had a list of every worker's name was listed there. And it was a little check mark if the worker knew that particular skill. Now, I have in the book here a listing of all of the certificates or all of the skills that they wanted at this particular plant. I'm not going to read them. I'm going to ask you once again, if you want a copy, send me an email at bodek at pcspress.com, and I'll send you the list. Miracle number 26, finding Japanese books to publish. Asking from the very depth of yourself to surrender or attain a state of nothingness is the key to opening to the flow of higher creative energy, Rudy. After that, I frequently went to Japan and eventually found almost 100 Japanese management books to publish in English. It was a miracle because I couldn't read, I couldn't write, I couldn't speak Japanese at all. I would go to Japan, I would meet with Japanese editors, I would talk to Japanese managers, and I'd visit bookstores. The editors and the managers gave me many suggestions about which books to choose. I trusted their advice. This is one difference in my life. (laughs) Trusting their advice, they were right. Trusting other people's advice for other things about what I should do invariably ends up wrong. At a bookstore, choosing the books was a little bit more difficult. But I began to trust my intuition. And if a book felt good, I would gamble and have it translated. Each one was a real gamble because the average book cost me around ten dollars to $15,000 to translate. Now, not every book I chose was great, but four out of five gave America some wonderful new information that was making Japan the productivity growth lead in the world. The books below is a listing of some of the books I published. Once again, I recommend you go to Amazon, look in Productivity Books, go to Productivity, my old company, and you'll see the hundreds of books that I published. This is a listing of some of them. One was called 40 Years, 20 Million Ideas at Toyota. Quality Function Deployment, QFD, by Mr. Akau. Hoshin Kanri, also by Mr. Akau. Zero Quality Control, by Shigeo Shinga. Workplace Management, by Mr. Ono. The Toyota Production System, by Ono. Just in Time, by Ono. The Shingo Production System, by Shingo. The Sayings of Shigeo Shingo. Non-Stuck Production, by Shingo. Variety Reduction Program, by Suzue and Kodate. Product Design Review, The Idea Book, One Piece Flow, CDAC by Fukuda, 20 Keys to Workplace Improvement by Kobayashi, An Introduction to TPM by Nakajima, also TPM Development Program, Equipment Planning for TPM, also a book called Management for Quality Improvement, The Seven New QC Tools. There's a wonderful story about that one. I found that book in Japan. It was written by Mr. Mizuno. And I found out that Florida Power and Light wanted to use the book. What they did is they paid somebody to translate the book, but I got the rights to it. So they really couldn't use it. And I found out about it. It was funny. My wife, Noriko, was working there. I'm not sure if she told me or not inadvertently. Well, I went to them and I said, look, I have the rights to that book. And I published it and they bought 7,000 copies from me. The largest order I ever saw. I gave a discount, of course. Another book was Cost Reduction Systems, A New American TQM. And recently, I published a new book called The Happiest Company to Work For. I have a separate chapter just on that. I'll talk about it later. And then I published a marvelous book called The Handbook for Productivity Measurement Improvement. The funny story about that 
is a good friend of mine, William Christopher. He was a, a great writer and an editor and a good friend. And I showed him a book written on quality published by Joseph Duran, a very famous consultant leader in the quality movement. And he put together a thousand page book. And what he did on quality, he used to save articles on quality and put it into a filing cabinet. One day, he thought, why don't I just take these articles and put it into a book? And he did. He took all of these articles and he put it into this book over a thousand pages. And I said to Bill Christopher, why can't we do the same? Why can't we create the handbook for productivity measurement? And Christopher did it. And I linked him with Carl Thor. Carl Thor was the president of the American Productivity Center at one time in Houston. He was very famous. And the two of them put together this book. It was over a 1,000 pages. It was wonderful. Big bestseller for me. And I sold it for, I think, $90. Becoming Lean is another excellent book. That was another interesting story. Becoming Lean was written by Jeffrey Liker. And then I sold Productivity in 1999. And Jeffrey Liker wrote another book called The Toyota Way, and it's probably sold two million copies. Two million. I probably would have got the book, but I didn't have the company anymore. I, I did the JIT Implementation Manual. This is an amazing two books, which I sold for $3,000, and nobody ever asked for their money back. Another was called Five Pillars of the Visual Workplace System, and that taught us what's called 5S, or visual thinking, and hundreds more. And I miraculously broke through my own resistance, and I wrote several books. Mrs. Sleeper, she never believed that. She was my ninth grade teacher. We'll talk about her later. I wrote a book called The Idea Generator, Rebirth of American Industry with Bill Waddell. I wrote a book called Kaikaku, The Power and Magic of Lean. I wrote another book called How to Do Kaizen with Bungie Tozawa. And I wrote a wonderful book, I think it's wonderful anyway, called The Harada Method. And I wrote that with Takashi Harada. And I'll talk about that later in the book. I wrote another one called All You Gotta Do Is Ask with Chuck York. And then this latest one, The Miraculous Life, An Unending Search for Freedom. When I trusted my gut, it seemed like I found the best books. But if I asked others outside of the editors and the managers, I was easily fooled. I asked an interpreter once that was traveling with me. I was at a bookstore, and I looked down at the book, and it looked like to be an interesting book. And he said, ah, it's junk. It's flake. Don't do it. The author turned out to be Japan's best management consultant. It was translated many years later into English, and it was a bestseller. At another time, I looked at a novel. And also, I felt very good about that novel. I picked it up and said, I'm going to do it. My interpreter says, forget it. It's no good. That author was... Haruki Murakami, and his book has sold millions and millions of copies and will probably get the Nobel Prize one of these years. I'm not sure if I would have been able to get the rights to his book, but you never know. You would think that since I had received such poor advice over the years, I would have just stopped listening to others beside those managers or the editors. But it took me a long time, a very long time, to really have confidence in myself and in this wonderful consciousness inside me. That we should teach at school, how to teach children to really feel confident in themselves. Miracle 27, Productivity Incorporated. Everything in the universe is energy or a manifestation of energy, and the purpose of spiritual work is to become with that flow of higher creative energy coming from God through the cosmos. Rudy. Well, I own Productivity Incorporated, Productivity Press. We published over 250 management books. In addition, we ran conferences, normally twice a year, each headlined by a CEO of a major American corporation, including Intel, American Airlines, Southwest Airlines, Florida Power and Light, and Marriott, among others. We also had top sport figures. I had Joe Montana, Bobby Valentine, and Rod Carew. We had five U.S. senators, including Charles Percy of Illinois. Percy was the only one that did not charge me. It's funny, at my conferences, I didn't pay anybody except the politicians. So I had five U.S. senators and three U.S. congressmen. I gave them 2000 each. I had Bill Crosby. He was very famous back then as an author, consultant. And I tried to get him, and they said, yes, I had to pay $7,000 for him. Well, I broke through my resistance, and I gave him the $7,000. 
many, many years later, I'm sitting with Phil Crosby out in Portland, Oregon. He mainly lived in Florida. And I said, Phil, you were the only one that I really paid outside of the politicians. And he said to me, Norman, you just didn't work hard enough. Many of America's top management consultants and management authors spoke for me, including Lou Davis. Lou Davis was a professor at UCLA who taught social technical design. Actually, if we could combine the Toyota production system, or what we call lean, with social tech together, we'd have absolutely the best manufacturing system possible. What I'd like you to do once again is just send me an email to bodek, B-O-D-E-K, at pcspress.com, and I'll send you the next pages on a social technical system, but I don't want to bore you when I'm talking. A social technical system fundamentally is to look at a company in a balanced way, in a balanced way, that it's an organization that has people and technology. What we often do is we build a modern plant and we use the most modern technology possible. And then we just put people in, we slot them in. I went to Ford Motor Company once outside of Detroit, Michigan. And they said they spent two billion dollars to build the most advanced engine plant to make engines for their automobiles. They spent two billion dollars. Most of it was spent in Germany because Germany was so good making machines. They put it into the plant, and then they just had people there. And I remember watching people reading newspapers. They had no work to do. They were there just in case the machine went down. The plant was not designed for people. Volvo tried this subsequently. Actually, this story goes back to a man called Eric Trist. Eric Trist was a consultant during World War II in England, and England needed the young men to be soldiers, but they also needed men to mine the coals. They had no other way of getting energy then. They couldn't, the boats were blocked by Germany to bring the oil in. So they asked Eric Trist, he was part of the Tavistock Institute at the time, to determine which mine was the most productive mine. And Eric made a study and he found one mine that was the most productive. And he found out that this particular mine only had workers. No supervisors, no managers, no secretaries, no nurses, just the people that did the mining. And they organized themselves. They did everything that was necessary to run that mine. And Eric Trist came up with the idea, why can't we have a manufacturing system based on the same principle of self-organizing people? We have plants now, I have to be very careful because I know your supervisors, I know your managers, but we have to figure out what is your real role. Do people need supervisors? And what is the role of a manager? A manager is one that coordinates between one area and another. A manager sets the vision. A manager gets the resources that are necessary, but the workers do the work. Volvo, though, did two plants in Sweden. And they couldn't get those plants to be as productive, and so they closed them. But now I just discovered this last week. This is funny. Just this last week, I discovered Honda. And Honda has a new plant in Thailand. And this new plant has workers on a platform. And the platform moves around the plant. And all of the parts that the worker needs is right next to them, moving with them, And these two workers make a whole car. We'll talk more about this later. Okay, we did everything possible to make sure our conferences were outstanding events. We brought over a number of Japanese professors, managers, consultants, and even a few CEOs came from Japan to speak at my conferences. Each conference had around 40 speakers giving presentations on the latest and most important management topics. At each event, we received information to share in our newsletters. So a productivity newsletter always had lots of information. That's the reason I ran the conference. But then I did another newsletter, Total Employee Involvement. I did another newsletter called Total Productive Maintenance. We'll talk about those later. And I ran maybe 200 seminars a year. I feel the two most important workshops we ran were Five Days in One Night. It's now called the Kaizen Blitz and Maintenance Miracle. Like so many other things in my life, the Five Days and one night workshop came to me. I was visiting Toyota Gosei with a study group 
when Ono let me visit, he was now chairman of Toyota Gosei, and he let me come and visit him, and he lectured my group, which was wonderful. And Yoshiki Iwata was an assistant of his, and he came over to me, and he said, look, Norman, I'm going to leave Toyota. I'm going to open up my own consulting company. And he said, would you help me come to America? And I said, sure, I'll help you come to America. So what I did is I knew George Konusaker. And he was a plant manager. He ran a plant called Jake Brake. It was in Connecticut. It was a Danaher company. And he agreed to let me run this workshop called Five Days in One Night. That used to run at Toyota. I promoted the workshop. Forty-five people came, and they paid me $5,000 each. And I knew nothing about it. Just another miracle. I don't know how we did it, but we did it. Iwata and Nikao ran the event. In one week, they transformed the plant. They rearranged the people. They rearranged the machine. It went what was called a batch processing system to one-piece flow system. That means they rearranged the plant into product flow, making products instead of just making parts. It was the most amazing event I've ever seen. It was called Five Days in One Night. Because in one week, we moved 50 machines in that plant. The first day, they taught us about what just-in-time really means. Then the second day, we went out and looked at the plant, and we wrote down the cycle time. How long was it taking to do everything? Then on Wednesday, we rearranged the whole plant into product lines. And then Wednesday night, we moved the 50 machines. And then Thursday, we had to teach all the people how to now work in the plant, which was totally different. It was chaos. Thursday night, we wrote presentations. And then Friday morning, we all gave presentations on what we had learned. It was the most amazing training event I've ever seen in my life. Not just learning something, but putting everything into amazing practical use. The results were striking. Danaher was able to remove enormous amounts of inventory from its supply chain, and they used the cash that it freed up to buy other companies to do the same thing. Danaher went from a $2 billion company to close to $20 billion, and they never sent me a royalty check. Can you imagine that? The Maintenance of Miracle was another highly successful workshop run on the factory floor. We would bring a group of managers from various companies to a factory. We'd lock off the power on a large machine. We'd open all the covering panels. It's amazing that you look at machines in a plant, and they all have metal panels. Why? Why aren't they glass so we can see what's happening inside the machine? We would remove the oil pans on the floor. The oil pans are there because the machines strip. Well, the consultant who came from Japan said, you don't let oil leak, period. We washed the inner parts of the machine. We color-coded it. We labeled all the wires and hoses. We created checklists for everybody involved with the machine to bring the machine back to its mint condition. The workshop was initially run by an ex-Toyota manager from Daihatsu, and it was a great event. These two events were magical because they just weren't giving people information. They were doing it, making enormous change in a very short period of time. Productivity success opened many doors for me. In 1982, Ronald Reagan ran a productivity conference in Washington, D.C., and we were invited. I was awed to be just a few feet away from the president. I was awed by the power of the president. I was awed by the office. It was a real pleasure for me to be there. We were treated for lunch at the Dolly Madison Room in the State Department, and I ate with all of the members of the U.S. Cabinet. The magnificent room was filled with treasures from our country's past. It was a marvelous experience. Productivity's best year was 1990. We ran 10 conferences, over 200 seminars, and the cash poured in. I was rich. I didn't know what to do with the money. But I foolishly ignored the rule of seven. Even though I knew about it, the rule of seven refers to the book of Genesis, where Joseph interpreted one of Pharaoh's dreams to mean that there would be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. I just wasn't very clever. Soon, we started to give a lot of our gains back. Operation Desert Storm successfully defeated Iraq and liberated Kuwait, but American industries just stopped investing in its employees. And the first thing to go 
when there's any slight economic downturn is employee training. And this is funny because in Japan, it's the reverse. Instead of laying people off the way we do it in America, because they don't lay off people, they would take those people and start to train them for the future. They would say to themselves, look, it has to turn around. And if it does turn around, we'll be more successful. We have more skilled people. If we're going to go out of business, well, we're going to go out of business. What can we do? One year later, instead of getting 500 people at a conference, only 50 people showed up. Once again, I asked somebody for their advice, and I said, what should you do? Things are looking bad out then. And he said, run the conference. And I ran it, and 50 people showed up instead of listening to my intuition. Industry cut back, but I was not smart enough to do the same. We had a group of management consultants who did excellent work, but without work, they made very little money for the company. Times were tough, but we managed to get through them. Miracle 28, finding Fitzroy in Grenada. Creativity must become recreativity. Really creative people are the true riches of a country, Rudy. For eight years, I flew to Grenada multiple times a year, staying for around two weeks. I really loved working with the employees in Grenada. They were humble, they were respectful, and very hard workers. While on the island, I worked in our data processing facility six days a week. On Sundays, I would spend the day on one of the most beautiful beaches in the world, on Grand Anne's Beach, with fine sand and warm Caribbean water. I just loved that place, and no rocks at all. Walking on the beach one day, I met a pair of seven-year-old twins, Fitzroy and Fitz. They were charming and very nice. The mother didn't know she had twins, so she named the first one Fitzroy, and a few minutes later, Fitz comes out. She couldn't think of a name, so she called him Fitz. After that, just about every time I visited the island of Grenada, I'd pick up these young boys, and I'd spend the day on Sunday picnicking and swimming with them on another marvelous beach of Comte Point Saline. It's the bottom of the island, and it has one beach with white sand and another beach with black sand. It was so beautiful, and hardly any other people ever went there. So I used to take them every Sunday. I really got to like them. And I told them that if they graduated high school, I would bring them to America to further their education. Well, I stopped going to Grenada when the twins were about 15. I had very little contact with them until one day my phone rang, and it's Fitzroy. And he said, Dad, I graduated high school. It was a shock to hear from him. Fitzroy did not even know who his father was, so his mother always said, call Mr. Bodek Dad. I didn't know what to do, but I lived up to my agreement, so I brought Fitzroy to America, and I sent him to prep school for one year, and I later helped him get a job in the bakery. I didn't bring up Fitz because he didn't graduate high school. At the bakery, Fitzroy did whatever was asked of him. He was totally humble, and slowly he learned everything about the bakery business. One day, he even went to Belgium, spent three months there. He'd knock on the door of a bakery. He'd ask the owner, can you let me work a couple of weeks with you? And don't pay me anything. I just want to learn with you so I can go back to America. And they did. He spent three months learning how to make bread from some of the best bakeries in the world. Fitzroy's hard work paid off tremendously, and eventually he became a great baker. It's 38 years after he first came to America, and he now owns traditional bread. It's one of the largest bakeries on the East Coast. It has about 300 employees, and those breads are absolutely great. Sadly, I never brought his brother Fitz to America because he didn't graduate high school. Unfortunately, Fitz just never liked to work, and he spent most of his life just drifting on the beach in Grenada. Miracle 29. Friday the 13th, to attain spiritual growth, sleep eight hours to 10 hours a night, eat three nourishing meals a day, wash often and bathe at least once a day to remove your tensions, absorb everything in depth, not through tensions, make sure the energy does not stop flowing through you. That's a real challenge is to learn how to do that. Consciously surrender negative tensions every day and find in your teacher the basic qualities you wish to attain and draw that energy into yourself. Rudy, 
One day leaving Grenada, as I was walking up the steps into a very small commercial airplane, turned around, I looked the man behind me and said, you must be crazy. He looked at me strangely and he said, why? And I replied, anyone that would be on a Liat airplane on Friday the 13th must be crazy. He laughed. And then he sat next to me in the airplane. It took about an hour to go from Grenada to Barbados, where we were going to change planes to a much larger BWI A plane to take us to America. The man's name was Matthew Budd, and we chatted throughout the whole flight. Matthew was a doctor of internal medicine, and he taught at Harvard University, and he practiced medicine in the Harvard Community Health Plan. He also read a very successful book, You Are What You Say, a Harvard doctor's six-step proven program for transforming stress through the power of language. Matthew worked on over a 1,000 cancer patients, getting them to fully accept their lives, to live fruitful lives, and to not allow cancer to get in their way. He's a marvelous doctor. When we got to Barbados on that trip, we were told that the plane was going to be delayed eight hours. Not wanting to spend all day at the airport, I asked the airline attendant to pay for us to stay at a hotel, Sam Lord's Castle. Since they knew me at the airline, they very gladly made the arrangements, and Matthew and I spent the rest of the day at the beautiful hotel, swimming, basking in the sun, and from that moment on, we became the best of friends. Even today, I'm teaching Matthew the Harada method. His goal is to perfect his cello skills. He plays the cello wonderfully now, but he still wants to get even better. Miracle 30, a true miracle on the beach in Grenada. Any creative gift in you should bring you happiness. Rudy, customers of mine would often come to Grenada to help me set up their work. One evening around 6 o'clock, a client and I were walking on the Grand Anse Beach after work. But he started to walk in front of me. I was very tired and walked slowly. He was around 50 yards ahead of me because I was tired and walking very slowly. An elderly local woman walked over to him and started to talk to him. But she was poorly dressed, and he probably thought she was a beggar, so he just totally ignored her and walked away. Soon she came over to me and started to talk to me. She first said, I had a dream, and you and your friend were in my dream. You were on a big bird, and the big bird flew to carry a coup. Well, I listened to her, and we started to talk together. In one hand, though, the woman carried an old bucket, and in the other hand, she had an old towel. And she told me that she was so happy. She told me how happy she was to find them. For she was going to use the bucket to get water from the ocean. She wanted to bring it to church for the baptisms. She was thrilled with the old towel. She would wash it and then she would use it at church, you know, because people would get sweated in church on a Sunday and she would use the towel to wipe them down. Well, we continue to walk along. And all of a sudden, instead of two of us, there was three of us. The old woman, myself, not my friend, but believe me or not, it was Jesus. Now, I did not see Jesus, nor did I hear him speak, but she did. It was absolutely real for her that he was there. We both felt enriched before we departed. I took some money out of my pocket to give her. And she said, I don't want any money from you. And then she said, look, I guess I'll take the money because you'll get it back tenfold. As she left, I realized that I had just met the richest woman in the world. She was the richest person, even though she had absolutely nothing other than the most marvelous spirit that I had ever seen. I would surely give up all of my riches if I could walk with Jesus every day or with the Buddha or with Mohammed. All of them are great. Miracle number 31, finding a spiritual life. Spiritual work has one purpose, evolvement. Growth means hard work, Rudy. When I was younger, I gave up all interest in religion, and I actually believed I was an atheist. Religious people just couldn't understand how I could be an atheist. They would say to me, who created the universe? Someone had to do it. It had to be a God. And I would say, but if everything needs a creator, then who created God? I got that from Bertrand Russell. Then one day, after being out of work for nearly four months, while having a series of medical procedures, I lost a kidney, 
a Jehovah Witness knocked on the door and wanted to teach me the Bible. I had never read the Bible before. I had no idea what, what was in it. I was stalled for conversation. So instead of making fun of this man, the way I would have done in the past, I let him lecture to me. I even bought a Bible. He wanted to give the Bible to me for nothing. I said, no, sell it to me. So he said, give me a dollar. I gave him a dollar, and I started to read it. At first, I was very confused that what I was reading was the Holy Bible, the most important book of the last 2,000 years. It was filled with so much violence. However, I continued to read it, and I read it through all 1,100 pages, and I like Psalms, and I like the Proverbs, and I like the Song of Solomon, but I couldn't understand the prophets. I loved the Gospels, but I didn't like the rest of it, didn't understand it. But I became very curious about why religion had such a powerful effect on people, so I decided to go to a different church or temple almost every Sunday. I did that for over a year. You named the place, and I went there. My children went often with me, but they hated it. But my wife tolerated me, and she would come along with me. Whatever I was looking for, I did not find at the various churches and temples I went to. However, one day, I bought another copy of The Village Other from the same newsstand in the front of the library in New York City, and I read a story about Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert. They were two assistant professors at Harvard Divinity School. They'd been testing the effects of LSD on their students. And this was the early 1960s. The students claimed that by taking LSD, they had their first religious experience. Well, it interested me. I don't know why. And I thought maybe it would be a good idea for me to try LSD. This was a number of years prior to LSD being declared illegal. It seems that every time something new that stimulates people's consciousness comes out, the government is going to criminalize it. After reading the article, I did a little research, and I found Timothy Leary's phone number in Millbrook, New York. It's amazing when you look for things, you can find it. He was living there in a very large estate. It was owned by the Hitchcock Mellon family, two very large families combined. I called Leary, and I said to him, would you give me the LSD? And he said, yes, come on up. And he gave me the directions to the estate. Following Saturday, my first wife and I drove to Millbrook without knowing exactly where the estate was. Being so big, it was not difficult to find. We drove up, and there was a very large gatehouse. I've never seen one before. But the gate was closed. So I started to drive around the property, and I saw a road going inside, and I entered it not knowing exactly where to go. I drove inside, and I made a left turn. Then I made a right turn. And then I saw in the middle of the road was a tree. Somebody cut a tree to block the road. I didn't know what to do. But I drove around the tree until I saw another tree. This was standing. And there was a hundred tiny mirrors sparkling in the sun. Eventually, we found the house. And someone had painted the face of a clown on the front of the house, using the two large windows in front as eyes. We parked the car, and I walked up to the house, and there was very loud music blasting from the inside, and I couldn't see anyone. I didn't know what to do. There was no bell to ring. So with a little hesitation, we walked into the house. Inside, there was a very huge fish tank with many tropical fish. I took a few steps down the hallway, when suddenly we're standing in front of some bookshelves and all of a sudden the bookshelves swing open and out of the dark came a man and he was wearing a Catholic white collar and he had a very large cross on him and in each hand was two lit candles as he was coming out of the dark and behind them were two other people following him and they walked just past us. They never said a word to us. It was a very odd moment. We stood there waiting. We didn't know what to do. Then a very beautiful young lady came by, and she told us she was Timothy Leary's wife. She said Timothy was sitting on the roof and that he would be down shortly to give us a lecture. After a while, Timothy came down and told us about LSD and its effects. Leary's description so enticed me that I wanted to try the drug, but his wife told me I should first learn how to meditate before I took it, and I agreed to wait. Lesson number 32, learning to meditate. This is not a work of logic. It's a work of work. Doing and results count, not emotions and thoughts of work. Rudy, 
Well, I started to take Hatha Yoga lessons, and I also was taught how to meditate. And shortly thereafter, I went back to Millbrook to take the LSD. However, this time, instead of meeting Leary, I met with Arthur Kleps, and he lived in the gatehouse. Kleps agreed to give me the LSD under his supervision, and he told me to come back the following Saturday. I said, great, I'll come back Saturday. It was a good day because I was having an operation the following Sunday. And Kleps said, no, it's not a good idea to take LSD before an operation. I might have a bad trip. He convinced me to wait, and I promised I should be back in three weeks then. But before he left, he gave me a card, and on the card it said that I was the chief boohoo of the Neo-American Church in New Rochelle, New York. I had no idea what it meant, except the sense that they thought, you know, if you were a, a boohoo, or what they call a the priest, then you couldn't get drafted into the war. I still have the card. Three weeks later, I was still in no condition to take LSD. My operation went poorly, and instead of staying in the hospital for a few days and a quick recovery, it took me four months to recuperate, and I never made it back to Millbrook to take the LSD. A few days after I got home from my hospital experience, I received a call from a reporter from the New York Daily News. He wanted to interview me because he heard that I was the boohoo of the New American Church, and I had to do some really fast talking to not get my name in the newspaper. As you will see from one of the future miracles, I might have made a very big mistake by not taking the LSD. It's unclear what the drug would have done to me, but the operation almost killed me. And one of the worst, if not the worst experiences of my entire life. Unfortunately, I had been taught by my parents to totally respect the opinion of a doctor and to always follow their advice. I learned painfully that doctors are human and they do make mistakes. I found out recently, in America, up to 400,000 people die every year from medical error. I never realized that when I was a child. I always thought, you know, that doctors, you know, could walk on water. You always had to listen to a doctor. Miracle number 33, marijuana is just not for me. The work never becomes automatic. It's always a conscious process, said Rudy. For most of my life, the government has criminalized marijuana. I'm sure that tens of thousands of people, without hurting anyone, have gone to jail for smoking it. This is both laughable and painful, since marijuana can be bought legally in the state where I live in Washington. As you can guess from reading this book, I'm always filled with curiosity to learn about new things. I worked in New York City in the 1960s, and I never met anyone who smoked marijuana. Never. Well, one day I turn to my secretary and I say, Margarita, I never tried marijuana in my entire life. And she looked at me and said, would you like to try some? (laughs) I was shocked. I said, yes. And so she arranged to meet me the following Saturday on a street corner in the Bronx. So she'd bring me some. I was very nervous because it was illegal and people could go to jail just for possessing it. Margarita gave me a cleverly wrapped tinfoil package, and I carefully hid it underneath the dashboard of my car. I drove home very slowly to make sure the police would not pull me over. At home, my wife and I ceremoniously prepared for this monumental event. We made sure the children were fast asleep. We poured some wine, turned the lights down, and lit some candles to create a ceremonious atmosphere. However, I was really disappointed when I smoked the marijuana. It had very little effect on me, but that's not the end of the story. Shortly thereafter, we went to the island of Barbados, where I managed the data entry facility with around 200 people. The island had both marvelous hotels and beautiful sandy beaches. While swimming on the beach one day, I noticed a young man with very long hair. This is the early 60s. And so long hair on a man, you know, meant that he was a hippie. And I was sure he smoked marijuana. I didn't know why. I swam over him and said, this is a great place to get high. He said, man, this is the greatest. I asked him if he had any marijuana. And he said, yes. And I invited him to come over to my house where we were staying so we could smoke together. That night, the young man came over and the two of us sat on the porch smoking. For the first time, I really got high. In fact, as I was sitting there, I would say, wow. And he would say, boy. And we carried on a perfect conversation, but only those two words, fully understanding each other. 
Then he got up to go home, and I was going to take him home. I knew where he lived, but he wanted to go in the opposite direction. I said, look, you live this way. He said, no, he started to cry. He wanted to go the other way. I said, okay, you go, and I went back to the house. I went to sleep. I tried to go to sleep. I was totally neurotic. I was so fearful that something was going to happen to that young man. I couldn't sleep at all. Also, I knew that I would never try marijuana again. A few weeks later, the young man called from Canada where he lived, and he said, Norman, I got caught with a XX load of this stuff. They looked at my address book. They saw your name, and they thought you were my supplier. If you have any, you better get rid of it. Nervously, I looked for the marijuana. I found it. I flushed it down the toilet, and after that, I never touched it again. My teacher, Rudy, once said that drugs hurt the psychic nervous system. I don't recommend that you use marijuana at all, even if you're curious to find out about new things. Just don't do it. Believe me, it's not worth it. It's so bad for America to legalize it at this moment. Miracle number 34, almost dying. Spiritual growth involves increased responsibility. Rudy. One day... About four years before I met Timothy Leary, I took a life insurance exam, and they discovered that I had microscopic blood in my urine. I had no idea what it meant, having microscopic blood. I just felt fine. I mentioned this to my mother, and my mother said, go see Cousin Larry. Larry Orkin, who was actually my uncle's cousin, not mine, he was a chief urologist at Beth Israel Hospital in New York City. Now, nothing was wrong with me. But she was my mother, and so I listened to my mother's advice, and I went to see Larry. And his office was right off Fifth Avenue, where the super rich lived. So if he had an office there, he must be a great doctor. When you entered his office, you found dozens of people waiting. He didn't take appointments. You just went and sat there. After a few hours, I entered one of his six tiny examination rooms, and I waited for him. And I told him about the microscopic blood, and he recommended that I go to the hospital and we would conduct an examination to look into my bladder. A week or so later, I went to the hospital and they gave me something to put me unconscious. I woke up an hour or so later and I felt really sick with the most severe pain I had ever felt in my life. The pain was caused by an experimental dye that the doctor injected into my bladder and my body had a really rough time ejecting it. I cried out for some painkiller and was initially denied by the nurse. A nurse can't give you painkiller. What a crime. She was not empowered to give it to me. They finally found a doctor and he gave me something. But whatever they gave me, it had very little effect. I was in so much pain. It was the first time in my life I ever hallucinated. I don't know about you, but it was the only time in my life that my dreams were in color. After several painful hours, they reached my doctor, and he finally gave me some kind of morphine, which allowed me to rest a little bit. The next day, Dr. Organ comes by, tells me I have reflux. Somehow, that urine was backing up in my urethra, and this could destroy my kidney. He wanted to operate immediately, but I told him, I feel just fine, so let's wait a couple of months and see what happens. He objected, but I postponed the operation for four years until around the time I went to see Timothy Leary. Well, I made a very unfortunate mistake. The doctor convinced me to have the operation to save the kidney, which was fine up to that moment. Instead of saving the kidney, he destroyed it. I don't know what LSD would have done, but I made a terrible mistake to have the operation. And as you know, listening to someone else's advice is my main problem in life. And this time it almost killed me. I got into trouble when I listened to another person's advice, whether it's a friend, whether it's an associate, a teacher, or even a doctor. You would think that at some point in my life, I would have learned the lesson to just stop listening. But as Rudy once said, the mind is the slayer of the soul. It's taken me 85 years to learn to trust my inner higher self and not my crazy mind that jumps all over the place. Rudy once said, the mind is a wonderful master but a terrible servant. You get fifty to 70,000 thoughts a day. How do you decide which ones to listen to? But if you're really quiet inside, something can come to you, which I call the intuitive self, which will give you perfect guidance. You just have to learn how to listen to it. 
When I was young, I was taught that doctors are great geniuses. You have to listen to them. I learned the hard way that doctors are human beings, that sometimes they make mistakes and they kill people. As I said, it's claimed that medical mistakes can kill from 220,000 to over 400,000 people each year. You go to a doctor for a cure and you can die. I almost did. Before the operation, Dr. Orkin guaranteed me that 95% of these operations were successful. I said, how about the other 5%? He said I would be no worse off, but he lied. I found out later, subsequently, that the operation he performed was very rarely successful with adults. It was much more successful with young babies. After he operated on me, I was in the hospital for six weeks with a fever, not knowing what was wrong with me. Even worse... The operation was a failure. He translated the tube in my bladder, and there was not enough peristalsis in the bladder to allow the adhesion to work. I was in the hospital for six weeks with a fever. I lost 40 pounds, almost a pound a day. In the hospital, though, even with tubes hanging out of me, I would daily walk the corridors to visit the other patients. I introduced myself to one man who happened to be the father of a neighbor of mine. He told me that Dr. Orkin was going to operate on his hernia. And I saw he was a nervous wreck. I told him, you can't have an operation in your condition. He assured me they would give him something to relax. And unfortunately, the man died on the operating table. You know, it happens too often. When you die, well, it's God's will. When the operation is successful, then the doctor is wonderful. Six weeks after the operation, Dr. Orkin told me, Norman, my operation was a success, but your body did not act properly, and now the kidney has to be removed. It was a shock. I came into the hospital with a perfectly good kidney, and now it was infected. One of the interns who participated in the operation reluctantly told me that the procedure was done wrong, but he would never say that in court. Luckily, my wife took me to Dr. Robert Hotchkiss, who was the chief urologist at New York University Medical Center. Dr. Hotchkiss looked at my x-rays, confirmed that the kidney had to be removed. I asked him to remove it. But he said, no, he couldn't do it. He said it was unethical for one doctor to take a patient away from another doctor. I told him I would never go back to the other doctor, and he finally agreed to the operation. He told my wife, though, that I had only a 50% chance of surviving. But as you have seen, or will see, I have had many miracles in my life. The operation took him four hours, and Dr. Hotchkiss saved my life. Dr. Hotchkiss was noted as one of the four top urologists in America. After his successful operation, he would visit with me every morning. I remember on the fourth day, he took out a checklist, and he read it to me. Take out the sutures. I was amazed that a doctor of such stature wouldn't rely on his mind, but would use a checklist. I will talk about the power of checklists later in the book. Miracle number 35, tiny metal stitches. A miracle is meaningless unless we are conscious of the good it brings and use it responsibly. The maintenance of growth is the test of creativity. Rudy, a few years after the operation, I still had open sores. What Dr. Hotchkiss did, the second after he took the kidney out, he put metal stitches in my body, and periodically the metal stitch would pop out of my skin I'd go down to Dr. Hotchkiss, and he would remove the metal stitches. But there was two sores on my body, and the stitches did not come out. And I told this to Gregory, and Gregory was a naturopathic doctor, and he told me to go home. He said, Norman, put castor oil on a piece of cotton and put the cotton over the sore and cover it with a piece of tape. I went home, I looked in the medicine cabinet, But I couldn't see the castor oil, and my mind played a trick on me. I saw mineral oil, and I thought that's what Gregory said. And I took the mineral oil, I put it on cotton, and I put it over one of the sores. When I woke up the next morning, I took the cotton off, and I saw that a piece of metal had popped out of the surface of my skin. I was thrilled. I went to Dr. Hotchkiss, and I asked him to remove the piece of metal. And I told him the story about the the mineral oil. Well, Dr. Hotchkiss thought I was crazy. But I said, look, I'm going to do the same thing tonight and come back tomorrow, and you'll see that the other piece of metal pops out of my body. I went home. I did the same thing. And the next morning, believe it or not, 
a second piece of metal popped out of my skin. I went to see Dr. Hotchkiss again. He removed the piece of metal from me, but he never said a word, not one word, and I don't think he wrote it up in any medical history journal. (laughs) A few days later, I saw Gregory. I told him, I put on the mineral oil on the cotton and the two pieces of metal popped out. And he said, jerk, I told you to use castor oil. This story really shows the power of the mind when you deeply believe something. I still wrestle with the ability to get my mind to do the things that I really want to do. Miracle number 36, Hatha Yoga. A great teacher is a great student, and great students are great teachers. Rudy, I don't know why, but I continue to search for meaning in religion. After spending an entire year going to various churches and temples, I began regularly to see a Hatha Yoga teacher doing exercises and also occasionally meditating. Now, the teacher recommended we go to a yoga camp in Canada. I went there, and then I practiced a whole series of yoga exercise, even learning how to stand on my head. But one day, I broke my foot playing volleyball. I had a cast put on it, but it didn't daunt me. I still continue to stand on my head, even with the cast on the broken foot. Yoga had a strong effect on me. I even started to wash dishes at home, something I had never done before. My wife and I had an agreement. I worked and brought in the money, and she took care of the house. Even one weekend, when she and the children were sick in bed, I left the dishes in the sink. But after the experience in Canada, everything changed, and I started to wash dishes. At that time, I had a phobia, which was that every time I would get my feet wet, I would catch a cold. And sure enough, Every time I went out, not from a shower, by the way, but if I got my shoes wet, I would catch a cold. It always happened. To prevent this, I kept a pair of galoshes, you know, rubbers that I could cover my shoes with, and I had a pair in the office and I had a pair at home. In Canada, I forgot. I didn't bring a pair with me and it started to rain. I told my phobia to Rosalie, who was at the camp, and she said, Norman, it's all in your mind. Just don't accept it. I listened to her, and I walked outside, and I got my shoes soaked. The next morning, I got up with a little scratch in my throat, a sure sign of catching a cold. I told this to Rosalie, and she said to me, Norman, ignore it. Just ignore it. I never caught the cold. And since then, I have never caught a cold from getting my feet wet. What a miracle. Miracle 37, The Stone Wall. A teacher should be the servant of the student, Rudy. I studied with a number of yoga teachers, not at all fulfilling, until one day I met Rudy. Rudy was both a yoga teacher and probably the world's largest oriental antique dealer with a store in New York City. I walked into Rudy's store in Lower Manhattan, and I sat in front of him. And strangely, he said, let me see your palm, Norman. And I gave him my hand. He looked at my palm. And he said, there's no reason you can't meditate. He said, come to my class and I'll teach you. And I listened. I worked in New York City at the time, and I'd go to Rudy's meditation class after work, and I eventually went there every Tuesday and Thursday night. I would sit in the class and attempt to meditate. I didn't really understand it, but I just felt good after every class. I would go there filled with such tensions from work But when I left Rudy, I just felt relaxed. And it was a challenge because I worked in New York City, but I lived up in New Rochelle, New York. I didn't get home those nights until 10, 11 o'clock at night. Rudy had an ashram, which was a place of learning. And he had a yoga camp in Big Indian, New York, up in the Catskill Mountains. So often on weekends, I would take my wife and two daughters, and we'd go to Big Indian, and we would participate with around 50 others helping to improve the building. We'd work on the building, we'd paint it, we'd work on the garden. And one day, I was asked to work with two other men to build a stone wall using cement. Now, what they did in early America, they built walls out of huge stones. They didn't use cement back then. You had to figure out the weight of the stone so you would place the stones together properly so they would stay there. And some of these stone walls have lasted hundreds of years. That morning, the stones were very heavy. What Rudy did is he moved the stone wall by using a crane. 
and then had the crane widen the driveway. Then he wanted to put the stone wall back. So I, with two other men, started to rebuild the stone wall without cement. The stones were very large and heavy, and most required two or more men to lift them. You had to feel the weight and properly place them together. I was not used to this kind of work. I didn't have the muscles. Most of my life, I just spent pushing a pen or a pencil. But I wanted to fit in and to learn how to really meditate. So I did the work. And I worked very hard for around three hours building the stone wall. Well, at lunch, I sat next to a woman. And I started to talk to her about my morning's experience. Without realizing it, my energy left as I was talking. And I told Rudy I was getting very tired and that I should go take a nap. And Rudy said, no, Norman, you just go back to work. And within 10 minutes, you will get all your energy back. I was a little skeptical. I didn't really believe him because I always rested whenever I was tired in the past. And I never imagined that work would bring me new energy. But I respected him enough to go back to work. Funny, didn't take 10 minutes. It only took five. As soon as I began to work, all the energy came back. The tiredness left, and I was able to work without resting for another three hours. It was amazing for me to learn that working could bring energy. I learned a great lesson that day. But even now, it's very hard to apply it. Whenever I get tired, the first reaction is, do you know what I mean? I should just take a nap. But I will change this. A few weeks ago, Paul Aker spent a day with me in Japan, and he recommended we go on a fasting diet. He has lost 60 pounds and runs the Ironman today. He said to me, you fast for 16 hours and then you eat for only eight. Now, I only eat from 10 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock at night, and then I fast for 16 hours. Within 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., we eat normally, but I normally have very little for lunch. From this, the body starts to eat away the fat. I've lost 10 pounds in the last few weeks. A year ago, Paul encouraged me to give up sugar and carbohydrates. That means he said, don't eat bread, cake, and rice, and to not eat anything literally that comes out of a box. Well, I took Paul's advice. <laughs> it's funny, not listening to people's advice. I took Paul's advice, but this time I lost 25 pounds. When I was 37 years old, I gave up smoking cigarettes, and I gained 25 pounds. And now I'm back to my weight before smoking at 155 pounds. And I still have a little stomach, but I am sure with exercise, it'll go away in the next few weeks. I guess some advice from others is good, but just be careful. Miracle number 38. Positive results come from working every day with great depth and for a short period of time by Rudy. This chapter is about Rudy. Rudy was a real phenomenon. I always felt good around him, but I understood very little of what he taught. I would sit in meditation class staring at him, listening to him speak, although to be truthful, his words would go in one ear and out the other, and I would usually leave the class remembering nothing. Of course, as I got older, many of the things he said would come back to me. One day I was sitting on a bench with Rudy next to me and my daughter Phyllis on the other side. Part of Rudy's meditation technique was for a student to stare at the middle of his head and to breathe in to absorb the energy he was sending. This time Rudy was staring at Gregory, who was sitting across the room. All of a sudden, my body leapt off the bench and I found myself sitting on the floor. I don't know how this happened, but it did. Rudy studied textile engineering in college, but he decided after he got out of the army to go into the antique business. But he had very little money. He had just enough money to rent a very small one-room store on 7th Avenue in Manhattan, down in the village. He called it Rudy's Oriental Antiques. Even though the only thing he had inside the store was a sink with cold water, Rudy worked there and slept there. He went to the bathroom across the street at the gasoline station, and once or twice a week, he went to his mother's house to take a bath. Every day, Rudy would get up early in the morning and scavenge through the rubbish that people had thrown away. This is in Manhattan. He'd pick up the broken pieces of antiques, he'd bring it back to his shop, and then he'd repair them and sell them. From that one store, 
Having nothing, he eventually ended up being one of the world's largest, if not the largest, oriental antique dealers in the world. And he owned buildings in Manhattan, many buildings in Manhattan. Rudy told us a story about his antique business. He went to India and he bought a ton of antiques, but he had no money to pay for him. He was sitting in the store knowing that the ship was arriving that day, and he turned to one of his clients and he casually said, can I borrow $30,000 from you to clear a shipment? The client said yes. Somehow, Rudy felt that life operated perfectly for him, and he took full advantage of it. One day, I'm in Grenada. Rudy came down to visit me while I was working there. And taking Rudy back, I took him to the airport, and one of the government officials was guiding Rudy to get on the plane. And she was taking Rudy in front of the long line of people to get on the plane. And I said to Rudy, is this right? And Rudy just said, look, Norman, you take life the way it is given to you. Another day, Rudy was in front of his house in Manhattan when a panhandler asked for some money for food. And Rudy said no. And a student said to Rudy, surprisingly, Rudy, that man is in rags. How come? Look, Rudy said to the beggar. I won't give you any money, but I'll take you into my house and I'll feed you. And the man said, no, I only really want a drink. Rudy had an amazing ability to look at people and to love them and fully respect them no matter who they are and serve them in what they really needed. How many of you would take a beggar into your house and offer to give him a meal? Rudy came to visit me while I was working in Grenada, and one day there, he and I drove around in a small convertible with the top down, and while I was driving, there were two flies, and they were buzzing in front of me on the windshield. I didn't want to kill them. I asked Rudy, what should we do? And Rudy had a pocketbook in his hand. He loved Agatha Christie. He'd been reading it, and he said, what you do, Norman, is you make them into butterflies, and in one swipe, he killed both flies on the windshield. Rudy was a great teacher, but he was also very practical. One day in Grenada, we all went to a horror movie. People in the audience were screaming at the screen, not like in America. They get up and they just scream at the characters in the screen. And Rudy just sat there and he breathed in because he felt that he could take in that energy and grow from it. He felt that in order to grow, you had to take in energy and use it for your own growth. So he just sat there. He would draw the energy into what's called his chakras, and he would expand them. By doing so, Rudy felt he was freeing other people from their tensions at the same time as he was eating them. Halfway through the movie, Rudy just got up and we all left. I guess he had enough to drink. Rudy had one great wish. I want to grow, he would say. Each of us has unlimited opportunities to grow, to serve others, and to leave this world consciously. Rudy was an amazing teacher, and unfortunately for us, he died in a plane crash near Big India, New York, at the age of 45. I only studied with him for two years, but he had a very powerful, positive effect on my entire life. As you can see from the beginning of every chapter in this book, Rudy was full of interesting sayings. He said once, if you listen to other people's words and you react from those words, you are crazy. What is a word? All it is is hot air coming out of somebody's mouth and you give meaning to it and you go crazy. He also looked at life differently from most people. He often said, if there's a harder way, show it to me for I want to do it for it must be wonderful. Most of us look for the easy way. He wanted the harder way because the harder way caused him to grow. And he felt that that was the purpose of life, was to come here and to just grow. Miracle number 39, the greatest miracle of all. Almost without exception, people will choose to do that which keeps them dead. Work goes against the grain. Rudy. One day after studying with Rudy, I was sitting near him, thinking about going to India to study with another teacher. A neighbor of mine has suggested this. I did not tell anyone at all what this neighbor told me, but somehow Rudy read my mind. Rudy said, Norman, you don't have to go to India to learn meditation. He said, if you can't learn it from me, you won't learn it from anyone. I felt he was right. So I gave up the idea of going to India. 
Rudy had taught me to meditate. He had a specific way of doing this. If you'd like to know, send me an email at bodic at pcspress.com. One day, I told Rudy it was very difficult for me to meditate. I would do it one day, but not the next. He said, Norman, if you don't meditate every single day, you will break the connection with me. I didn't know what it meant, but that was all I needed. For the past 44 years, I have meditated every single day. I believe that meditation has kept me on the path of continuous growth. Even this morning, I meditated one hour before I came to Greg to record this book. Rudy once said to me, Norman, if you continue to do this meditation technique I taught you, you will have an experience in a year and a half from now that will convince you that I was right. Well, about a year later, Rudy died in a plane crash. He was in a small plane, and it crashed into a mountain. After he died, I continued to go to his ashram in New York City. It was run by his mother. She kept it open. And I went there to meditate at the end of work. However, I totally forgot about Rudy's prediction. Well, one day, it was 6 o'clock in the evening, and I was in Long Island, about 60 miles from Rudy's building. I knew that class started at 7 o'clock, and I thought with a little bit of luck I could get to the class at time. Don't tell this to anyone else, but I was going a little bit too fast. But luckily, there were very few cars going into the city at that hour. Most were leaving the city to come out to the suburbs. So I made great time. When I arrived, I found the parking spot right in front of Rudy's building, which is a miracle in itself in New York City. I jumped out of the car, I ran up the steps, and entered just as the doors were closing. A second later, and I would not have been able to attend the class, for the door was always locked exactly at 7 o'clock. Since I was late, I sat in the back of the class. At the end of the meditation class, I was breathing inside deeply. When I leaned my head back and I felt a flush of energy come up my spine into my heart, then the most amazing thing in my entire life happened. My heart opened up and I felt a tremendous amount of love. It was the first time in my life and I understood for the first time in my life that love was something real, and it came from inside your own heart. It was wonderful. My feeling had nothing to do with anyone else. It was simply love, and I understood for the first time why the heart is a symbol of love. I never had this experience before, and I've not had it since, but I'm very grateful that it happened. I mean, I love my wife, sure. I love my children. I love my grandchildren. I love my great-grandchildren, and I love others, but the definition of love is totally different than the love within your own heart. So we all say, I love someone else. But love is an energy that really sits in your own heart. Do you know, it's like putting your hand in water. How do you describe putting your hand in water? It's very hard to describe things. But when you experience it, you know it. I was very grateful for the experience because it has sustained me these last 50 years to continue to meditate every single day and to continue my search for the ultimate truth. I'm very grateful for my life, and I hope before I die that I can experience that ultimate state of freedom. This is a footnote. The study of the wisdom of truth is called hidden wisdom with respect to the fact that it cannot be grasped in merely a conceptional way. Just as with the taste of a given food, one cannot adequately describe it to one who has never eaten it. Also, with regard to the experience of love and the awe of the blessed Creator, it is impossible to fully describe love of the heart, and this is why it is called hidden. It comes from something called the pillar of prayer. Miracle number 40, Three Frightful Psychic Predictions Often you work until you come up against resistance. And there you stop. Yet this is the very time you should work through that resistance. Rudy, when I was younger, as I mentioned earlier, I was an atheist. I didn't really believe in anything spiritual. I didn't believe in astrology. And especially I didn't believe in psychics. I suppose I thought I was just very pragmatic, more of a scientific mind. However, this changed radically later in life, especially when I traveled to India. 
One day, I was with a teacher and also a doctor of Ayurvedic medicine, and we were in Chennai, which used to be called Madras, India. The doctor introduced us to a psychic, and he made some predictions for us. The psychic took some small seashells in his hands, and he shook them. He threw them onto the table in front of him. He moved them around on the table, and then he put them into very small groups. Using the shells, he then made a prediction about the future of the teacher, which sounded pretty right. Then he did the same thing for me. He took those shells and scattered them around, and then he looked at the shells and he said to me, you are going to lose all of your money. Now, that didn't make me very happy, and I didn't know what to think, because at the time, my company was doing well enough for me to travel all over India. The next day, the teacher and I flew over a 1,000 miles to Kathmandu, Nepal. There we met a Tibetan monk called Wang Dalama, and he asked the monk, Norman is troubled. Well, the monk took two bones from around his neck, and he shook those two little bones, and he looked at them, and believe it or not, he laughed, and he said, I'm going to lose all of my money, but don't worry about it, he said, it'll come back. Boy, was I in confusion. When I came back to America a few days later, there was a letter waiting for me from a former author of mine in India, Sri Chakravarti. And in the letter, she said, Norman, I gave your astrological chart to an astrologer here in New Delhi. And he said, if you don't leave your teacher, you're going to lose all of your money. I was completely in shock. My life was totally entwined with this teacher. Half my employees were his students. Unfortunately, I had mixed up my business life with my spiritual aspirations, and I didn't know what to do. I wrote back to Sri. And I said, go back to the astrologer again and find out what happened if I don't leave the teacher. Once again, the astrologer said I would lose all my money, but it would come back to me. My head was in a tizzy. I wasn't very bright at all. No, three different mystics told me the exact same thing, but I didn't know how to listen to them. I listened to all of these <laughs> crazy people throughout life making a mistake and hear three psychics tell me the same thing, and I don't listen to them. Well, that summer, I was offered $9 million for my company, but six months later, mostly because someone sued the teacher, linked me to the suit, and the deal died, and I lost the company, and I almost lost all of my money. It seems to me that life is a test, and to pass the test, you must keep moving forward, learning as you go, and keeping your heart open, absorbing everything, and not allowing negative events to close you off from the world. After losing the company, it took a while, but we did leave the teacher. Slowly, I was able to start again and make a very nice living. Whenever worries about money creep into my life, I always remember the woman on the beach who, without any money, was the richest person in the world. I am grateful to have enough money to live now and to continue to have a miraculous life. Miracle number 41, The Power and Praise. Creativity is a flow of higher consciousness bringing down to today that which is tomorrow. Always there must be new depth and experience. It is the creative man who experiences and the fool who follows. Creating is doing. How can anyone create without experience? Rudy. This story goes back to the days when I owned a data processing company in New York City. It was around the end of the year when we had a Christmas party for all of the employees. One young woman came over and asked me to dance with her. She was very pretty, and I gladly said yes. It was the most fantastic dance of my life. Her body wrapped around me as a lambskin leather glove wraps around your hand. There was no separation between us at all. I just melted. Somehow, luckily, I survived it. A few days later in the office, I was studying a book on how to be a better manager. I read that a good manager knows how to praise his employees, something I never did. I never learned how to praise anyone. Up to that time, I don't think I ever praised my wife or my children. I knew how to criticize, but not to praise them. I can't remember my father ever praising me, and surely my teachers never praised me. But I wanted to learn how to be a better manager, and I knew it was time to change. So, reluctantly, I went over to the same woman I danced with, she was sitting at a key punch machine, and I said to her, I want to thank you for doing such a marvelous work on the Budweiser job. She turned to me, 
and I felt such enormous love coming to me from her. Tears actually came to my eyes. Very rare do I get tears in my eyes. That moment I realized for the first time in my life the power of praising someone. It's not only for their benefit, but also for yours. The reason I didn't praise in the past, because I didn't feel it, and I didn't want to do anything insincere. I was always looking for the sincerity to come first, but now I realize it could come later. I now praise easily, and I do it every day. In fact, according to Mr. Harada, and we're going to learn about him soon, you should praise at least five people every single day. Praise is like good food that people need to nourish and support them. If you want a better life, if you want better employees, then go out today and look for wonderful things that people are doing. I guarantee they will love it and have more confidence in themselves and much more respect for you. Miracle number 42, Discovering Takashi Harada. All men are not born to be realized saints, but they can be realized to their greatest potential. Rudy. Lee Budras, a professor at Portland State University, invited me to teach at the business school. I never got my master's degrees, but they made an exception and they let me teach. I was teaching a course called The Best of Japanese Management when four students came over and asked could they intern with me. I never did this before, and I wasn't quite sure what to do with them. As I thought about this, how can I work with them, it occurred to me that I had a wonderful map. It was given to me by Shigehiro Nakamura, he was a senior instructor at the Japan Management Association, and this map could be used to help make a company world class. Why every company is not doing this, I don't know. But I never used it before. I invited the students to my office. I took out the map. I contacted Mr. Nakamura in Japan over Skype, and I asked him to teach us the map. And every other week, Mr. Nakamura in Japan would teach us about the map. Now, the map divides a manufacturing plant into its key elements like quality, productivity, maintenance, training, process, automation, technology, etc. For each area, Nakamura, with a group of highly skilled engineers in Japan, asked, what's the world's best technique in each area? And what company was the best example? In this example, the plant was divided into 33 segments. Now, I'm very happy to send you a copy of this map. Just send a note to me, bodek at pcspress.com, and I'll send you a copy of this wonderful map, and then you could use it. This map has, as I mentioned, 33 parts. In one column, like quality, cost, delivery, safety, morale, management indicators, standard, manpower, etc., it's really a funny story. It's in my future stories. I published a book called The Canon Production System, and I got invited to India. <laughs> Amazing. I've been invited in three times only because I published that book. This is funny. Underneath that, it also says Daily Management System by Takashi Harada. So I said, Nakamura, what is this daily manager system by Takashi Harada? He started to tell me a little bit, but he said, Norman, there are books published in Japanese. You can get them and learn more. Well, I turned to my wife. She's Japanese. And at the time, three of the four students could read Japanese. This was really funny. So my wife got on Amazon Japan, ordered seven books, distributed between the four of them, and then the four of them taught me what Mr. Harada was teaching. I was fascinated. And so what I did is I picked up the phone and I called Mr. Harada, using my wife as an interpreter. Through her, I asked him, I want to publish one of your books in English. He agreed. And we arranged to meet him in Tokyo a few weeks later. It was an expensive trip, traveling business class, but boy, was it worth it. I learned from Rudy you don't have to get it up front all the time, Norman. You could get it behind. So I went to Japan to meet him. When Noriko and I met Harada, he said that instead of just translating an old book, he would like to write a new one just for me. And I told him, I would like to co-author the book with you to Americanize it. And he agreed. Mr. Harada dictated 120 pages in Japanese to his assistant and Kaiko Morimoto she translated the Japanese into English for us. And then I added another 200 pages 
and we had a new book called The Harada Method, The Spirit of Self-Reliance. In retrospect, I've published 100 Japanese books in English. I never asked an author before if I could co-author their book. If I asked Taichi Ono and Shigeo Shingo to co-author their book, I would have been one of the richest men in the world. Wouldn't need anything else. But I wasn't that smart. The reason I say that, because to take a Japanese book, it's not just taking the Japanese and put it in English. You literally have to rewrite the book and restate it in a way that Americans can understand. Now, the Harada Method is designed to build champions. Mr. Harada was a track and field coach at the lowest rated junior high school in Osaka, Japan. This rating did not deter him. He was determined, how am I going to bring these students up? So he studied the best coaches in the world, and he developed a new methodology. It took him 20 years to do this. At one point, Mr. Harada was confronted by the principal of the school, and he said, you're too hard on him. And he said to the principal and the mothers, if you want your children to be winners, give me two years to prove that my method works. If I don't succeed, then fire me. Within two years, Harada completely turned the school around. And within the next few years, 12 students won 13 gold medals. That meant that they were the best athletes, not in Osaka, all of Japan. Something like this never happened in Japan before. Mr. Harada became very famous on national television. Now, a key part of the Harada method is to serve others, because you might not let yourself down, but you will do your best to not disappoint others. One of Harada's gold medalists was asked, what did you do to win the gold medal? The student said, I wash dishes every day at home. Now, Justin Gatlin, the American sprinter, he spent 10 years trying to beat Usain Bolt. Couldn't do it. He finally won this last summer in London at the World Championships. When he was interviewed, they asked him, what did you do to win? He said, I didn't do it for me. I did it for others. There are two keys to success in life. One is to pick a very strong goal of what you want to do to be a master at and never, 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 never give up. And the other is to discover how to really love the divine and find your true self. Convinced that the Harada Method was something very powerful to share with the world, I decided to really learn the Harada Method by using it on myself first. I picked a goal. I wanted to become the best Harada Method coach outside of Japan. Even though I co-wrote the Harada book, I still had much to learn about it. So I went to Japan with my wife, and I took a special workshop taught by Mr. Harada. It was a very eventful event. For while we were in class in Osaka, a powerful earthquake shook Japan, causing the devastating tsunami that killed thousands of people. Although we were 500 miles away, the building shook for close to 10 minutes. A few days later, I was in Tokyo preparing to meet a book publisher to translate one of Kazu Inomori's books. Kazu Inomori was the president of Kyocera, and I thought he was the best manager in Japan. But it was 2 o'clock in the morning, and I became so nervous about the nuclear plant in Fukushima, I called Delta Airlines, and I said, Delta, can you get me out of Japan today? And they said, yes, they got me two tickets. I then called my wife. She was in Kirishima on the other side of Japan. And I said to her, get on a plane tomorrow morning and meet me. We're leaving the country. And she did. And I never published Mr. Anamori's book. In my opinion, he is the best, if not the best manager in all of Japan. He has seven keys in motivating his employees. One, Embrace all of your employees as if they are partners with you. Imagine you're the president of the company and you are going to embrace the employees as if they're all partners. You're going to gain the respect and admiration of all those employees. You're going to tell employees about the significance of their work. You're going to have a grand vision for the company. You're going to clarify the mission and the purpose of the company. You'll continually share your philosophy with your employees and you're going to work on continually elevating your own character. Well, Kyocera is one of the most successful companies in the world. He also started KDDI, which is a cell company in Japan. And a couple of years ago, he was asked by the Japanese government to take over Japan Airlines. They went bankrupt. 
Inomori went into Japan Airlines, and two years later, they went from bankruptcy, and they made over $800 million just from his philosophy to treat people as human beings and to uplift them all. I came back from Japan, and I went through the Harada Method religiously, determined to become the best Harada Method coach in the world outside of Harada. I feel that I am the best, and now I want to teach people to be even better than I am. Once, when I deeply understood the Harada Method, I developed a certification course to teach others. Over the next four years, I certified 50 people, and everyone who came to the course except one loved the workshop. One person came from utility, and he thought I just charged him too much money. But all the rest loved it. And I, I love this idea of certifying because, you know, you go to college, they give you a certificate. So I thought, why can't I do the same? Why can't I teach and give them a certificate? Now, many of my students came from overseas. They took the information back to their countries, and now the book is in eight different languages. It's in German, translated by Kai Radish. It's in Polish, done by Arthur Wozniak. In French, by Walter Van Preet. In Portuguese, by Louis Marquez. Italy by Giorgio Torconi and Federico Bora, Spanish by Rafael Lucerno, and Dutch by Jim Lippens. Currently, thanks to Steve Mitchell and Ed Wong in Australia, I'm now teaching the Harada Method to around 20 students from many places in the world over Zoom.us. I charge those people $4,500 to become certified, and 50 of them paid it. Now I'm teaching Zoom.us, and I charge $125 an hour, and maybe you need four to five hours. Some take just one hour. Contact me at bodick at pcspress.com if you want to take the course over Zoom.us. The Rana Method has several steps. You evaluate your level of confidence by giving yourself a score of 1 to 10 for 33 characteristics. If you give yourself a score of less than 10, then you write, how are you going to improve yourself? So on the list, the first word says accountable. So how accountable are you? Rate yourself from 1 to 10. If it's less than 10, then I want you to write a specific task of what you can do to become 100% accountable. The second one says, are you an active listener? The same thing. What could you do to learn how to become an active listener? The third one says, ask effective questions, etc. I'm sure you will enjoy going and evaluating yourself. Then the second thing you do is we have a long-term goal-setting form. Now, I have five forms. If you want to copy the form, once again, just send me an email at bodick at pcspress.com, and I'll be very happy to send you all a set of the forms. The long-term goal-setting form is you define what you really want to achieve in life. What do you want to become a master of? What excites you? You state your goal. You have a clear vision for your success in attaining the goal. You write your values and purposes for your goal. You review your past successes, your failures, your problems and obstacles to overcome, as well as the solution for them. Why? You look at your successes so that you can repeat them. You look at your failures so that you can avoid them. You write down your problems so you can come up with solutions. Then you write 64 tasks. How do you go to attain your goal? And you put down dates when you're going to get started. It's not that difficult. It only takes you about 33 minutes to do it. And I have taught hundreds of people. You can all do it. You then go back and complete the long-term goal setting sheet. And you take out 10 tasks from the 64 that you wrote down. And you put them in the order of priority when you want to get started. You also write down at least 10 routines. I feel everybody is stuck in their habits. If you just look at your habits, no matter what they are, you drink coffee all the time. I'm not saying coffee is bad, but we're all stuck with habits. You smoke cigarettes, you drink alcohol, you eat too much. Everybody is stuck in habits. But if you write down new routines, we have a method to help you break your past habits and to become a new person, a new, totally new person. Become exactly what you want. I'm not saying you're bad at this moment, but if you want to be more successful, you must follow our advice. Then you keep a daily diary. And on the daily diary, you take some of those tasks. And I'm going to do today what I need to do to attain my goal. And then you review it. Then you say to yourself, 
Did I do what I wanted to do? And then you evaluate your performance. You rate yourself. How good did you do that day? And then you ask your coach, and this is a key. A key to success in life is having a coach. Every single successful person that I have ever met in life, every athlete has a coach. Only one. Bubba Watson is the only one out of the thousands. He says he does it without a coach. Everybody else has a coach. And yet you go to work every day and you don't have a coach. Surely your supervisor should be a coach, but they're not. They're there to scold you. They're there to watch you. They don't trust you. They think you're going to cheat the company, etc. It's crazy. So we in the Harada Method, we teach you how to work with a coach, and I also teach you how to be a coach. Then you fill out this routine check sheet, and there you're going to check off every day that you're following your new habits. The process is not complicated. And once you do it, it works very, very well. Mr. Harada has trained 80,000 people in Japan with great success. One particular example of Mr. Harada's impact is Shohai Otani. And he was a sophomore in high school, and he was trained on the Harada method. Otani's goal, I want to be a Japanese baseball player. I want to join the Japanese major league, but I want to be both a pitcher and a batter. He felt that he had to pitch at 99 miles an hour to do this. He used the Harada method a plan to do just that. Two and a half years later, he was the number one pitcher selected into the major leagues. And today, three years later, he is the best pitcher in Japan. And he can pitch now at 102 miles an hour. Also, he was the best Japanese hitter. He decided he wants to come to America. And a couple of weeks ago, the Los Angeles Angels gave him a contract to play for them. Now, I have Otani's 64 chart. I have the task that he wrote down to become this great champion. If you want it, just send me an email to bodic at pcspress.com. Miracle number 43, learning how to speak to crowds. Internalize everything, Rudy said. Externalize nothing. I wish I could follow that. When I was on the forum committee at the University of Wisconsin, I was assigned to host Ogden Nash. He was a very famous poet at the time, and he was known for his humor. I spent most of the day with him, but I didn't find him funny at all. It was my job to introduce him to 700 students, and I memorized my speech. But when I stood in front of the 700 people, I couldn't remember anything. My mind went blank. I just froze. Luckily, I had a copy of my talk in my pocket, and I just read it to the students. Afterwards, I sat behind Mr. Nash, but I couldn't even smile. Thereafter, the students started to call me Smiley. <laughs> Later in life, I had many opportunities to speak in front of large audiences, but I could never do it well. Finally, I took a speech course, and I learned how to shout. You can't speak too loudly, according to the teacher, and you never turn your back on the audience, and you always talk to a pair of eyes for at least four seconds. And slowly over the years, I became a much better public speaker. A few months ago, I gave a workshop to a conference in Melbourne, Australia, over Zoom.us. There was 400 people in the room. I probably gave the best speech of my life. I received many letters of praise. I'm going to put it on YouTube, then you can go listen to me. Miracle number 44, various small miracles. Ordinarily in your life is a pattern of self-justification. Feelings you cannot rationalize away, you seek to deal with by blocking. To take the opposite approach, to open up instead of blocking, is to work towards fulfillment. Rudy. Okay, this is a bunch of small miracles. Becoming a consultant. Jack Katzen, he was a senior vice president at AFCO. He called me one day around 1983, and he asked me to help him understand quality. It was my first opportunity to be a consultant. He wanted to know my daily rate. I didn't know what to charge him. I didn't want to charge him too little. He wouldn't value me. I didn't want to charge him too much. He wouldn't hire me. So I called my nephew. He was working for Tush Ross, one of the top accounting firms. I said, what did your senior partner get per day? Back then, in 1983, he said $2,000 per day. I gave this figure to Jack, and Jack said, that sounds fair. And I started to consult with him one day a month, then two days a month. Then I did 10 days in one month. I traveled around, and I ran my business, Productivity. I traveled around to five of their subsidiaries 
I flew for the first time in a corporate jet, and I took 20 of their top leaders to Japan. At each subsidiary, Jack would say to the managers, he said, Don, who was the president of AFCO, he said, Don asked me to get you to write a quality plan and to submit it in 30 days. This was marvelous. As Jack knew, they might or might not take it from him, but they would surely listen to Don. Try it. It is very powerful. The CEO, the president, has the power. But somehow, everybody in the link doesn't take that power. But you can take it. Just use the name of the president. Then you can tell the president afterwards you used his name. Afterwards, Jack shared the plans from all of the subsidiaries. So they all wrote 10 different companies, I think it was 10 or 12. They all wrote quality plans, sent it to Jack. Jack made a copy of all the plans and put it into a notebook and send it back to all of the presidents. So all of the presidents had the plans of all of the other presidents. And then he asked them to rewrite it. It was a very powerful process. While I was working with him, Jack hired a consultant to find the top quality manager. And he gave me a great lesson. Listen to this, how to write a resume. Most people submit a one-page resume because that's what the company wants. They stick it into the computer and a miracle would happen and your name would be pulled out of the thousands. This consultant said, no, you write a four-page resume, at least four pages. And you indicate your strengths and your weaknesses. If you can't tell about yourself, then who can? Later, Jack became Undersecretary of Defense. He invited me to the Pentagon to speak before a group of generals and admirals. This is so funny because I was only a private. Steal, but don't get caught. I watched one day a neighbor of mine smashing his 15-year-old son. After he was done, I walked over to him to say, Why did you hit your child? The stupid kid stole a car, and he got caught by the police. Then he said, You know, I did the same thing when I was his age but I wasn't stupid enough to get caught. Next miracle, learning from Paul Akers. Paul Akers, the owner of FastCap and the author of four wonderful books, Two Second Lean, Lean Health, Lean Travel, and Practicing Lean. Paul found out I was going to India and he asked to come travel with me. Paul is an amazing man. When I tried to run a study mission to Japan, I did 50 in the past and I was able to attract enough travelers. This time, I couldn't get enough travelers. Paul came and 24 people signed up immediately. We did it a year later and 30 people signed up. Paul is a master of simplicity and is a master at making videos from his iPhone. Also, he goes to YouTube every day and learns something new. I want to do the same thing. I highly recommend you read his books. If you're involved in Lean, read his two-second Lean. If you want to get healthier, read Lean Health. After meeting Paul, I've lost 25 pounds. Paul told me just to give up sugar, give up carbohydrates. Next miracle, good melon, bad melon. I was eating at the Cornell Club in New York City with a manager of the Advertising Council, and he asked if I would like dessert. I said, yes. I see there are lots of melons on the menu, and I really like melons. But I found most times when I go to a restaurant, they don't give you ripe ones. They're too hard. He says, Norman, don't worry. Here they're always great. He says, one day I asked the chef, how do you get great melons? And he says, it's easy. I cut it open and I taste it before I serve it. And if the melon is not right, I return it to the person I bought it from. Well, a few weeks later, I tried this at a restaurant. I asked the waitress if the melons were great. She said, how would I know? I said, just cut it open and taste it. And then she said, but what would I do with it if it was bad? Guess what I told her? Dealing with the unknown, a client senior manager asked me, Norman, when will I get my job? This is back when I did data processing. I replied, I didn't know. And he walked away very sad. My client said, Norman, you don't do that. When do you think the job might be done? I said, well, maybe Friday. Then I said, you tell him Friday. He could live the whole week now without worrying about it. Then on Friday, you can either deliver the work to him or you tell him we'll definitely get it on Monday. That reminds me of the story about sheep. Psychologists did an experiment to see how sheep would react to shocks from a cattle prog. They first tested a normal sheep's metabolism. They gave them shocks, making them very nervous. Shortly after, though, the sheep became normal again. Next, the psychologist rang a bell before they gave the shock. The same thing happened before. The sheep became very nervous, but slowly it became normal. Lastly, 
The psychologist rang the bell but never gave the shock. This time, all of the sheep had nervous breakdowns because they're all waiting for the shock. Like the sheep, humans can handle and readjust to almost every situation they're confronted with, but we can't handle the unknown very well. Savior or Executioner In Barbados, we rented a very nice house right off the beach. One day, I saw a cockroach up on the wall. Cockroaches did not appeal to me at all, but since I had been studying yoga, I didn't want to kill anything. I found a broom, though, and gently, very gently, swept it out to the front door, and for a second, I felt so clever and so proud, until I looked up and I saw a lizard on the side of the house. Within a fraction of a second, the lizard jumped down and swallowed the cockroach whole. Imagine how I felt, going from savior to hangman. The episode taught me a lesson to be much more careful in the future. Better check those rules. A pathologist came to Barbados, a blood doctor, and he asked me to help him automate the record keeping. He wanted to take all the disease signs and symptoms and computerize them, create a database, and then a doctor can sit in front of the computer and sort of predict what kind of illness this person had. While in Barbados, he fell in love with the island, and so he did some research, and he found some investors, and he opened up a blood bank in Bridgetown, Barbados. He ordered all the necessary equipment, he hired the staff, and he trained them. And at the time, blood was selling for $25 a pint in the United States, and he could buy the blood much cheaper in Barbados. In fact, by carefully drawing blood from the same people over time, he could sell the pure blood for $175 a pint. He went to the Barbados Embassy. They told him it's okay to bring in blood. It was a great idea until customs agents in New York refused to let the blood into America. Apparently, the diplomat in Barbados had given some bad advice. It helps to know the right people. After losing my kidney in a botched operation, I went back to work, only to find that there was very little work for the company in Barbados. But I remembered Stan Kritzik. He was my roommate at the University of Wisconsin, and he used to be the head of data processing for J.C. Penney. I knew he wasn't there, but I knew it couldn't hurt me to call. So I called the new head of J.C. Penney. I said, you know, I was Stan's roommate, and I could save J.C. Penney a lot of money. Could he meet with me? And he did. And I went over to him. I told him what I did in the island of Barbados and that I could save him a lot of money. And so he then called his data processing people in. He said, can you give work to Norman? And they gave me the Kimball tickets, taken off sold merchandise, and they asked me to key punch it. It was enough work to keep 200 people for quite a time. No reservation, no problem. I had just taught a class at the American Management Association in New York City and told the attendees, I heard there was a great restaurant on top of the World Trade Center. Let's go there for dinner. We jumped into two cars, five people in each one. When we got to the front door, we had to use a special elevator to get to the top. When we arrived at the Trade Center, we went over to a special elevator to take you to the top floor. And there was an attendee to look at your name to see if you had a reservation. I said, my name is Norman Bodick. Now, he said, this was very funny, because he said, there's another group down the hall. They got there first, and they used your same name. So he thought that they made a mistake. He didn't ask me if I had a reservation, and he sent all of us up to the 101st floor, I think it was. I didn't know it, but in those days, you needed to make a reservation six months in advance to get a table at the restaurant. When the elevator arrived at the top, another person was to take us to our table. He looked at the board. He asked me for my name. He said, what's your name and the time? I hope this wasn't too dishonest. I said, my name is Norman Bodick, and it's 6 o'clock at night. It was 6 o'clock at night. I should have known he was asking what time was your reservation. But I, honest as I could, I said it was 6 o'clock. And, of course, he gave us a table for 10 with the most wonderful view of Manhattan, and it was a fabulous meal. And I hope you forgive me. <laughs> Another time after the AMA seminar, I also took a group of 10 people to a very famous Chinese restaurant about 56th Street without a reservation. Once again, the owner asked me for the name and the time. I told him I didn't have a reservation, and he just laughed at me, thinking I'm going to get a table for 10. 
But then I said, you know, I'm a good friend of Milton Glaser. Because Milton, in addition to being a great designer, he was also the food critic of the New York magazine. Milton's name was Magic. And the owner found us a table. And we again had a great meal. Divine protection. When I owned the data processing company in New York City, I had an employee who handled the shipping, and he was often high on drugs. And this disturbed me, so I got rid of him. Came back one day. He was furious at me, and he hit me across the face with his fist. Well, I was reading the Bible at the time. I just turned my other cheek for him to hit. Miraculously, I did not feel anything. I didn't suffer any injury to my face. It was as if divine energy was just protecting me. Why didn't I do that? Today, I spoke to my grandson, Sam Simone. Sam knows about 10 different languages that he could speak. He's amazing. He's now learning Japanese and Chinese. I'm lucky I can speak English well. Without knowing how to speak Japanese, I published 100 Japanese books in English. Imagine what I could have done if I could have spoken Japanese. I surely would have been the richest man in the world. Why wasn't I the richest man in the world? I was probably the first in the world to automate accounting. But as I said earlier, I didn't join ADP, and I didn't have enough confidence in myself. I made a very poor deal with audits and surveys who just buried me in work and didn't live up to their agreement. I also did not keep my spiritual life from my business life, and I allowed a spiritual teacher to completely take advantage of me. I thought his spiritual knowledge made him so much smarter than me, but the reverse was true. Jiminy Cricket, my consciousness, always gave me what I needed. But I just couldn't. I just wouldn't listen to him when I needed to. But life gives you a total package. And even though I'm not the richest man in the world, in spite of all of my mistakes, I've had an amazing life. Once a Catholic priest told me that God loves me. He was absolutely right. And I'm very grateful for that. Something was obviously amiss. On September 10th, 2001, I went through the X-ray security system at the Portland airport. I was going to Austin, Texas to work at a seminar. For some strange reason, though, when I went through the X-ray equipment, I turned around and I looked at the people and I said, you will never catch anyone. You can't sit in front of a video screen for eight hours a day and know what you are seeing. I am sorry that I didn't shout from the top of my lungs for the next day was 9-11. The Origins of PCS Press. When I sold Productivity Inc. and Press, I was restricted from competing with them. So I decided to write a newsletter called Perfect Customer Service. Funny thing is, earlier I sold 3,000 newsletters of productivity. Now I can only sell 10. I wrote a 12-page newsletter each month for one year for only 10 people. After the first year, I took one of Bungie Tozawa's books on Quick and Easy Kaizen, and I rewrote it, and I called it The Idea Generator. I also wrote a monthly column for Don Dewar's newsletter. After I finished the book, I asked Don to sell it to his 60,000 subscribers and also to see if he can get me consulting assignments. He agreed, but he wanted 50%. I told him that was too much. It's not right, Don. That's too. Nobody asked for 50%. But I didn't have anything else, so I agreed. He eventually sold 5,000 of the books for me. And he got me many customers to train. The first was Technicolor. I went to Detroit, Michigan, and I spoke to their top managers. And one of them said to me, Norman, you're talking about nothing new. But I said to him, yes, nothing new, but you're not doing it. And somehow they hired me. And I trained thousands of their employees. And within one year, they got 20,000 implemented ideas from those employees. And I loved one, especially from a man named Michael who installed a little device that actually eliminated his job. We had a deal, and I should have kept it. A few years later, I received a call from Rob Clark at Clark Metal Products outside of Pittsburgh. And Rob said, Norman, I want you to come and train all of my employees. But then he said, I can't afford you. Very strange call. And then I said, yes, you can. Don't pay me. Just give me 30% of what I save you for just one year. He jumped at the offer. So I went to this company, and I trained 60 out of 160 employees on Quick and Easy Kaizen. A few weeks later, I went back to train another 60, and I looked at Rob's very sad face, and I knew what he was thinking. And I said, Rob, forget the deal. Just write me a check for $35,000.
This was a lot more than I would have charged him the first time. He jumped for joy, and he wrote me a check. Later, we went to talk to some of the workers in the factory that I had trained earlier. We went over to one man named Tim, and I asked him to show me one of his ideas. He said, Norman, I'm a polisher. I used to have a fixture to polish two plates at a time. My idea was, why can't I have a fixture and polish four plates at the same time? What did Tim do? He doubled his productivity with just one idea. That one idea saved around $45,000 in the course of a year, and I would have gotten $15,000 from that one idea. This company got maybe five or 600 ideas during the year or more. I realized how foolish I was, as I probably lost over a million dollars. As the old saying goes, you can't win them all. Accomplishments Awards. The dumb little Norman who struggled in school, has now been called Mr. Productivity by Industry Week. As I told you, I've been on the cover of Industry Week magazine as I was inducted into their Manufacturing Hall of Fame. I was awarded the Shingo Prize for Literature. I've been given a Six Sigma Grand Master Medal. I'm called the Godfather of Lean and listed as one of the quality gurus, one of the 50 quality gurus in the world. It's all a miracle. I'm very grateful and appreciative that I have had many opportunities to serve others in their search for knowledge. Kukai. In my search for a spiritual life, I came across the teachings of Kukai, also known as Kobodashi. Kukai was a Japanese Buddhist monk, a civil servant, a scholar, a poet, and an artist who found something called the Shingon Buddhist sect. Things around the year, I'm not sure, 1200, something like that. Noriko, my wife, had a friend, Taiho, and her husband, Toshi, he was a scholar of Buddhism. And I asked him if he could find us one top Shingon monk that I could visit in Japan. Well, he found one. Abbot Nakamura was his name, and he was considered one of the top four Shingon monks in all of Japan. I wrote to the abbot, and I said, I want to visit you. He sent me back a letter. He said, nope, I can't go. Unfazed, I wrote back again, and I said, look, I only want to ask you a few questions, and this time he said yes. Gratefully, I have learned to never accept no for an answer. We went to Japan, I met with the abbot, and I became fascinated to learn more about Shingon. On Shikoko Island, there are 88 Shingon Buddhist temples, originally founded by Kukai. There's a tradition in Japan to visit all 88, believe it or not, over the next four years, Noriko, Taiho, and Toshi, and I visited all 88 temples. Some people walk it. It takes about three months to walk from one temple to the next, but we drove by cars. We climbed the steps of the mountains, and we gave our prayers, and we thank Kukai, a great teacher. Leaders must be willing to listen. Yes, I am persistent, and I rarely ever give up. I noticed one day that Macy's seemed to be having difficulties. And I was arrogant enough to think, well, maybe I could help Macy's. So I tried to call the president of the company to share my ideas with him. I looked in the phone book and I found the number and called. And I asked the person answering, I want to talk to your president. She says, I don't know who he is. I don't know where he is. I said, give me your supervisor. She said, I don't know who he is. I don't know where he is. But I was persistent, believe it or not. I made 20 phone calls to find him. On the 20th call, I reached his secretary, and I told her that this was my 20th call and why I wanted to speak with him. A few days later, I get a call from the president of Macy's. He said, I just have to speak with the person who had to make 20 calls to get me. I told him that I thought I could help Macy's improve their customer service. He listened politely but he wouldn't even send me to anyone in the company. Unfortunately, Macy's went bankrupt a year later. Now, I don't want to act as if I know all the answers for Macy's, but you never know could have helped Macy's and prevented them from going bankrupt. It is funny, you know, in my life, I've been to Japan 89 times. I've published 100 Japanese books in English. I've published another 150 to 200 management books, and nobody calls me. I'm not saying I'm a genius, but it's amazing how reluctant people are to overcome their egos. And I'm lucky, I'm grace, because I've never been that smart. So I just call up people who have the smarts. 
America now has giant multi-billion dollar corporations with tens of thousands of employees, and it's virtually impossible for me to reach anyone at the top. They're all guarded by people whose job is to protect them from the customer. It's insane to protect yourself from the customer. They don't do what Mr. Ono did. Ono taught senior executives, you've got to go to your gemba. You've got to go to the factory floor where the work is being done to discover the truth. Leaders are frequently out of touch with their employees and their customers. Later, I thought I had another great idea to help Wells Fargo, my bank. I wrote a letter to the chief financial officer. He never answered the letter. I don't know how the company can survive not wanting to speak to their customers. And sadly, just last week, Wells Fargo stock tanked. The government said you can't expand the bank. I can understand why. It's amazing how arrogant they are. I'm sure, look, if you're a CEO, you're getting five, ten million dollars a year. Why do you have to take anybody's advice? Sink or swim. I was seven years old and I couldn't swim. At camp, I asked my brother to teach me. He did. He picked me up and he threw me into the deep water and I learned how to swim. Superior quality. At the time of this writing, I have been to Japan 89 times. To me, this is a land of many miracles. After World War II, Japanese cities were ravished, burned to the ground. Today, the major cities equal or surpass anything I've seen in Europe or America. In new buildings, every time I visit, I see new construction, transportation. The trains in Tokyo are rapid and always on time. The Shinkansen, the bullet train, is a wonderful way to travel. It goes up to 200 miles an hour. The stores, they have the finest products in the world. And the food served, wow. This past October, we went to Japan, and it was a marvelous trip. We ate at unbelievable restaurants. We went to Sushi Yori Shinose. It's rated as the number one restaurant in Tokyo by TripAdvisor only serving a dozen people a night, serving the world's best fish, especially the tuna and the bonito. This man is an incredible artist. He loves his work. He loves his customer. There is only one major problem. Once you eat the food, it's gone. <laughs> In Fukuoka, we went to Shun Ikan, another restaurant. It was glorious. I've not eaten any meat in close to 20 years because I had the gout. But I made an exception. I broke the rule, and I had Chateaubriand steak. It just melted in my mouth. And fortunately, my body did not react negatively. It might be because of Paul, because I've changed my diet, not having sugar, not having carbohydrates, and I have not had a gout attack in over a year. The Japanese have the ability to replicate quality and spread it throughout all of Japan. For example, you can eat great pastries in almost any city. One day, I had really wonderful pastries at the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo, and I went out of my way to interview the head pastry chef. I asked him, how do you make such wonderful pastries? And he said, Norman, every month I have a contest with 20 chefs to make the best. He has 20 chefs in his hotel, and they compete every month to see who is the best. I also participated in a pastry competition in Tokyo, and I won. And then I went to Paris, and I also won. I am the most fortunate person to find and meet so many amazing people in Japan. Now, just imagine if you take that concept into your company, and you get your managers to compete with each other. You get your people to compete with each other. It is such an amazing, simple idea to raise the level of your company. I love the idea of having people compete to get better. In Japan, even the cleaning ladies have a contest. The woman who cleans the toilets at Haneda Airport was voted the best in Japan. Yes, recognize there is an honor in every job, and every job should be done well. After World War II, Japanese companies sent tens of thousands of people to America to study our industrial practices. They were known thereafter as a nation of copiers, which was true, but slowly focused on quality and productivity, they surpassed us, and they became the most innovative country in the world. Toyota went from making junk to selling the finest automobiles in the world. The secret to Japan's success is simply focusing on quality, adding value to their products and services, and never, never stopping. 
On this trip, in addition to eating at great restaurants, I bought wonderful grapes, tremendous apples, tremendous pears. I especially love the strawberries. But look at the strawberries you often get here. They look wonderful, but they taste like straw, not like berries. Here in Japan, they are great. Yesterday, at Big Camera, we bought a small Zoji Rushi thermos bottle. I filled it with tea, which kept the liquid very hot throughout the day and easy to drink without spilling. And you don't know what you're missing until you sit on a Toto toilet seat. Believe me, try it. Bring out the best from yourself. In the fifth grade, I painted a purple iris flower. I was so proud, for I never painted or drawn anything before that was acceptable by others or myself. But no one was impressed. So thereafter in life, I never drew again. I never felt I was confident to paint anything until I was 35 years old and my first wife, Marilyn, she was a very accomplished artist and she took painting lessons from a great painter, Philip Stein. So I would take Marilyn back and forth. I'd take her to her lessons and then I'd pick her up and bring her home. One night, Philip said, Norman, why don't you stay and paint? I said, look, Phil, I can't paint. I can't even draw a straight line. He said, Norman, yes, you can, and I'll show you how to do it. I was very skeptical, of course, but I stayed. I was given a set of brushes. I was given oil paints. I was given a canvas, and with Phil's love and guidance and his encouragement, I actually painted four canvases, and they looked pretty good. I was very proud of them. Foolishly, a few years later, I sold the paintings for $75 each. Imagine how foolish I was. Do you know what an original Norman Bodek painting would go for today? My two daughters, Phyllis and Beth, were both miracles. Phyllis is a mother of four, a chef and a personal trainer, and Beth is a mother of two and a fundraiser. Both have had to tolerate a father spending little time with them and doing things quite differently from other people. I hope when they do look back in their life that they will appreciate all that they were exposed to. I do cherish and love them both. The best of Japanese management. Lean or the Toyota Production System is now being implemented in almost every manufacturing company in the world, plus many hospitals in America. My part in this was finding the management masters in Japan who discovered the concept. I didn't create anything, but I found them. From these geniuses, a number of tools and techniques were developed. At Portland State University, I taught the Harada Method, and I taught all 30 tools. I'm not going to read them now. If you want to copy the tools, please send me an email to bodic at pcspress.com, and I'll send you the list. Nicholas' grandson at age nine. We were in New York City attending a lecture given by a Swami, a teacher of yoga, when Nicholas asked me if he could ask a question of the teacher. I said yes, and Nicholas asked in front of the entire crowd, how do you know when you are ready for a spiritual life? Nicholas was about eight or nine years old then. It was not easy for the teacher to answer, and I was mystified that a question can come out of someone so young when most adults do not know. A heart attack. On April 13th, 2012, I got a little bit upset with my wife. Something you should never do. I walked downstairs when I became very dizzy and I called out for help. Noriko came quickly, took my blood pressure, which was very low. She immediately called 911 to send an ambulance. And within minutes, I arrived at the hospital. Peace Health in Vancouver, Washington. It's only a few minutes away. After a few tests, the cardiologist arrived, sent me to the operating room. They detected that my arteries were 95% clogged. The surgeon installed a heart stent, and a few weeks later, I went back for two more heart stents. The cardiologist prescribed a number of heart medicines, which I took. I reacted to a few of them, but Noriko is a doctor of Chinese medicine, and she switched me to Chinese herbs, and gratefully, I am fine today. Miracle number 45, learning to play golf and blowing a great opportunity. To make someone happy on earth entails a lot of hard work, Rudy. One day, Jim Schwartz, one of my authors, he called me and said, Norman, I have a great idea for us to start a new business. I'd like you to meet my friend John Schley. He's a professional golfer. He won the Hawaiian Open. He came in second to Johnny Miller in the U.S. Open in 1973. I want the three of us to teach senior executives how to implement lean and how to play great golf. 
You and I are going to teach lean in the morning, and John will teach the executives how to play golf in the afternoon. I thought it was a great idea. Well, I met with both John and Jim, and we started to work out exactly how, what, and when we would teach. John turned to me and said, how well do you play golf? I said, I can't even hit the ball straight. And he said, well, let's go out to the driving range together, and I'll show you how. A number of years earlier, I had my own data processing company. I played golf every week and sometimes on weekends, but I was terrible. Stupidly, I would never take a lesson. My ego wouldn't let me. The last time I had played golf before talking to John was at the Marriott Hotel outside of San Diego. And I played eight holes and I lost nine balls. I ended up just throwing the golf clubs away. John took me to the driving range for just one hour, and at the end of that hour, I was hitting every single ball straight. What a fool I had been. John said, Norman, I want to take you out to the golf course. I want to spend a week with you. That sounded great to me, and I planned to do it after the July 4th weekend. But on July 4th, I was riding my bicycle on Martha's Vineyard, I was thinking I was Greg Lamone, the three-time winner of the Tour de France. I was riding the bike as fast as I could go over the crest of a hill, and there was a truck right in the middle of the road. The next thing I knew, I was on the ground. I was unable to move my broken hip. I was very lucky because I was not wearing a helmet. The accident was close to the most painful moment in my life. Someone picked me up, put me into a car, And every time the car moved, I screamed. It was so painful. Most fortunately, Dr. Rachel Brooks, a friend of mine, she was nearby, and she took me to the Massachusetts General Hospital and found me a doctor to operate on me the next day. I asked to stay awake. I wanted to watch the operation. They gave me a spinal, and I felt like I was watching a master carpenter putting all my bones back together again. My hip healed well, but during the recovery time, the three of us, Jim, John, and I, moved on to other projects. Thus, the accident ended my golf and my lean training with Jim and John. Miracle 46, Dislocating My Knees. It is through extraordinary effort that an extraordinary life is possible. We must swim against the stream of instincts which seek to drive us into the ocean of passivity, into acceptance of the status quo. Rudy, for some strange reason, I've had many unfortunate medical experiences in my life. When I was 17 years old, I was a junior counselor at a summer camp. One day, I decided to show off to a young girl by doing a handstand on a small wooden fence. I don't know how the idea popped into my head because I'd never done a handstand on the ground before. And as soon as I put my hands on the fence, I crashed, the fence crashed, and I tore the ligament in my right knee. And that was the end of my summer camp and also the relationship with the young girl. When I got home, the first doctor I saw told me that I needed an operation to repair the knee. My mother, though, suggested we call a cousin of hers who had graduated medical school as a chiropractor, but was now a building contractor. He came over twice a week, and he gently pounded on my back. He did this for six weeks, and in that time, the knee healed, and I never needed the operation. It seemed like a miracle. And many years later, I dislocated my left knee, and I went to see Rudy, and I asked him, Rudy, what should I do? And he said, what you do is you go see Dr. Lou Savas. He's a friend of mine, and he's also a chiropractor. And I went to see Lou Savas twice a week for six weeks, and the left knee totally healed. And the doctor said we should operate. Why medical doctors do not believe in chiropractors is beyond me. Thereafter, for any kind of medical problem, I would go to see Dr. Savas. He would come into the exam room for less than five minutes, twist my back, tap on a few vertebrae, and I would come out just fine. Miracle 47, going to the Harvard Productivity Conference. The inner goal must be complete happiness. The daily work of overcoming should become joyful and understandable. Rudy, in May 1980, we were able to publish our first productivity newsletter. Shortly thereafter, Jeff's brother, who worked at Congressman Stanley Lundin's office in Washington, he got us an invitation to attend a productivity conference at Harvard University. We were most fortunate to be included. 
The only other reporter at the conference was Leonard Silk from the New York Times. The two-day conference in Cambridge, Massachusetts, was attended by 10 U.S. senators, 10 congressmen, and about 20 CEOs from some of the biggest corporations in America. This was a real miracle, as they treated us as full members of the group. I remember being part of Senator Bill Bradley's group, and we were working on a productivity proposal. We had lots of discussions, and I wanted to participate, but truly I was very nervous. I was very nervous that I'd get caught for being just a nobody. Well, finally, the courage came to me, and I stood up, and I said to the entire group, if we can only untie the creative hands of American workers, we can compete with anyone in the world. The audience clapped, and Senator Pat Moynihan from New York State praised me for my ideas. And later that day, I spoke to a congressman from South Carolina, And he was a little bit unhappy, and he wanted to leave the House because he felt he wasn't having any kind of positive effect on legislation. And I told him, you can't leave. You're one of the few really positive people there. I also reminded him that over time, he would be able to make a real difference. The workshop gave us tons of information for our newsletter, and it helped me overcome some of my insecurity. And I think that statement is still true today. If we can only unlock the creative hands of American workers, we can compete with anyone in the world. Miracle number 48, meditation. As the ability to work grows, so does the inner capacity, Rudy. The Buddha once said, there are four noble truths. One is life is suffering. Two, cause of suffering is your attachments, your desires. Three, There is a way to get out of suffering. And four, there's sort of an eight-step approach to do it. Live right, speak right, think right, work right, things like that. But it's very difficult to change your patterns because most of us are stuck. So you might have in your head the idea that you want to change your patterns. You don't want to suffer. You want to have a good life. You want to serve others. You want to grow in this life. All of that is possible to you. And I've been very lucky that probably the only way for you to discover how to really make fundamental changes is just to learn how to sit down and meditate. And I was very lucky. After searching through so many religions for so many years, I finally met Rudy. And Rudy taught me how to meditate. And it's not complicated. And I'll, I'll sort of talk about Rudy's meditation technique is you sit quietly, pick a nice part of your house, put pictures of people you admire, put flowers there, light some incense, light a candle, sit up straight, make sure your spine is straight. You can sit on the floor if you can cross your feet. I can't, so I sit in a chair, but I try to sit up straight. And I close my eyes, and I just focus on my breathing. I try to focus inside instead of outside. We spend almost all our life outside being involved with the things that we see and feel and touch, etc. But meditation is to try to get in touch with your inner self, not your outer self. And the way to do this is you concentrate on your breath. Rudy taught us to just take a deep breath, beginning in the back of your head or the front of the head. You breathe from the front of the head, breathe in into your throat, swallow twice, and continue the breath into your heart. And then hold the breath in your heart for maybe the count of 10. And while you're holding your breath, you ask deeply, I want to change. Deeply, I want to grow. Literally, I want to reach a state of nothingness. Nothingness. I want to be totally open to everything that is and not allow my ego and everything else to just get in the way. Then after the count of 10, you slowly exhale, maybe one-fifth of the air. Then you breathe in again through your head, down in through your throat, through your heart, into your solar plexus, and that's a little bit below your belly button. And you just hold the air, which we now look at energy. We call that air energy. And we hold that energy inside where our stomach is to the count of 10. And then very slowly, you exhale the energy or the air down below into where your sex is, 
down below your spinal column. After you get to the bottom of the spinal column, you then bring that energy up to the top of your head. Then after that, you just sit quietly and breathe in and try to bring the air through all of your energy centers. These are called chakras. It comes from India, chakras. There's about 70 major energy centers, starting with your forehead, then into your throat, then into your heart, then into your solar plexus, down into your sex, down into the bottom of your spine, and up to the top of your head. And you just try to visualize that energy moving through you, relaxing you, and helping you to change your life for any kind of better future that you want. Well, as I told you earlier, Rudy said, if I don't do this every day, I would break the connection with him. And miraculously, I have done it for the last 45, 44, 45 years, every single day, even this morning, before I got up to read this book, I sat and meditated for one hour. Initially, I only did 20 minutes, then 30 minutes, but recently I've been trying to do an hour in the morning and an hour at night just to try to relax, to go inside, and to allow this creative universe to expand inside me. And actually, I want the universe, which is infinite intelligence, or what we call God, to actually work on me and change me and help me to have a wonderful life and to be able to go through my transition, wherever that might be. Miracle number 49, giving up smoking. You contain everything in yourself, and therefore you hold the answers to all of the problems and all of the questions. Rudy, when I was 15 years old, a schoolmate introduced me to smoking. I was not completely isolated from cigarettes. My brother smoked, though never in front of our parents, never at home. Well, following the examples of my friends, I started to smoke outside of the house, and very quickly I became addicted made a big mistake. So for the next 20 years, I actually was smoking up to three packs a day. This is funny because I wouldn't smoke at home when I came home, but during the day, it was almost from one cigarette to the next. Then one day, I saw in the paper that was a relationship between cigarettes and cancer. Well, the news shook me up, and I stopped cold turkey, and it lasted for a whole year. However, a year later, I went to a party, and I had a few drinks, something I very rarely do. I just don't drink. But after those two drinks, my mind said, Norman, you're an adult. You should be able to smoke when you want to and as much as you want to. Stupidly, I listened to that thought, and I started to smoke again. Soon thereafter, believe it or not, I was back up to three packs a day. It took me another year to finally give up cigarettes. I was lying in the hospital. I told you about my kidney operation. And I looked at those cigarettes and I said, you know, I'm not coming back to this hospital because of you. I took the pack of cigarettes. I crushed it. I threw it into the trash can and I never touched another cigarette again the rest of my life. It wasn't easy. It took me 15 years to get rid of the urge to smoke. But I'm very grateful. I had the courage. I had the fortitude. I had the resistance to not do it again. As Rudy once said, the mind is a slayer of the soul. You have the ability to be a master over your mind. It's also said, the mind is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. So stop listening to your servant. You control your mind, not the reverse. You learn how to do that. Miracle number 50, controlling the mind. We work until we encounter resistance, Rudy. The human mind has 50 to 70,000 thoughts a day. Almost everything you read, watch, listen to, and experience is recorded in your mind. You're just like a computer record. You've stored everything in your life into it. And the computer should only give back to me what I ask of it. But my mind, on the other hand, is like a broken computer that continually feeds me with thoughts that I might or might not need. With thousands of thoughts coming to you every day, how do you decide which ones to follow and which ones to just let go? My recommendation is to learn how to let them all go. When you get a thought, just say, cancel, cancel. I'm not interested. I don't need that movie. When you need something for your brain, you ask it what you need, and then you decide if that information is valid or not. 
while the mind can be both helpful and harmful, There is something deeper inside you that I believe is absolutely wonderful, something that will give you the information you need at the time you need it. And this is your intuitive self. To me, it comes from a higher self, not from your memory computer. Your mind, your computer, it's never fresh. It's composed of memories from your past, but your intuition comes from now, and it'll give you all the right and necessary information you need exactly when you need it. Your deep self is connected to the cosmic consciousness. It's a universal awareness that will give you the vital information you need to live well. For example, when I speak at conference, I talk very loud and very fast, and it just pours out of me with no time to think, and often wonderful humor comes out of me, and I don't know where it comes from, but I'm so grateful. I do my Christmas shopping in two hours. I take a glance, and I know immediately if it fits the person, and it's almost perfect. If I think, it takes time to shop, and I'm in trouble. The challenge is how do you make the distinction between the intuitive information that you are given and the constant deluge of junk from your mind? Often with the mind's information, you dwell on it. You juggle it around, and then you try to use it. Or it tries to use you, and it may be right, and it may be wrong. And it's very hard to tell the difference. Intuition comes spontaneously when it's needed. It is inspiring. It's motivating. You don't juggle it around in your mind. You don't have to think about it. You just stay open to it, and you respond spontaneously. You ask for what you need, and you be grateful when it comes. You're never selfish with the intuition. Never. For it's there to serve you. And it's there to serve others at the same time. Remember the old saying, sticks and stones can break your bones, but words will never hurt you. Words can hurt, but only if you give them meaning. A word living a person's lips is only air, only energy, escaping from their mouth. In the future, listen, but don't react. Just smile, stay detached, and be thankful that you know how to control your mind's computer. Miracle number 51, going to India for the first time. You must be able to look toward a goal and see nothing between it and you. Any obstacles between you and your objective must be viewed as unreal. Rudy, Mr. Harada could have said the same thing. After Walter fired me and before I started Productivity Inc., Productivity Press, I got a data conversion contract from Balker. Bowker is a company specializing on libraries. They contain database on all the books ever published in the United States. So I got a conversion contract from Bowker to convert all of the index cards from the Library of Congress to computer-readable records. This was a very large contract that I attracted, but I had no company. I found, though, a new data entry company in Bombay, which is called Mumbai today, in India to do the job. The owner of the Indian company, his name was Gopal, and he was told by an astrologer that he would have an American partner. And he looked at me and he said, Norman, I'm going to give you half my company for free. But I did not accept the offer. Gopal had about 100 key punch operators working for him. But he was a terrible manager, and it frustrated me that he couldn't tell me how long it was going to take to complete the project. Here I sent him the Library of Congress, which was millions of records, millions of records. And I said, how long is it going to take you? He didn't know. My client at Balker was not happy. So I reluctantly got on an airplane. I flew to India to find out the status of the work. Just before the plane landed, I asked the flight attendant, what is nice in Bombay? Looking strangely at me, she said, I don't know if there's anything nice in Bombay. (laughs) I didn't know what she meant until I looked out the window and I saw hundreds of men going to the bathroom out in the fields where there were no facilities. Bombay was the largest city in India, but it had one of the smallest airport terminals I had ever seen. The building was a wooden shack, and customs officers were making it so painful for people trying to bring in very small things into India. One man had a tiny little radio, and the customs agent wanted to tax him. Luckily, Gopal was right at the airport to meet me. If not, I would have been totally lost in this very strange country. It was Sunday, 
and he said he was unable to spend any time with me because he had to go to a wedding in Pune by airplane, and there was no room on the airplane for me. So I said, go, pal. It was all fine. It's fine with me. You go to the wedding. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to go out to Ganeshpuri. Ganeshpuri was a city outside of Bombay, maybe about an hour, an hour and a half away, where Muktananda, he was a very famous yoga teacher. He had an ashram, a place of study, a place of learning. And there's also a temple where Swami Nityananda used to teach. And Swami Nityananda died in 1961, but he was Rudy's spiritual teacher. Rudy met him only once for a few short minutes. But in those few short minutes, it completely turned Rudy's life around. I had met Swami Muktananda many years earlier at Rudy's ashram in New York City. I was sitting in the front row in meditation class, sitting in front of him, and he called out, and he asked me to come forward. And then he said, what did I do? I said, well, I'm a businessman. Then he waved his hand down at me, and I sat back down, and I took that wave of his hand as a very hostile and negative sign, so I never went back to his class. But it's funny, because many years later, I discovered that his waving down was his way of blessing me. My misinterpretation was really lucky, for if I had known what he meant, I might have become one of his students, and I would have missed out becoming a student of Rudy. Rudy broke his relationship with Swami Muktananda. Well, Gopal and I, we were standing in the street trying to figure out how I was going to get to Ganeshpuri. He didn't know what train to take me to. He didn't know what bus to take me to. So we were talking to each other, and then two men came over. This is India, because if you start talking in the middle of the street, you're going to attract a crowd. Two men came over, heard us, and they said they have a car, and they would gladly drive me to Nespari for only $30. But I didn't like the way they looked. I said, no. I said to Gopal, I don't like them. Gopal said, no, you're an Indian, Norman. You have nothing to worry about. And foolishly, very foolishly, I listened to Gopal. These are one of those moments when intuition tells you what to do, but you just don't listen. Very reluctantly, I got into the back seat of the car, and the two men sat in front. I don't know why, but I just did not trust them. I couldn't talk to them because they didn't speak English. They drove for about an hour, and I was getting more and more nervous and distrustful. Along the way, they stopped for a few minutes to drink some tea, and I was sure they were up to something bad, but I didn't know my way around India. And now we're in the middle of the countryside, far outside of Bombay. When I was bigger than the other men, and the only weapon I had was my camera, <laughs> but I was not a fighter. I was not very strong, and escaping in the middle of nowhere seemed to be impossible for me. Fortunately, they did take me to Ganeshpuri. And while I was there, they waited for me to take me back. At the ashram, I searched until I found Chakrapani. He was a friend of Rudy. And I told him about the two people that drove me there, mentioning that I was very reluctant to go back with them alone. He said he would go back with me. As soon as we got into the car, he said, Norman, you are absolutely right. I could see that the two people in the front seat were really angry, for they didn't know how to handle the two of us. Fortunately, they took us back to Bombay. Miracle number 52, Chakrapani, the astrologer. Rules are ordained for the purpose of controlling. At all times, it is necessary to live within the conditions existing in your culture. You can grow with all the responsibilities of your ordinary life. Rudy. Chakrapani was both a banker and an astrologer. And on our trip back to Bombay for Ganeshpuri, he invited me to have dinner at his home a few days later. And when I went to his apartment, Chakrapani wasn't home yet, so his wife graciously invited me to sit in the living room and wait. But the TV was blasting. I didn't know why, and I got up to turn the sound down. But I quickly realized that the TV was blasting because it blocked out the noise that was coming from the street. Bombay is an amazing place. As soon as the TV's volume was lowered, the sound from the street came pouring in. While I was waiting, Chakrapani's wife introduced me to chai tea. It was delicious, and I knew it would be a great selling item in America, but I wasn't smart enough to take advantage of that opportunity. Chakrapani, 
eventually came home and we had a lovely dinner together. And afterwards, he showed me his collection of astrological books. And I had never had my astrological chart done. And I asked him to do it for me. He said he would happily do it for $35. Two days later, he came to my hotel to give me a reading. The hotel was the Taj Mahal in Bombay. And it was the finest, most magnificent hotel I had ever stayed at before. My room was absolutely beautiful. I remember all of the furniture was all hand-carved. It had the largest bathroom I had ever seen in my life. Chakrapati came to my room, and he read my astrological chart. He was absolutely amazing, for he told me all about my past. He told me all about the details of the personalities of my wife and my daughters. He knew some of the things I had accomplished in my past, and he told other things that I had failed to accomplish. And he did this all from just reading my astronomical chart, just knowing where I was born, the time I was born, and the day I was born, without ever meeting me before. Miracle number 53, visiting Varanasi and the Kumbhamala. To grow, you must also raise those that you are attached to. It means getting very, very strong. Rudy. Now, I have been to India at least 20 times, and I've traveled all over the country. On one trip, I visited the city of Varanasi. It's also called Benares. It's on the Ganges River. And a few of us got into a small boat, and we went down the Ganges River. And, we, and it was really funny, because I was with my spiritual teacher. And so we stopped, and I dipped my head into the Ganges River. I want to assure you, I've washed my hair a lot since then, because <laughs> the Ganges River is not very clean. At the building, it's called a ghat, and this is where they take the corpses, and they put you on a wooden table. They pour oils on you and paints on you, and your body gets burned. And then the remaining ashes are poured into the Ganges River. So our small group, we were, at the time, about two stories above, looking down at the burnings below. And while I was standing there watching, some priests were performing what's called the Shiva ceremony. They were pouring oils and flowers onto a very small, round stone. But I was very uneasy, and I told my guy how I felt. And he said, look, Norman, I can understand why you feel that way. For those priests are not only holy men, they are also murderers. You heard that right. They are murderers. People come here, and they pay them to go out and kill someone else. They kill them, and then they know the best way to dispose of them. They burn them down below. Yes, India is a very strange place. Another time, I visited Allahabad. This is a city also on the Ganges River, but it's quite a way up from Varanasi. Allahabad hosts the Kumbh Mala. This is the world's largest gathering of people. Over the course of one month, upwards of 30 million Hindu pilgrims will visit the Ganges. There are three rivers. There's the Ganges River, the Yumuna, and what's called the Sarasvati River, which is an invisible river that nobody can see. Well, we got up very early in the morning. We drove towards the Ganges. Then we walked among the throngs of people down to the river where the boats were waiting for us. We then sailed down to the precise spot where the three rivers meet. There, I took off all my clothes, except my undershorts, and I jumped into the river to be blessed again. On the shore, there were thousands of other people entering the Ganges, also to be blessed. The Ganges is considered as a god, the river as a god. Afterwards, we walked with the spiritual aspirants. At one tent, I saw a Shiva Swami with his disciples. Many Shivites follow Shiva. Shiva is one of the gods of India. And they feel that in order to become fully free, they have to sacrifice to the Lord. And we witnessed some very interesting sacrifices. One disciple stood near the fire, and it was cold then, and he was totally naked. He wore nothing, and it was so cold for me. Another disciple was standing on one leg. He's done that for 12 years. One leg was normal, and the other one looked like a thin stick. I think this comes from, there's a book called the Bhagavad Gita, which changed my life. And in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna, who is God, 
tells his disciples that you should sacrifice to me. But he doesn't explain what sacrifice means, and other people just distort it, like these other people that I saw while I was at the Ganesh Puri. Miracle number 54, how to upgrade. Creativity is the flow of energy that can give you life. Rudy, I discovered a small miracle that I want to share with you, which I learned about as I flew my many millions of miles on airplanes. One day I was at a counter at BWIA in Barbados, and I overheard a passenger talking to the agent saying the word upgrade. I didn't know really what it meant, but when I got to the counter, I said to the woman, well, can you upgrade me? And then she said, why not? And she put me on first class and didn't charge me. Well, from that day on, and that's a long time ago, maybe 30 years ago, whenever I'm flying less than business class, I always ask the airline, can you upgrade me? And believe it or not, I would say at least 50% of the time they do it. I went from Paris to New York. I went from Vancouver, Canada, Tokyo. I went from Tokyo to Portland. Many times, there's an old saying, ask and I shall receive. However, most of us never ask. It is wonderful when it happens because traveling to Japan is a 10-hour flight and it's much nicer to go business class than it is to travel as a tourist. Miracle number 55, finding the gala. The slow, thorough work of a responsible and disciplined individual will produce rich rewards his whole life through. Rudy, lately... I've been very interested in improving the quality of health care in the United States. As I said earlier, it is reported that in the United States, from 250,000 to 440,000 people die every year from medical error, and very little is being done to change this. Imagine going to a doctor for a cure, and instead of getting something to help you, it kills you. It is ironic that the government spends trillions of dollars protecting us from a few potential terrorists, but declines to resolve this huge problem that affects the entire population of America. The medical industry could learn much from the airline industry because over the last eight years, there has not been one fatality on an American commercial flight, not one. What does the airline industry do differently that the medical industry doesn't do? The airlines fly something like 750 million people a year and no fatality. One tool mentioned earlier is a checklist. Every pilot and every mechanic relies on a checklist to ensure that every part of the plane is closely monitored for mechanical problems and all pre-flight processes are done every time. By nature, airlines place a great emphasis on safety due to the fact that if a plane is a problem, it could crash and cost many lives. The pilot knows he can't make a mistake, so all safety procedures are followed precisely. Pilots take ownership of this process, and doctors do not. Doctors are detached, and they're not drastically affected when they make mistakes outside maybe some of the lawsuits. When a doctor makes a mistake, the patient dies, not the doctor or the medical administrator. We need to change this. I'm not saying we have to kill doctors, but we need to change this and make a major switch and focus primarily on the patient's health, making the patient much more involved in their own medical care. Give more responsibility to all the caregivers, the nurses, the technicians, and everybody, and make the doctor more of a team player. All major decisions today come from the doctor. That has to change. The system is too top-down. With concentrated effort, we must find a way to drastically reduce the number of medical error deaths in America. We need to at least get doctors and other medical practitioners to use checklists. A few years earlier, I went to the hospital when my blood pressure spiked. I was giving many tests, and I always asked the technician to tell me the results. No, nope, you got to wait for the doctor to tell you. We can't tell you. The doctors control the medical system, and they do not empower the other experts to consult with the patient. With the current structure, people are dying unnecessarily. I want to help change this. Recently, my wife and I discovered in Japan an amazing doctor, and he developed a new method combining both Western medicine and Eastern medicine to heal people. 
with virtually no side effects at all. The doctor's name is Hiroshi Nagata. Dr. Nagata was formerly a neurosurgeon. He was a brain surgeon. He was also a neurologist. And he saw people were not being helped by the current medical system, and many were dying unnecessarily. Many died just by taking anesthesia. Well, he discovered a very simple technique that gets the patient completely involved in the healing process, something rarely done in the West. Normally, when you go to a doctor in America, the doctor prescribes a drug, but that can be addicting. It can have terrible side effects. Look at all the opioids. 60,000 people died last year of opioids, and most of them come from prescriptions, painkillers coming from doctors. You might end up needing an operation. In any case, you're almost totally dependent upon the doctor to make these decisions. But with Dr. Nagata, it's different. He asks you to become an active participant in managing your health. Dr. Nagata, even though he's a brain surgeon, he studied acupuncture. And while he was studying, he discovered that there was another doctor healing somebody simply by telling that person to just press down on your fingernails. You grab each finger and press down and hold your fingernails so it hurts a little bit. And Dr. Nagata tried it, and he found it was beneficial with one of his patients who had Parkinson's. And he also found out it helped another patient who had Alzheimer's. Well, he continued to experiment, and he created a very simple instrument. It looks like a pen. But at the end of the pen, there's a blunt metal point. And he takes that instrument and he prickles. He touches your skin. He prickles your skin. He does it along what's called a dermatome. The dermatome is the nerves coming out of your spinal column out to the rest of your body. Stimulating the skin causes the movement of blood and energy to bring healing to the body. I mean, you know when you cut yourself and the blood comes forward, the blood comes forward to heal you. Dr. Nagata sees patients with all medical problems, but he rarely ever gives anybody a drug, and he sees wonders taking place. Since meeting him, I prickle myself every single day above my fingernails. It causes a little pain, but it's bearable because I'm doing it myself. If you want more information on this wonderful method, once again, send me an email to bodic at pcspress.com, and I'll send you more details about Dr. Nagata's method. Every morning, I also prickle the top of my head and throughout my face. If I have a specific problem somewhere in my body, I also prickle around that area. I used to have pain around my neck because I spent so much time looking at my computer, but now I've been prickling on my neck and shoulders every single day, and the pain is gone. I taught this to my daughter, Beth. Beth has been plagued with migraines, and now she's seen wonderful improvement, just simply prickling yourself. In addition to this prickling technique, Dr. Nagata also gets you to change your diet. He requires you to get rid of sugar and carbohydrates from your diet. I no longer eat bread. I attribute this to Paul Akers. I no longer eat bread. I, I don't eat cake. I don't eat pasta. I, instead, I eat lots of vegetables, lots of fruit, and I eat fish. Dr. Nagata also pushes you to exercise every single day, to take long walks in the fresh air. Dr. Nagata helps you recognize that in order to stay healthy, you have to become a partner in the process. You don't just depend upon your doctor. Nariko and I are fascinated with this method, and we are now translating his books from Japanese to English. We hope people will look differently at their health and get doctors to recognize that there are options to help people apart from the drugs produced by the pharmaceutical companies. Miracle 56, Thomas Merton. Depth is the most important element for growth. Rudy, I hope you're having as much fun reading this as I am writing it and speaking it. I've wanted to do this for many years, but I just didn't have the courage to sit down and do it. By the way, I do recommend everybody sit down and write a book. It's a wonderful process, and it's a very creative process, because as you write, you learn a lot. A lot comes through you. As I mentioned earlier, I went from being an atheist to someone deeply involved in learning about spirituality. And I found a great teacher. His name was Thomas Merton. He was a Catholic Trappist monk at a monastery in Kentucky. Even though the monastery was very secluded and the monks were cloistered, 
That means they didn't normally leave. Merton became so famous from the books he wrote. And because of his fame, he was invited to attend a spiritual conference in Thailand. Unfortunately, while at the conference, he stepped into the bathroom. There was water on the floor, and he was electrocuted, and he died. You have to be very careful when you travel to some of these third world countries because their voltage is so much higher. I was fascinated, though, with Merton's teacher, and I read all his books. And I also decided I'm going to visit a Trappist monastery. And I went to my local priest. I knew him very well. And I told him of my wish. And he said he had a good friend who was a monk at the Trappist monastery in Spencer, Massachusetts, not too far from me because I lived in Connecticut. He called to see if I could take part in an upcoming four-day retreat. And they told them that you have to wait over a year to get in. But fortunately, a few weeks later, they had a cancellation. And they called me, and I got into my car, and I drove up. A number of years earlier, I had attended a Jesuit retreat, and I was introduced to the Stations of the Cross. The Stations of the Cross follows the life and death of Christ. And you walk along, and you pray in front of each station. And at one of the stations, I was really shocked as the priest started to shout, The Jews killed Christ. The Jews killed Christ. And I realized for the first time why Jews have suffered so much these past 2,000 years. Fortunately, after the last ecumenical, I believe they changed that. And fortunately, my experience of the Trappist retreat was much, much better. Every day I get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. I went to Mass, and I sang along with the monks. The monks were not allowed to speak, and they only used their voices in the chapel. They made an exception to the rule, and they were allowed to speak to us during the retreat. And I was very fortunate to meet Brother Patrick. He was one of the loveliest people I've ever met on the globe. He sat, looked at me, and gave me his full attention for three hours. He listened to all of my experiences and all of my problems. And he told me, and I remember this so deeply, he said, Norman, God loves you. And it's taking me many years to understand that beautiful phrase. I was so rejuvenated from spending four days with the monks that when I came home, I asked my priest to get me back on the list. Well, a few months later, they had an opening, and I gladly went again. And I went, once again, I met with Brother Patrick. This time, though, he only spent a few minutes with me. But in those few minutes, he told me many things that happened to me during the months that I weren't there. Through his silence, he was very intuitive. If I had been younger and not married, I'm sure I would have been very happy to be a monk, <laughs> especially a Trappist monk. And this was a St. Francis group. And so when I got up early in the morning to go to chapel, this was what we'd sing. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. I just love that. Miracle number 57, Dr. Shigeo Shingo's Doctorate and the Shingo Prize. There is no limit to the capacity to grow. Our only limitations are those we put upon ourselves. If you look outside yourself, you see limitation. But if you look inside, you can begin to see the endlessness of your own potential. Rudy. I was speaking at a conference at Utah State University when Professor Vern Bueller came over to me and he said, Norman, I'd like to get Shigeo Shingo to come and speak at my next conference. I said, I was Shingo's publisher. So I said to Vern, I'll do that, but there's two conditions. You have to get the university to give Shingo an honorary doctorate degree, and you also have to set up a Shingo prize here at the university. I want you to set up a prize just like the Japanese have done with the Deming Prize in Japan. They've used the Deming Prize to really get industry focused and excited on improving productivity and quality. I want to do the same thing in America. 
But Vern said he would try. And he was successful. He got the university to give Shingo an honorary doctorate degree, and he also got approval to start the Shingo Prize. At Dr. Bueller's next conference, Shingo came out on the stage. I think it was the proudest moment in his life. He got up out of his wheelchair, and he gave a marvelous speech, and they gave him an honorary doctorate degree. Now, I don't know why, but there was something missing in Shingo's life Something missing that this honorary doctorate degree gave him. I mean, Shingo, to me, was the greatest manufacturing engineer consultant in the world in the last 100 years. Mrs. Shingo, she used to travel with him all the time. But when he died, she wrapped his body in the cap and gown he received at Utah State University to be displayed. In Japan, they display your body for maybe three to five days, and she put him in a cap and gown. Afterwards, I helped set up the Shingo Prize Board of Governors. I contributed money along with many others. I set up the prize criteria. I promoted the prize, and I also selected the first prize winners. Our goal was to have the Shingo Prize promote improvements in American productivity, similar, as I said, to the Deming Prize, which has been used to spearhead the quality movement in Japan. The Deming Prize helped transform Japanese manufacturing. Dr. Deming was a great genius, and he was invited by General Douglas MacArthur to visit Japan in 1950 and teach statistical process control and quality improvement. Around 300 of Japan's leading companies were represented to hear Dr. Deming taught. They were so inspired that JUICE, it's the Japanese Union of Scientists and Engineers, started the Deming Prize for Quality, and that has spearheaded their change from the ravishes of war to leading the world in quality products. Virtually every large company in Japan competes for the prize. Dr. Deming was known also for the Deming Wheel, Plan, Do, Check, Act. Prior to this unending approach to quality improvement, the world was stuck on a concept called plus or minus 3%, meaning that every company that bought a product was told you have to accept three out of every hundred products could have a defect. Deming changed that concept from a 3% plus or minus to a wheel. And the wheel, he said, was an unending process of continuous improvement until you get to zero defects. A funny story. 1955, I wanted to take a course of statistics at New York University Graduate School of Business. I was about to sign up when my friend Howard said to me, Norman, don't take statistics. It's too hard. I don't know why I listened to him because I was very good in math, but I was afraid if I flunked a course, I would go into the army. And amazingly, Dr. Deming was a professor of that class. And if I hadn't listened to Howard, I would have met Dr. Deming 25 years earlier than I did. Once again, this crazy brain of mine would listen to other people's advice. I hope that it's ended and I can just listen to my heart, to the Jiminy Cricket inside my heart. I finally met Dr. Deming in 1980. After he was featured in an NBC documentary called, If Japan Can Do It, Why Can't We? This introduced Dr. Deming to America. When I met him in Atlanta, I told him I wanted to publish his books. And he said, Norman, I don't write books. I made a huge mistake by not saying to him, I'll write one for you. It would have been so easy to write a book for him. All you had to do is attend his workshop, get it transcribed, and publish it as a book. And Mary Walton did it eight years later. I'm always very smart with hindsight. I believe the Deming Prize was a prime force to help companies in Japan drastically improve their quality of their products and services, making them more desirable and competitive in the world. And I also believe the Shingo Prize is similarly helping American companies improve their quality and productivity. Competing for a prize is an important way to motivate people to work better together. We all like to win. So I recommend you get your company to compete with the Shingo Prize if you're in America. And I like the ideas I mentioned earlier to get the competition internally going within your company to continuously improve. Miracle number 58. Eli, my dog, was a great and valued friend. You must have a great enough desire to achieve to make you eat your anger. 
and consume your need to be right, Rudy. Arwen, a very young friend of mine, called one day from Michigan, told me her dog just had puppies. I asked her to pick out one and send it to me. Arwen called the puppy Eli because it meant gift from God. He arrived from the airplane, and he was very, very frightened. Eli was a combination of Brittany Spaniel and Golden Retriever, so he grew up to be a large dog, and he was truly a wonderful animal and a joy to have. At the time, we lived in an area where I could just open the door and let Eli run into the woods, and then he'd come back on his own. And he'd always come back completely filthy. But he was like a cat. He would just sit down and he'd lick off the dirt. It was amazing. He would sit next to me when I worked, because I worked in my house. And he sat next to me or he sat next to my wife. One day, though, I was standing in the driveway when the next door neighbor, Doberman, broke through the fence. And the Doberman came charging towards me. And I didn't know what to do. But as things happened so often, I was miraculously taken care of. Eli was standing behind me. The hair on the back of his head just shot up. And without any hesitation, Eli ran in front of me and charged towards the Doberman. Even though the Doberman is much more fierce than Eli, the the Doberman turned around and it quickly ran away. Eli had no thought of his own protection. He was just willing to totally sacrifice himself to protect me. It was an amazing incident, and I truly learned why a dog is man's best friend. Who else would sacrifice their life for yours? Unfortunately, while I was traveling in Japan in a study mission, Eli somehow drowned in the river close to our house. It was a very sad moment in our life. Miracle 59, Wow, She Was Beautiful. The anger produced in an emotional situation can create one of the most useful chemicals for inner growth. Expressing negativity show an inability to control your emotions. Rudy. Another time we were running a seminar in Minneapolis, and afterwards I went to a very nice restaurant. And when I entered the restaurant, I gave the cloakroom lady my briefcase to hold while I was having dinner. After dinner, I went back to the cloakroom to get my briefcase, but I couldn't find it. A few minutes later, a waitress came by, and she knew exactly where my briefcase was, and she offered to go get it for me. And I looked at this woman once, and wow, I immediately fell in love with that woman. It never happened to me before. I mean, even though I got married, I eventually, of course, I loved my wife, but not this way. This was just so powerful, and I was shocked. I didn't know what to do, and my first wife was there with our other friends. If I listened to my heart, I would have said goodbye to Marilyn and pursue that woman right there and then. In retrospect, it might have been a good idea because my first wife left me some years later. I don't know where that feeling came from. I only thought that maybe she was my wife in a previous life, if I believed in previous lives. Rudy said earlier to me, he said, Norman, There's comic experiences, and sometimes you just have to run away from them. Well, I did, but the thought always lingers with me. If I had acted differently, what might have happened? Miracle 60, Taichi Ono. It's against the ordinary nature of a human being to really wish to be free, Rudy. Taichi Ono is considered the father of Toyota Production System, also called Just in Time, One Piece Flow, or Lean Management. He was a senior vice president at Toyota in charge of all manufacturing. I had the privilege of meeting Mr. Ono several times. I became his publisher. In my mind, he was the world's most powerful manager in the 20th century, someone we should really study and emulate. Most of the first Japanese books I published in English came from the Japan Management Association, JMA, And one day, the JMA editor, Mr. Uchiyama, he comes over to me and he suggests that I should publish Taichi Ono's books. And I jumped at the opportunity. Mr. Uchiyama also introduced me to another publisher to get another one of Ono's books. Ono's name will always be linked to Toyota's success. After World War II, Toyota was virtually destroyed and very close to bankruptcy. And they lagged very far behind General Motors and Ford. But Mr. Ono would soon change that. One day, 
it occurred to Mr. Ono when he looked at American supermarkets how quickly the inventory was being replaced. That means he would say, Miss Housewife takes something off the shelf and the supermarket tries to get that product back onto the shelf as quickly as possible. Inspired with that idea, he said, why can't I manufacture cars in the same way? Then he guided Toyota to become the world's largest automobile manufacturer. As Ono's publisher, it was easy for me to visit with him. On the first visit, I asked him how he discovered the Toyota production system. And he laughed and he said, look, I, I just read Henry Ford's book Today and Tomorrow. When I came back from that trip to Japan, I called the Greenwich Library and I said to the librarian, could you get a copy of Henry Ford's book Today and Tomorrow? It was not easy because it was published in 1926. I read the book and I was fascinated by it. And I thought American businesses could learn a lot from it. I asked Doubleday if I could have the reprint rights in exchange for giving them a royalty. They happily agreed. It was very simple to publish the book because it was already in English. And during the next few years, I sold 35,000 copies at $35 a book. Mr. Ono had given me a million-dollar gift. And I feel a little bit guilty because I never gave Ono any kind of commission. I gave him commission. I gave him royalties on his books, but I never gave him a commission on that book. I want to share some key ideas that Mr. Ono developed for Toyota success. Ono insisted that his senior managers and suppliers go to the middle of the plant. He would draw a circle on the floor, and he told the manager, I want you to stand there the entire day. Ono wanted them to look and see what waste they can discover in their own plant. At the end of the day, he would meet with them and discuss what they saw. It is amazing that when living and working in an environment, we do not see deeply until we just stop and watch long enough. Ono's method forced the managers to be much more aware, and it's a great technique. Rizio Shingo Sun, who was the former president of Toyota in China, is now a consultant. He goes to other companies, and he just goes there, and he sits, and he just watches. Often, Mr. Ono would go over to supervisors or managers and tell them to run their department with fewer people. He would say, I see you have 10 people working there. I would like you to do it with seven. He would then walk away and never tell them how to do it. Ono wielded enormous power and respect. People were afraid of him and would absolutely comply with any request coming from him. Ono would ask people to do the impossible. At first, I am sure, they did not believe that they could do what he asked. Ono probably was not sure either. However, he knew that if he didn't try, they would never be able to discover what they were capable of doing. One day, he was standing in front of a warehouse at Toyota Gosei a major supplier to Toyota. He said to the senior managers there, at Toyota, we do not have any warehouses. I want you to convert this warehouse into a machine shop, and I want you to train everybody in there to become a mechanic. I'll give you one year to do it. He walked away. Of course, the managers were in complete disbelief, but they followed Mr. Ono's directive, and one year later, it happened. All those people that were moving furniture around, moving things around, were now mechanics. It took Toyota many years to perfect the Toyota production system. When he felt comfortable that Toyota was doing it correctly, Mr. Ono asked 10 of Toyota's top suppliers to provide one senior executive to work on a special team. The team met with Ono and Dr. Shingo to convert their companies into just-in-time. The executives worked together, giving support to and sharing with each other. They helped over 200 suppliers deliver parts and supplies to Toyota on a just-in-time basis. Many American companies have studied and attempted to adapt the Toyota production system. We call it lean, but few have been able to replicate what Toyota has done. And as Paul Akers said, probably only 2% have done it. Maybe only 2% really understand how to do it. I recommend America do the same thing. Get one top person from all of your top suppliers and do what Toyota did. Often, I would bring a group of American executives to visit a Toyota plant, and Mr. Ono was always kind enough to give a workshop. His presentation was always very simple. He would show a picture of a river, 
and he used the analogy that the river was like inventory, and the inventory covers all of the mistakes, all of the problems in the factory. And if you can reduce that inventory very slowly, the problems would be revealed. They would pop out just like a river going down, the rocks would pop up. And then you could address it, and then you could make the manufacturing plant run more smoothly. Ono then suggested that managers reduce their inventory. If the batch size was 50, he would tell them to lower it to 25 and see what happened. One day, after visiting a Toyota plant with a study mission, I walked over to Mr. Ono and I thanked him for allowing us to visit. I told him, I'm very grateful that you let us visit the plant, but every time I come to Toyota, I only see an old plant. And Bodek said, Bodek, son, you don't understand just in time. It has nothing to do with the way a plant looks. It's all based on how the plant runs. On another visit, I saw a process where 60 hoses were being worked on at the same time. I said to Mr. Ono, that's not one-piece flow. Once again, he said, Bodek son, you don't understand just in time. We do what is right and what is efficient. And at this time, a batch size of 60 is the best way that we can do it. Ono was very famous for identifying the seven wastes. A waste is something that does not add value to the product. And the seven wastes are, one, overproduction. Simply put, overproduction is to manufacture an item before it is actually required. Waiting. Whenever goods are not moving or being processed, the waste of waiting occurs. Number three is transporting or moving things. Moving products do not add value to the product. I like the example of Mercury Marine. When they made the shaft to the boat motor, it moved 29 miles before it was completed, 29 miles through their factories. After they learned a little about the total production system, they reduced the distance to a very short distance. Inappropriate processing is another way. There are many ways to do things, and often the process is old and it's no longer effective. Unnecessary inventory. In reality, all you need is inventory for the one item you're working on. But due to the long changeover times, inventory is accumulated. Ono called this the worst waste, and he relentlessly pursued its elimination. Unnecessary or excess motion is a waste. At Toyota and their subsidiaries, I would often see supervisors videoing some workers on the line. They would video the worker doing the same thing several times. Then the supervisor and the worker would look at the video to find ways to improve the motion. Supervisors would compare workers to find out the best way of doing something and then share their knowledge with them. Defects is a terrible waste. In 1980, when I started productivity, most American companies were happy to deliver what they called plus or minus 3%, meaning 3% of the products would have a defect. That's changed. When I ran my first conference, I ordered 300 binders, and I received 330 binders. And they charged me for 330. Well, I called back the company. I said, look, I only ordered 300. How come you sent me 330? Well, because we have a plus and minus 3%. We know you're going to have some rejects. But you made me pay for the rejects. What if I only ordered the 300? Well, you pay for 330. (laughs) Today, the customer wants perfect products 100% of the time. Defects are a terrible waste. To these seven wastes, I've added two. My eighth waste is the underutilization of people's talents. People are often looked at as just extensions of machines, and they're rarely ever asked to use their brains. I taught for years the Japanese suggestion system, whereby the average worker in Japan came up with 20 implemented ideas per year. At one time, Toyota received 70, and I taught a company called DCI in Oregon, and we were up to 150 ideas per worker. It's amazing what people can offer if they are just asked. I like what Canon Corporation has done. They have a supermeister system that trains people to work at their maximum capability. Instead of having people on an assembly line or conveyor belt with just a two- or three-minute tack time, that means... Every three minutes, they're going to work on another car, another product, and do the exact same thing over and over again. A supermeister 
in a manufacturing cell can build an entire copier with over 1,000 parts in three hours, all by herself. Additionally, the worker's productivity is 30% higher than before, with a higher level of quality. The supermeisters take a lot of pride in their work. I heard one woman say after she built the copier by herself, I just made another baby. That is how work should be designed in the 21st century. The ninth waste I call manager's resistance to change. I now teach the Harada method to students all over the world using Zoom. I had one student. He was a lean consultant. He was working in a hospital in Alabama, and he liked my teaching very much. And he was the first student I had. And and I eventually said to him, I'd like you to pay me something. I don't care. Just pay me something. And then he said, well, before I can pay you anything, I'm going to have to ask the president of the hospital. I said, well, before you call the president, I want you to call Joe Schwartz. He has the same job as you at the St. Francis Hospital in Indianapolis, Indiana, and ask him what he saved from my teaching. Well, he called Joe, and Joe said, well, they probably saved $1.5 million. Well, the student consultant, he then went to the president of the hospital to find some money for me, and he told him what Joe said. And the president said, believe it or not, we can't pay Norman anything. There's nothing in the budget for him. I'm amazed. Most manufacturers and hospitals are pursuing lean, but I believe very few can emulate Toyota. In the West, we go after the lean tools, or we only select the ones we like. The best way to do lean is to just follow Ono and Shingo and do what Ono said. Just go out and demand lower inventories and ask managers to drastically reduce their staff. But don't reward people for their improvement efforts by laying people off. Take the best people and develop and challenging them to create new products and services. And follow Dr. Shingo by implemented pokeoke, mistake proofing. And also I recommend you follow Dr. Shingo's advice by implementing pokeoke, mistake proofing, to relentlessly eliminate defects and bring your setup times down to less than 10 minutes. Ask your engineers how to improve the value adding ratio and then do it. Miracle 61, passing out the day Anthony was born. There must never be a sense of self-satisfaction after completing work. All work belongs to a chain of greater and greater work. Rudy, sometimes when I work, I get deeply buried in it, and I just forget about eating. One Saturday, I was at home, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, when Beth, my younger daughter, she came over to me, and she asked if I had lunch. I said, no. So she made me a tuna fish sandwich. It took her only a few moments to make the sandwich. And when I noticed I was hungry, I gobbled it down, boy, really quickly. As soon as it went down, though, wow, I knew I had made a terrible mistake. I knew there was something wrong with the tuna fish, but I didn't know what to do. I looked in the medicines cabinet for something that could help me. I couldn't find anything. And when I walked out of the bathroom, I just passed out. My wife at the time, Marilyn, she couldn't wake me up. I was probably out for at least 10 minutes. She called 911 and got an ambulance. And when I woke up, I looked at her and I said, Phyllis is going to have a baby today. Phyllis is our oldest daughter. She was pregnant and we knew the baby was due at any moment, but we didn't know exactly when. But I told Marilyn the baby was coming today and it was going to be a boy. And at that time, we just didn't know the sex. That night, Around 11 o'clock, I told Marilyn to get ready because the baby was coming. If the baby did come, she had to go over and babysit for the first grandchild, Amy. It was an amazing moment. She actually listened to me. She got up and she took a shower. Sure enough, as soon as she came out of the shower, the phone rang and Phyllis said, Mom, the water broke. And Marilyn went over and Phyllis went to the hospital and she delivered Anthony, my grandson, and now he's a great friend of mine. I'm so lucky that he lives in Vancouver, Washington, where I live, married to a beautiful woman, Sonia. And I have a great grandson, Francis. Very lucky to have them. Miracle number 62, no Horenzo. Here's where I need everybody to listen very carefully because I'm going to describe the happiest company in the world to work for. And I'm going to tell you what they do. A man who returns time and again to a past creative effort 
is a man afraid to go ahead? Rudy. A few years ago, I visited a great company in Japan called Mirai Industries. Mirai has manufactured electrical and plumbing supplies for the last 50 years. The company, which has about a 1,000 employees, has never lost any money. It has obtained 40,000 patents, probably more than any other company in Japan. Mirai is the most unusual company in the world. Instead of focusing on how much profit it can earn each quarter, the company focuses on how happy their people are when they come to work. I published a wonderful book, The Happiest Company to Work For. It was written by Mirai's president, Mr. Akio Yamada. One of the great keys to Mirai's success is to have every employee to be self-reliant. Mr. Yamada coined the phrase, no horenso. Horenso means spinach in Japanese. Mr. Hayamada doesn't want to force any one of his employees. I don't know about you, but my mother forced me to eat spinach when I was a young child. He wants them to be fully independent, as if they were all the president of the company. Mr. Yamada wants no horenso to strengthen every employee. The no horenso principle means that instead of relying on somebody else to solve a problem, you, the employee, should solve it yourself. The word horenso can be broken into three parts. So he would say no ho reporting. If you want to do something new, then you just do it. You don't have to ask your supervisor or your manager or your boss for permission. You're fully trusted that the decision that you will make will be good for the company. Believe it or not, if you make a mistake, instead of being criticized, you're going to be given $5 for making the mistake. The catch is, though, you can't make the same mistake again. You're not going to be fired for making a mistake. No, you're going to get a reward. But you could lose some status in the company if you make the same mistake twice. Then no ren. Communicating. You don't even have to discuss or talk about your idea with anyone else. If you're confident what you're doing, then you just go ahead and do it. No so. No consulting. You are encouraged to be fully self-reliant and to make the proper decision for the company as if you were making the decision for yourself. Consulting anyone is not necessary. In other words, no ho rental means that employees are free to do what they think necessary for the success of a company. In all my years in business, I have never seen another company in the world applying the principles of no horenso. In most companies, managers are afraid to fully trust people who work for them and to fully empower them. We talk about empowerment, but very few companies actually do it. Managers feel that everybody needs somebody to check on them before they do something new. But in truth, this feeling just restrains individuals from being creative and doing their job properly. Look, in your own life, outside of work, if you want to do something, you just do it. But somehow in the company, we have this chain that doesn't exist at Mirai. These are some of the amazing things that Mirai does, different from other companies. Mirai has the longest paid vacation of any company in Japan. Mirai's culture fosters a unique management style. Employees have the shortest working hours in Japan. Retirement age is 70, where it's normally 60. Believe it or not, there's no HR department. The staff chooses who works for them. A sales office was built without the president knowing it. And, of course, we said no horenso. You don't ask your boss for permission to do something new. Mirai does not employ security guards. It is a company policy to have no lock gates. Well, this is Japan. I don't know if we can do it in America. <laughs> you must differentiate, says Mr. Yamada. Mirai Industries makes things different. We do not make the same product that another company makes. If you can only make the same thing that others make, don't sell it, even if it makes money. Mirai differentiates internally and does things differently than other companies. The company prohibits no overtime. There are no sales quotas. Everyone is full-time. Mirai pays the highest salary in the local area. New employees are hired with no probationary period. Child care, you can have up to three years off, is available for the employees. The employees get 140 days off. 
not including the holidays. That's including the weekends. Employees take 20 days off around Christmas and New Year's. Employees get 10 days off in Golden Week. They receive 10 days off in summer vacation. Even an idea that's just proposed, not implemented, gets $5. Managers can be creative without setting standards. It will always be easy to work with Mirai's products. Mirai makes 85 varieties of a product, and only three are profitable. But they have 90% market share. Other companies produce only what they can make a profit on. This is so true, unfortunately, in America. We get rid of so many things which causes people to go somewhere else. It's sort of crazy. I just have to tell you a funny story. I go to a wonderful supermarket, New Seasons in Vancouver, Washington, and I bought a bottle of whole milk. It's a bottle, and you return the bottle and you get five cents back, something like that. Well, at one time, I went to Whole Foods, and I bought their bottle of milk, and I had it in the back of the car, and I brought it into New Seasons. And when I checked out, I gave them the bottle, and they said to me, no, we don't take that bottle. It's not ours. Now, look how foolish this is. For five cents, they're forcing me to go back to Whole Foods to buy foods. It's crazy that we don't get people to think more holistically on how to serve the customer's needs. The next item is flex time is available for employees. Mirai is among the top Japanese companies for patents granted. There is no such thing as supervisors forcing employees to do something. The employees have to agree. A minimum of information is shared between employees. If an employee thinks a business trip is necessary, then they send an invoice to accounting and they just go. If you have to ask permission of a supervisor each time, that will limit idea generation, being self-reliant and spontaneity. When a new sales office is open, the president normally finds out only when he gets a business card. Wearing a uniform or not, it's left up to the employee. The company lets people make decisions based on their experience. You can make a mistake, but don't do it again. You can lose your position, possibly get demoted, but you will not be fired. That is the rule. If the company can't pay a decent salary to allow its employees to live a happy life and pay their taxes to contribute to society, it's almost worthless. Mirai's focus is to make workers happy. Employees work hard. We don't have excessive competition. We don't make it cheaper. In fact, we want to sell it at a high price. If you can't sell at a high price, then we have to reduce our cost. In Mirai, you get the same pay whether you do anything or you don't do anything. Pay is based on the number of years in the company. There is no bonus scheme for separate efforts. There are no carrot sticks for the employees. Mr. Hayamata doesn't read business books, only mystery books. Please wait a moment is prohibited. Employees try their best to be able to answer questions on the spot. Mirai does not give gifts to customers. Mirai was the first company in Japan to give two days a week off for small manufacturing companies. Most manufacturing companies used to work six days a week. No accounting or purchasing department is necessary. Every five years, everyone goes on an overseas vacation. When I was there, all thousand people were going to go to Italy on a paid vacation for one week. He has a little contest. He asks people 50 questions, and if you get them right, you can get a half a year or a full year off from work, paid. A good example to save electricity is they put a string connected to the light, and they put your name on it. And it's that's there. You have to remember that's your light, and you have to turn it off. And he said, in fact, we only have one copy machine for a 1,000 employees. Mr. Yamada does not even have a car. When he needs transportation, he uses a 20-year-old company car. I believe in the theory that human nature is fundamentally good, he said. For example, when he tells an employee to do a certain task, he does not think that the employee will cheat him about it. He absolutely believes that all his employees are good-natured and honest. He gave his bank book and his legal seal. You need a seal to get things done, sign contracts in Japan. And he gave it to somebody else in the company. He trusted her to handle all the tasks related to money. Many companies in Japan set a sales goal, and they pressure employees to achieve it. 
To those companies, Mr. Yamada says, the employees are not machines. A company's role is to make a good working environment where every worker can make the most of his or her ability. Some people's ability is better than those of others. And this is not something that the company can change. Yamada says that there is no problem as long as each employee tries to do his or her best. The president has authority, but it does not mean that he or she is a specialist in every field. Executives should not interfere in a certain department's task if they do not know about it. Rather than trying to do everything alone, the president should give a chance to his or her employees. Yamada emphasizes that company owners need to know that every worker has potential. In order to help them fulfill the potential, the company must give them a chance and good treatment. When employees realize that they are receiving special treatment, they will demonstrate their remarkable ability. Employees will work hard in their own initiative only when they are moved by the company's care, he says. Get enough rest. Don't work for others. Do things you like. Mirai has never lost money in over 50 years. Why are they doing these things? Not to be famous, but to motivate employees to feel enthusiastic, to work hard, and come up with new ideas. At other companies, upper management has the thinkers. They set the policy, and others receive and follow the orders to do the job. But this is not very efficient for the company to do. It's better if everyone thinks. Just doing a job or a task is not enjoyable. We encourage people to think, to be engaged, to be enthusiastic, and we have many things to inspire them. Management sends out the big plans, the vision, without giving many details. They leave it up to the employees to work out how it should be implemented. You feel more comfortable doing your work. You start to think, well, we have been doing it this way. Maybe we can do it another way. It's more challenging when a person thinks of a better way. What if you fail? A supervisor will say, good job. You thought it through. Or I compliment you for trying. There's no scolding in our company. The manager's job is to watch what might fail to prevent problems and steer the employees toward better ways of doing things. The dialogue between supervisors and workers makes it easy to work here. Too many rules might damage creativity. Turnover last year was 1.7%. It was a high number for Mirai, but the average in Japan is about 5%. Mirai employees implement around 10,000 ideas per year, about 10 per person. The person who knows the gamba, the factory floor, is the best to be in charge. It's okay to make 100 mistakes, but it's not okay to repeat the same mistake. Yamada was chosen as the fifth most important Japanese manager that Korean companies pay attention to. When people are allowed to be totally free, they don't do wrong. They don't cheat. To make money, the company's employees must be enthusiastic and motivated to do the work. Don't say something is impossible without trying. Management must be stable and reliable. Managers are prohibited from giving orders to subordinates. They could give suggestions. Even if managers anticipate that employees will fail, they let them do it anyway. They let the people learn from their mistakes. If supervisors really delegate, employees will do no wrong. Don't treat people as a cost. No one gives or receives merit-based evaluation. No one earns sales commissions. If we get into a trap of price competition, the larger company wins. We don't do the same as other companies do. We do not measure people's performances. We do not scold. It's easy to work here, but a challenge to the managers. If you fail, the supervisors would say, good job, try again. Details on how to do a job are not told to you. You figure it out on your own. You learn your job on your own. To think is more fun. Miracle 63, India, TVS Motor, and Srinivasan Services Trust, SST. Creativity should produce happiness and joy. Anything less indicates wrong work or the presence of blocks. Rudy. Noriko and I attended a quality conference in Tokyo where a friend of ours, Noriyako Kano, was speaking. Noriyako Kano was very famous. He came up with the Kano quality method. While there, I was looking down at my phone when a very distinguished gentleman came over to me and he said, Norman, I'd like to introduce myself to you. I'm Venus Srinivasan. I'm the chairman of TVS Motor Company in India. 
without looking up, I said, well, 30 years ago, TVS was my first client in India. He said, I know Norman, I was your client. I was a little embarrassed for not recognizing him, but very grateful to see him. We only chatted for a few moments, just a few minutes, and then he invited my wife and me to join his company in Bangalore, India. He explained to me how grateful he was for all of the books I published when I owned Productivity Press. Especially, he loved the Canon production system. I told him I would be very happy to come to India, but he'd have to give me two business class tickets to go to India, and he'd have to pay me something. And he agreed. And then I asked him, what do you want me to teach? Nothing. I just want you to come and look at my company. Very strange request. Nobody's ever asked me to do that before or since. A few months later, we flew to Bangalore and we visited his company. And it's probably the best in all of India. TVS has been awarded many prizes, including the famous Deming Prize. Why we were in India, in addition to looking at his plants, Vena wanted me to see what he was doing in villages in India. India has over 300 million people living below the poverty level, with 600 million not even having a toilet. He decided to do something about that, and he set up a new foundation called Srinivasan Services Trust, SST. Today, through its efforts, SST has uplifted over 1.2 million people out of poverty. A typical village in India has people living in shacks without running water or electricity in their homes. But I had the privilege of visiting eight villages where SST had worked. And the people living in those villages had houses made of cement and brick, not straw. They had electricity. They had running water. And almost all of them had their own toilets. In one of the villages, I visited a chapati factory, chapati is bread. And there were 15 women in the factory making bread. They jointly owned the factory together. They all took a salary. They all received a bonus at the end of the year. The factory was very productive, successfully serving businesses and individuals within its area. SST would go into a poverty-stricken village. They'd get about 15 women together, and they'd help them pick something that they could do to make a living. Most of these women couldn't write. They couldn't read but they were all willing to learn. The woman would jointly pick some skill together, and then they would open a bank account and agree to make deposits every single week. Now, that deposit may be only 15 cents each. The amazing thing is SST got the banks in India to accept receiving such small deposits. Couldn't do that in America. With the guidance of an SST counselor, these women were able to learn and become successful in some trade to help their family. In my opinion, SST is probably the best foundation in the whole world because it helps people to become self-reliant. It doesn't give out to people. It gets people to be trained that they can do it on their own. People learn skills to have a decent life. In 2016, because of his work at SST and TVS, Vena was picked as India's best manager. Miracle number 64, muscle test. Any teacher who is not learning is not doing a creative job and is not teaching. Creative teaching is continual growth for the man who teaches and for all the products of his teaching. Rudy, I already told you that when I was younger, I was a skeptic. I didn't believe in anything spiritual until life gave me so many amazing experiences. Since then, I have completely changed my mind about what is possible and what is not possible. I haven't walked on water yet, but who knows what can happen in the future. One experience that helped open my mind happened years ago. I knew I was allergic to foods, but I was not sure exactly what I was allergic to. So I went to Dr. Rachel Brooks. And she introduced me to a technique called muscle testing. Muscle testing is a way to test food allergies without having to eat them. The old way, you'd go to a doctor and they would scratch your skin with all of these foods to see if you would break out in a rash. But Rachel Brooks had a certain talent and many doctors have that talent. So Dr. Brooks had me take a number of the different foods that I was eating and I put them all each into a separate brown bag. And then she put one bag in my hand, and I didn't know what was inside the bag. Then Dr. Brooks would put pressure on the other arm 
to keep it down and asked me to try to raise my arm up. If I was allergic of what was in the bag, my arm actually got weak. If I could eat it, I could raise my arm. I don't know how it worked, but it worked. This is really a test that you can apply in many ways, for the universe is on your side, and you just have to learn how to ask. Your body knows what's good for it. You have to learn how to ask your body. Miracle number 65, finding total productive maintenance, TPM. One of the purposes of meditation is to quiet the mind and relieve it of undue pressure. Rudy, this is another story about finding books in Japan. Mr. Uchiyama, the gold mine mentor I mentioned earlier, he took me to an office and on the door it said Japan Institute of Plant Maintenance, JIPM. JIPM gave me two books on something called Total Productive Maintenance. It's a subject I knew nothing about. But I came back to America, and I didn't know what was in the book because it's in Japanese. Mr. Uchiyama didn't even tell me. He just said, publish them. Well, so I didn't know who to give it to, but somebody recommended, once again, somebody else's advice I shouldn't have listened to. He recommended a Japanese professor at Harvard University to translate the books for me. She said she would charge $16,000. That was a lot of money. But I gave her the books, and I gambled that it would turn out well. It took her a few months to translate the books. When she gave them to me, I was so sad when I read them that I spent so much money on such poor material. They seemed to be so little value to me. However, luckily, Noriko, she was a friend of mine at the time. She wasn't my wife yet, but she noticed that the translator was leaving many things out and she didn't do a good job at all. So I took the translation and I threw it away. And I went to Drew Dillon, a professor I knew that did some of the Shingo books, and he was at Yale University. And I gave him the books, and he retranslated them over again 100%. I paid twice, probably more than what I paid the Harvard professor. But when I read Drew Dillon's translation, I was thrilled. Once again, Mr. Uchiyama had given me a gold mine. I started a newsletter called TPM. I began to run workshops and conferences on TPM. At one conference, believe it or not, a thousand people came and they paid a thousand dollars each to a TPM conference. It was a million dollar event. I don't know why I have been so blessed, but I am very, very grateful. TPM taught one fundamental idea that a new machine was in the worst condition of its life. We in America think the reverse. TPM, an offshoot of the Toyota production system, followed very closely what the airline industry does. An airline is made of metal, plastic, and uses oil, just like the machines on the factory floor. The difference is the airplane can't fail. So the airlines do things to keep the planes in sterling condition throughout their productive lives. You can fly a plane today, you know, that was made in the 1930s, DC-3 or DC-5. I think they're still flying. Well, the same concept can be applied on the factory floor. Older machines should work just as well, if not better, than new ones. Once again, sorry, I didn't give Mr. Uchiyama a commission. I'm sorry about that. But when he left JMA, I did give him a job working for us in Tokyo. Miracle 66, Nuriko Hosoyamada. The wish within the human being is the most powerful energy that exists in the world. In 1981, Noriko translated Dr. Ryuji Fukuda's book, Managerial Engineering, the first of more than 100 Japanese books we would translate into English at Productivity. The project took two years to complete, a long time for a project of this size, because without previous knowledge, we had to learn the whole publishing process from scratch. In addition to translating the book, we had to learn the concepts, rewrite and edit many parts, create the drawings and cover and design. We had to print and bind it and market the book. It was difficult, but the book successfully launched my publishing career. When the book was finished, I invited Dr. Vakuda to keynote a conference for me in Washington, D.C., and Noriko did the interpreting, and she subsequently interpreted for Dr. Shingo on his many trips to America. She was also my interpreter when I led a study missions to Japan. Noriko's language skills were exceptional, and after she had finished college, she worked as a flight attendant with all Nippon Airlines, ANA, for 10 years. 
Then she left A&A and she came to California to further her education, primarily study English. After finishing her studies, she worked as a simultaneous interpreter, a job that requires tremendous mental dexterity. At the Washington Conference, the chairman of Florida Power and Light, John Hudeberg, gave the keynote address, and he was very impressed with Noriko's interpreting ability. They approached her, and they offered her a position to join Florida Power and Light. Florida Power and Light wanted to be the first American company to win the Deming Prize, which at th- that point only was granted to Japanese companies. Hudeberg wanted to use the prize to inspire his employees to strive for superior quality service. At first, Noriko declined the offer. But they were pursuant and eventually said yes, and she joined the company in Florida. Noriko was the key person for translating materials for the Japanese Union of Scientists and Engineers, JUICE, the organization that oversees the prize. She also interpreted when the people came from Japan to Florida and when the Florida people went to Japan. As she interpreted, she learned enough about quality to become a quality manager and instructor at Florida Power & Light. After eight years working in Florida, Noriko decided to move to Portland, Oregon, where we reconnected in a very powerful way. On New Year's Eve, we attended a party together, and after dinner, we noticed that several groups were dancing. Both of us loved to dance, so we got together and we joined them. Turned out to be a very fateful decision. (laughs) Struck by the moment, we could not help but fall in love, and shortly thereafter, we got married. I had never intended to get married again having tried it once, not very successfully. However, life has its own agenda, and Noriko and I have a wonderful life together today. Noriko continues to impress me. At age 50, she decided to become a doctor. With unbelievable determination, she studied anatomy and chemistry at Clark College. Then she spent three years getting her master's degree in acupuncture and Chinese medicine at the Oriental College of Medicine in Portland. Afterwards, she went back for two more years to get her doctorate degree. Noriko has an amazing memory and a tenacity to study, both of which helped make her a great doctor. In October 2017, Noriko and I visited Japan, my 89th trip. Paul Akers, who founded FastCap, a company that produces woodworking tools, traveled some with us. The three of us visited a local carpenter shop where two twin brothers were working making new chairs and a table for our house in Kirishima. Paul had built his own house, furniture, and wooden musical instrument, and he was fascinated by the brothers' techniques. In the workshop, he picked up a wood plane and tried using it the Japanese way, pulling instead of pushing while standing in a new pose. Paul now wants to go back to Japan, and he wants to spend a week learning from them. He understands that doing new things is what makes life interesting and exciting. When Paul saw our house in Kirishima, he looked at me and he said, Norman, do you realize how great Noriko is? You are the luckiest man in the world. I agree. Paul has also encouraged me to sell my house in Vancouver and to go move and live in Japan. Miracle 67, 89th trip to Japan. As Paul, Noriko, and I traveled together in Japan, the topic of health came up. Paul, who wrote a book called Lean Health, is in exceptional health. I asked him for some advice on how he can improve my fitness. A year ago, he told me to eliminate sugar and carbohydrates. No wheat, no bread, no cakes, no rice, no pasta, etc. I listened to Paul, and I lost 10 pounds. This time, he put us on a new diet. This diet consists of fasting for 16 hours a day. So now I normally eat from around 10 in the morning to 6 o'clock at night. This allows the body to absorb your fats. We did it, and we have both lost 10 pounds in the last couple of weeks. The body is our perfect instrument to use. If you don't use it properly, it will signal back pain and other ailments. Treat it right, and you'll feel more energetic and much more happier. Try it. Another highlight of the trip was visiting various onsens, which are located for bathing and relaxation, often located near hot springs. The Japanese love and are noted for their onsings. And this love has made them probably the cleanest people in the world. I have learned to love them also, and I might be the cleanest person in America. On this past trip, we often went to an onsen to eat lunch and to bathe. 
One particular onsen we visited was the Hotel Shiroyama in Kagoshima. There we had lunch with our friends Taiku and Toshi. And afterwards, Toshi and I went to the men's spa to undress and wash entirely before entering into the hot water. I just loved washing myself there. On this trip, we also met my student, Humeid. He lives in Dubai, and he was on a study mission visiting Fukuoka in Japan. Together, we went to a fabulous restaurant called Gallery Arita. There's a thousand ceramic coffee and teacups displayed on shelves around the room. And you have a choice. If you're going to have tea or coffee, you pick the cup that you want to use. A few weeks later, we had lunch with Dr. Nagata and his teacher, Dr. Nase, 90 years young, who was also a neurologist and fully supportive of Dr. Nagata's work. At Dr. Nagata's office, he took a blood sample from me. He had taken a blood sample from me on the previous March, and he was going to test my blood again to see how much my health had changed because I've been prickling in this last year. I'm fine, and I'm just getting better. The next day, Noriko and I went to see Toyokazu Shibiyama. He was a disciple of Dr. Nagata and truly an amazing doctor. Every day of the week, he works. In five of those days, he sees 70 people a day, and the other two days, he sees 45 people a day. He examined me. He prickled me to relieve some pain in my back, and it worked. He is an amazing man. I admire him so much. He runs about seven miles every single day going to work. Hopefully, Noriko and I can finish Dr. Nagata's book soon and bring to America and the Western world this great medical discovery. Lastly, on this trip, we went and had a dinner with Mr. Harada, his daughter Eureka, and his wife Fumio at the Hilton Hotel in Osaka, eating like kings and queens. Eureka is 19 years old and studying English in college and wants to come to America to study. She's probably the most open person I have ever met, just lovely and filled with love. For me, Japan has been my prime source of knowledge over this past 37 years, giving the world very valuable information on improving the quality of our products and services, improving our productivity, and also the value and quality of our lives. The discoveries have been endless, and it all comes to me without any ability to speak or read Japanese. Miracle 68, I'm still alive. The only way to be free of pain is to digest it. You eat the pain and you become free. Rudy, I do have many more miracles, but they're probably very minor. The biggest miracle is still in front of me. Earlier in the book, I told you about the I Ching, and yesterday I decided to go back to it. I asked the I Ching, the oracle, a very important question about the future of my life. I have one goal, one important goal. I want to attain spiritual freedom before I die. It's not an easy task, but the Buddha did it. Jesus did it, Mohammed did it, and many other great sages that I have studied also did it. They became free, and they tried their best to share their knowledge with us, to help us to become free. Unfortunately, we read the Bible, we read the Koran, we read the holy books, but we don't really understand what they are saying. And I also feel, unfortunately, that most of the teachers that are teaching those books they don't really understand. With deep sincerity, I took three ancient Chinese coins again, and I flipped them in my hand, and I threw them in the air, and I let them land on a sheet of paper on my desk. I did it six times, and I produced a new hexagram to look at. This hexagram is called Qian, C-H apostrophe I-E-N. For me, it's another great miracle because it shows me the way to attain my goal. You go to the I Ching and read about Qian, which represents sublimity and success. It's the primal power of living, giving, active, strong, and spiritual. Through devotion and persistence, I will, with divine blessing, attain my ultimate goal to be in harmony, in love with the universe. I recommend you simply love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Start there and then begin to realize that you are awareness itself. Know that God is love. God is the universe. God rests inside your own heart. God is in everyone's heart. When you look at a person from now on, you should look into their heart so that you could see the God 
that's in there, and you could help it come out of them. God is not separate from you. Just be a little quiet and learn to go inside. Finally, freedom is to be free of all fears, to be free of all desires, to be totally open to what the universe wants of you and to trust it, to be able to serve others what they need and to live joyous and a wonderful life. I wish it for all of you, and I thank you for listening to this book. I have in the book also the foreword from Hal McCumba and Calais Davies' new book. It's called The Pocket Sensei. But instead of reading it, I'd love you to go read it. And <laughs> amazing, because it's a special acknowledgement to me. And why they did that is because they took the books of Shingo and Ono, the ones that I published, and they took out the best sayings from that book, and they put it into about 40 katas. You see, right now you read a book, and what do you do with it? You don't know what to do with it. But a kata is you take information that you like, and you then begin to practice over and over and over and over and over again until you could use that practice effectively in your life. Writing this book has been a miraculous experience for me. I recommend you do the same. Sit down and write your own book. Writing forces you to dig more deeply into yourself and you learn as you write. There are two keys to success in life. One is pick a very strong goal of what you want to do to be a master at and never, 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 never give up. And the other is to discover how to really love the divine. I hope you enjoyed this book, and I wish for you to be totally fulfilled, free, and self-reliant. Also, at the end of my book, the written book, you will see pictures of nine of the books that I have published. Of course, I'm the author or the editor, and I highly recommend them, but I'm sure you'll find all of them wonderful. Some of them I will start to give away free. The others, I'm going to start to reduce the price. Some of the books, like the Harada Method, I sell it for $49, but I'm going to reduce the book way, way down. These are the books that I published. One is called All You Got to Do is Ask. That's about the Japanese idea system. I wrote another one on the Japanese idea system called The Idea Generator. I wrote that with Bungie Tozawa, and that was my best-selling book. I've sold thousands of that book. Another book is J.I.T. is Flow. It's about just-in-time, lean it's written by Hirano. It's an excellent book to read. It's a Japanese book. I wrote another book called Rebirth of American Industry. I wrote that book with Waddell, and he was very good. I added to it, but he was very good. How do we get American industry to really come back? I wrote another book called How to Do Kaizen, also with Bungie Taozawa. That's also on the Japanese suggestion system. I wrote a book called Kaikaku, A Revolution in Manufacturing. You might enjoy that. That's filled with lots of other stories about me in Japan. And I published the book, The Happiest Company to Work For. That's about Mirai. You might love to read that and spread it into your company so that your company becomes the happiest to work for. And if you want, you can go to my website, which is just pcspress.com. Thank you so much for listening. Sincerely, Norman Bodek. <laughs>